Hello, hello. Let's talk about cardiology. All right, uh, the agenda. Um, we're going to talk about anatomy, a uh, bunch of equations and, and basic physiology, get into cardiac cycle and pressure volume loops, um, talk about different types of shock, pressure, blood flow dynamics, uh, deep dive into action potential um, and, and arrhythmias. Um, I really think it's uh, having like a sound understanding of action potentials and, and arrhythmias. Arrhythmia is not even in first aid. Um, is really going to be helpful understanding EKGs and later antiarrhythmic medications. Um, we'll talk about uh, different types of murmurs, auscultation, uh, combined embryology with con congenital heart defects. Embryology is never really worth that much in tests anyways. Um, talk about hypertension, atherosclerosis, MI, other ischemic heart diseases. Um, skipping over vasculitis, uh, then we'll d dive into cardiomyopathies and heart failure. Um, talk about endocarditis, pericarditis, different types of inflammation, um, and then get into uh, the the details for uh, blood pressure, uh, lowering medications, and antiarrhythmics. Um, all right, heart anatomy. So, um, just gonna basic MCAT overview of the circulatory system. You guys are probably familiar. A little bit more in vessels. Talk about the mediastinum, pericardium, cardiac muscle layers. Uh, the coronary arteries, where they originate from, how they 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 feed the heart, um, the aorta, and then talk about the the valves, atrias, and, and ventricles. So, uh, heart disease number one cause of death, not just in the United States where we have a, a an, an obese population, but just in the world as a whole, which was actually surprising to me. Um, just sort of highlighting how important this particular unit is. Um, all right, uh, you guys I'm sure are familiar with this from the MCAT. We go from the right atrium through the tricuspid pulmonary uh, semilunar circuit to the right ventricle, through the pulmonary valve to the pulmonary artery. This is the one of the few arteries that arteries always go away from the heart. They are typically oxygenated. This is a deoxygenated one. The... Um, uh, then we go to the lungs. We're interacting with the alveoli. We're going to drop off CO2, pick up oxygen, pulmonary vein. So that again, veins go back to the heart, but typically they're deoxygenated. This is oxygenated because it comes from the lungs. The other example of an oxygenated vein is the umbilical vein from the mother to the fetus. It goes into the left atrium, goes through the bicuspid, also called the mitral valve, which is just the atrioventricular valve on the left side. To the left ventricle where it goes out the aortic valve um, to the aorta. This then feeds into the systemic circulation, head, nose, you know, uh, feet, et cetera, drops off all of the glucose, all of the oxygen, picks up all of the urea, the CO2, all of the garbage, and then brings it back to the heart. So we have our systemic circuit and our pulmonary circuit. Um, and of course, it is not just one capillary bed. There's several capillary beds for the upper body, um, for the kidneys, for the lower body. Notice that in some cases, we have a double capillary bed. That's just called a portal system. We have another one in our, in our pituitaries as well. Um, so we go from the aortas, you know, major highway branches off into smaller highways of arteries and arterioles down to the single lane street of the capillaries where the red blood cells have to move single file, then to the venules, to the veins, to the vena cava and back to the heart. Um, as we're dropping off fluid in the tissue beds for the capillaries, uh, a lot of the, we're going to drop off more fluid than we're going to pick up. And that excess fluid is going to, uh, percolate into the drainage, the sewer system, which is the lymphatics and as eventually it's going to merge back into the systemic circulation at the um, subclavian vein. Um, so at a certain point, probably good to understand the anatomy of all of the, the vessels. We'll go into this uh, in more detail a little bit later, but effectively we have our tunica intima, which uh, contains the endothelial cells, the basement membrane, the tunica media, which contains the smooth muscle and, and some elastic tissue, and the tunica externa, which has the vasa vasorum, which is the, uh, so it's kind of funny, the, the blood vessels actually have their own blood supply because some of the arteries are so large, and this contains a lot of collagen as well. Um, so major difference between arteries and veins is that there is uh, more smooth muscle in the tunica media of the artery than in the vein. That means that arteries are more elastic and veins are more compliant. You can kind of see that here. Here's our thick um, tunica media and here's our thinner tunica media. Uh, capillaries, again, they're, they're very teeny tiny. They don't even have muscle. They just have one little endothelial cell. So there's just one cell thick. Um, we can see an example of this. Veins are squishy. Arteries are not squishy, lots of muscle, not a lot of muscle. Um, so for arteries, we, we typically say that they're elastic. So the bulk modulus is the change in pressure of the change in volume. Uh, the veins are just going to be the reciprocal of that. The compliance is the change in uh, volume of the change in pressure. So 
Arteries are like uh, rubber bands. They can snap back. Veins are like balloons. They will just expand. They'll give. Arteries, in addition to passive elasticity like we see here, have uh, active uh, elasticity as the muscles will actively contract to uh, generate more pressure and push the blood forward. Uh, we see an example of systolic pressure here. So if you were to put your finger right here, this is how you feel a pulse. Every time the heart ventricles contract on the left side, this is going to uh, push a ton of blood through the circulatory systemic circuit, and it is going, you're going to feel that with your finger. Uh, it's generating a high amount of pressure. Now, that pressure would be much, much, much smaller if it wasn't for the elasticity of the muscles. So the muscles are kind of acting like a pressure reservoir. They're storing a bunch, bunch of the energy here. Otherwise, all of the, the pressure, all of the energy, velocity, et cetera, would go in this direction, but some of it is somewhat stored here so that during diastole, which we see here, we can have a little bit of elastic recoil springing back, which just continues the blood forwards. Um, so uh, when we're measuring pressure, blood pressure, we're measuring the artery, typically the uh, brachial artery, and uh, it's a lot higher than the venous system um, for a lot of reasons, mainly in the same way that in physics we can have a high voltage become a low voltage when it moves across a resistor. Um, uh, same thing here, the resistance of our, mainly our arterioles, honestly, uh, are going to dissipate a lot of that sort of pressure energy. So we have high pressure, and then as it moves through the arterioles, it loses a lot of that pressure, and now it's in a, a low pressure state. So um, the venous system is much lower. In addition to the fact that the, alina, uh, the venous system, as we said, has less of a tunica media, less elastic tissue and muscles. Um, and it oscillates. Here we see the systolic pressure. Here the diastolic pressure. Yes, it dips. It would dip even more if it was not for the elasticity of the muscles. Um, notice also that the mean arterial pressure is closer to the diastolic than the systolic side, and that's just because diastole is longer. So it's effectively twice as long as the systolic pressure. Um, so if arteries are, are pressure reservoirs, then veins are volume reservoirs. Here we can fit the uh, some, some in our, in our veins, uh, veins, we're going to fit the blood. And if we put in more blood, then they're just going to expand. They're not going to necessarily snap back like an artery. Um, so most of the blood in your circulatory system is, in fact, stored in the veins and venules. And this is going to come back when we look at um, pressure volume uh, graphs, venous return graphs. So because they don't have much pressure to rely on, on getting blood through the venous system, we have skeletal muscles which can uh, contract, which can push blood forwards. On top of that, we're going to have valves which prevent the backflow. Um, and so when you are on a long flight, they say walking is good for your circulation. Yeah, one of the reasons is that the pumping of the calf muscles and, and other muscles is going to sort of milk the blood through the venous system back up to the heart. Um, so just a little summary of that, you can think of uh, arteries as a pressure reservoir. So if we looked at a particular um, volume over here, so a particular volume X, uh, we're going to have a small amount of pressure in the veins and a large amount of pressure in the arteries. So we're seeing that there is a uh, large storage of pressure in the arteries, large storage of energy to some extent. And for the veins, if we looked at a particular uh, Y pressure, we're going to see that there's not much volume in the arteries, but there's a ton of volume in the veins. So volume reservoirs versus pressure reservoirs. Um, and the arterioles, as I, as I mentioned, contribute mostly to the resistance. So the thing to look at here is the fact that the arterioles have a lot of smooth muscle and they have very little elasticity. On the top of the fact that they are particularly small um, and a small diameter is going to give you a large resistance. So um, the, the veins, on the other hand, uh, are, don't have much smooth muscle and much more compliant. Um, uh, AV val malformation versus fistula, these are more or less the very similar. Um, for the AV malformation, blood's passing through too quickly. Um, it, it, uh, it's not branching off into all of the smaller capillary beds that we would like to, um, individual uh, capillary vessels. So um, we get... Uh, um, AV malformation uh, shown there. AV fistula is very similar, but I think this is just a, um, and typically an artificial, a lot of times they'll do this in a surgery, uh, combining an artery with a vein where they actually shouldn't be connected. So rather than the capillary bed not working, it's just the connection is at some place where it shouldn't be. Um, mediastinum is really just in between our two lungs over there. Um, and again, in between our two lungs, here's our mediastinum. This is really just where our heart is. Um, in the thoracic cavity. Uh, the anterior mediastinum contains the thymus. The posterior me mediastinum contains the esophagus and the uh, aorta. And then the things like the heart, pericardium, ascending aorta, uh, descending in, uh, ascending vena cava, 
uh, inferior, superior, uh, all going to be in the central, middle, mediastinum. Um, notice the left atrium is on the posterior side, so it's going to be interacting with the esophagus. Um, the left ventricle is obviously on the left border. It's kind of on the posterior as well. And then the right ventricle is on the anterior side and, and on the right. Uh, and then the aorta is going to sneak through, poke through the um, uh, pericardium, as we'll see in a second. Um, so the pericardium, uh, it depends how we want to quantify the layers. Not so important. On the outside, we have the fibrous pericardium. And then on the inside, we have the serous pericardium. Uh, the In between the parietal pericardium, which we can see right here, um, we're going to have a lot of the pericardial space, pericardial fluid, which uh, can, you know, pericarditis, we can see this inflamed, cardiac tamponade, we can see lots of blood leaking here, and that can be bad, can compress the heart. Um, the serous pericardium, so it's going to be on either sides of this uh, pericardial space, parietal is on the outside, visceral is on the inside. The visceral pericardium is sometimes just called the epicardium, it's covered in adipose tissue, so if you go to your... Um, complete anatomy app and you look at the epicardium, it's often covered in, in fatty tissue. Um, and so this just uh, houses, insulates the heart. You can think of it, a lot of people make the analogy to a balloon. So um, it doesn't go all the way around the heart, right? We need a way for the vessels to get in and out. So the aorta, the vena cava, the pulmonary arteries and veins, et cetera, are gonna come through this top portion. Um, and so it'd be like if you push your hand into a balloon. So the outside here being the parietal pericardium, the inside being the um, pericardial space, pericardial fluid, and the inside being the visceral pericardium, also known as the epicardium, fibrous pericardium would be over there. Um, uh, pericardium innervated by the phrenic nerve. So if you have pericarditis, uh, it might refer pain to the neck or the shoulder, um, which are also innervated by the phrenic nerve. Um, the fibrous nature of the pericardium prevents it from overfilling, which would be bad, contribute to something like a dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, so the pericardium uh, is covering the heart. Heart has these three muscle layers, um, which we'll see here. Uh, so we have the epicardium, also known as the um, visceral uh, serous pericardium. We have the myocardium, which you'll see is the thickest layer by far, and it's the most, it has the largest oxygen demand. And then the endocardium, which is the deepest on the inside, um, which is going to be in contact with the fluid. The blood is going to be right over here, uh, interacting with the endocardium. And very important is that the coronary artery arises from the epicardium. So the coronary artery uh, originates here, we might say, and then it extends through the myocardium all the way into the endocardium. Again, over here is the lumen, the lumen, which is really just where all of the blood of our atria and our ventricles are. Um, and it might seem kind of silly, like there's so much blood around. Why don't we just uh, take some of that blood and, and, and feed the myocardium itself? Um, it's because this, this might be thousands and millions of cells thick. Uh, diffusion really only works at a small uh, distance, so we need the um, coronary artery to penetrate and permeate the uh, myocardium to, to feed it, really. Um, and uh, right atrium just receives uh, its nutrients, not its nutrients, but it receives the venous blood from the superior inferior vena cava. We know that. Um, right atrial, fun facts, um, it has the sinoatrial node. It also has the atrioventricular node. Um, it has something called the uh, foramen uh, ovale, is what you have is a fetus where blood can flow from the left atrium, or excuse me, from the right atrium to the left atrium, which will be high pressure and then low pressure. Notice that's the reverse of the order as an adult where the left atrium is at a higher pressure. Um, the remnant, the vestigial feature is called the fossa ovalis. Um, sometimes it doesn't close. People have a patent form in ovale, which we'll talk about. Um, we also have the coronary sinus. So the sinus is, uh, if the coronary artery is what's feeding the heart tissue, then will the venous system for the heart tissue is going to collect uh, the coronary veins into the coronary sinus, which is in the right atrium. It's also on the very rightmost uh, border of the heart. Um, yeah, uh, the tricuspid valve, um, an atrioventricular valve that separates the right atrium from the right ventricle. Uh, we're gonna pump through the pulmonary valve into the uh, pulmonary arteries, which are blue, which are deoxygenated, as we said, and these are gonna go to the lungs, pick up oxygen. And then we're going to go to the left atrium and the left ventricle. Um, why is this so thick? The left ventricle has a much harder time pumping blood all the way to your head and your knees and your toes. Uh, that's, a, that's a taller order, so we need more muscle uh, for the ventricles to contract. This is the interventricular septum uh, separating the left ventricle and the right ventricle. And um, yeah, the right ventricle, as we're seeing, is a little bit uh, thinner. Um, 
And yeah, the left ventricle is just pumping through the aorta to the rest of the body. Um, left ventricle is going to be, so again, this is the interventricular septum. Um, it's going to be the left uh, border. It's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit on the, it's not as anterior as the, um, the right portion of the heart. Um, and it's going to contribute to the, it's going to touch the apex of the heart right over here. Um, and it's going to contribute a little bit more to the posterior side if we look at it from the back over here. Um, we mentioned this earlier, you cannot feed the myocardium with effusion. Instead, you need a uh, coronary artery uh, sort of originating from the serious, um, like the, the serious uh, visceral pericardium, also known as the epicardium. And then this is just going to feed through and feed the, the myocardium. Um, so uh, as we mentioned, uh, the left ventricle through the coronary arteries feeds the myocardium and the cardiac veins will drain into the right atrium and the sinus. Um, and these originate in the epicardium, also known as the visceral serous pericardium. Um, so if there was a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, uh, who's going to get screwed over? Um, if it's a small one and it's originating the epicardium, the epicardium is going to be the last to start because that's where the coronary arteries are sort of starting. We can think of it that way. So the myocardium and the endocardium are going to be the first to, to die off or, or um, become ischemic. Uh, but if you have a big MI, then it's going to be what we would say is transmural. It's going through all three muscle layers. Um, so we'll talk more about that later. Um, coronary, coronary is in, is in king, is in crownly. Um, and they just thought that, uh, you know, if this is my aortic valve, the coronary arteries kind of originate off of this and they, they look like a crown going, uh, you know, I, I don't quite see it, but I guess I get it. Um, heart valves. So we have the, uh, the two atrioventricular valves, which are the mitral and tricuspid. The mitral is also known as the bicuspid. Why? Because it just has two of these while everyone else has three. Um, the pulmonic over here and then the, uh, the aortic over here. Um, major issues with these is they can become stenotic, which just means it takes a lot of pressure, a lot of effort to open them. They are a little bit stiff um, and like a door that's stuck. And then regurgitation is uh, blood is actually going to leak backwards. They're, they, they're not closing properly. So a bunch of stuff is blowing backwards. Um, if we're looking at this. Uh, we're looking at the, um, you know, here's our tricuspid. Here's our bicuspid. Uh, but which one of these is the aortic versus the pulmonic? Well, we should be able to tell, first of all, it's red, um, which means it must be oxygenated. So this is going to be uh, the aorta uh, and this is going to be the pulmonic. On top of that, the coronary arteries are originating from them. They don't originate from the pulmonic. They originate from the aortic. Um, so if we're looking at the aorta, aortic root is just the bottom. Like this is basically the left ventricle right here um, in, in the aortic valve. So the aortic root is just the, sort of the beginning. Um, ascending aorta, descending aorta, down, we're going to say that this is the abdominal aorta. And... Um, the right and coronary, right coronary artery, left coronary artery are just branching right off of these. Um, so the coronary arteries, we said, are going to originate right at the beginning of the ascending aorta. Um, they can, very important, they can only fill and feed the myocardium during diastole. So during systole, uh, these, these flaps are basically going to press over um, the coronary sinus here, the opening into the coronary system, blocking entry. And so blood is just going to go in this direction. But when it's relaxed a little bit, when the valve closes, it now stops covering the coronary uh, opening. And so blood can, can get through there. I think we'll see a better picture later. So they can only fill during diastole. So um, that'll come up again and again. Um, so the coronary uh, coming from the aorta, we have the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery. The right coronary artery goes to the acute marginal artery, which just feeds the right ventricle. Um, the posterior descending artery, the PDA. Um, so th this, most people are going to be right dominant, which just means the PDA originates from the right coronary artery, not the left coronary artery. If this is the case, it feeds the AV node. It makes sense. This is in the right atrium. And the interventricular septum on the posterior side, well, this is the posterior descending artery. So that, that all sort of checks out. Um, the left coronary artery has the uh, left anterior descending artery, uh, also known as the Widowmaker. Um, I guess men 
who men are disproportionately at risk for uh, myocardial infarctions, and, and this might be lethal. And so the idea is that they would make their, you know, this artery is responsible for generating a lot of widows. Um, the LID uh, going right down over the, the, the sort of the center of the heart in between the left and right uh, ventricles, the interventricular septum on the anterior side, the left ventricular wall, and the antero, the, the lateral was always a little confusing to me. I just think of the, the, the fact that it's antero. That makes sense. The LCA, the, or the LAD is on the anterior side. So this is the anterior papillary muscle. There's two papillary muscles that are holding on to the mitral valve, uh, uh, chordae tendinae. Um, LCX, the lateral, um, the left circumflex artery. Uh, sometimes the PDA can originate from this, which is really just from the, the left coronary artery. Uh, so this would be left dominant. This is obviously not as common. Um, this could feed the, uh, the, the left ventricular wall. Um, and then the, the postero uh, medial papillary muscle. So again, I just think about the postero. It makes sense. The LCX uh, is sort of going over here. Um, and then shown on the posterior view, it's snaking over here. So it makes sense that it would get the posterior uh, left ventricular wall and then the posterior papillary muscle. By the way, the, the ventricular uh, walls, especially the anterior side, are going to be really important um, from like one to two weeks after a heart attack. This is very prone to rupture, which could result in a pseudoaneurysm, cardiac tamponade, or just, you know, it's pretty bad to have a giant hole in the middle of your heart. So, um, and then we have the obtuse uh, marginal artery, nothing to write home about that. Um, so am I bad at math? No. Um, uh, what is it? Like 7% of people might be um, co-dominant, meaning the PDA can sort of arise from both. Uh, so there's a bit of redundancy there. So the AV valves, um, they have chordae tendinae, um, which grab on to the, to the valves, preventing them from prolapsing, uh, pushing into the atria. Uh, and then the papillary muscles uh, are going to kind of give them tension. We'll see a picture of this in a hot second. Um, so uh, here's our, our, our valves, here's our chordae tendinae, and here's our papillary muscles. Um, and so, you know, blood can't get in when this is closed, right? If it's during ventricular systole, I want to push pump blood through the, um, the pulmonary, uh, 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 valve and the aortic valve. I don't want to pump it back into the atria. That would be really bad. If you've got blood flowing in both directions, that's very, it's no point. That's, that's bad. Um, and so this, this can prevent that, uh, but we also don't want the valves to kind of balloon up into, which you'll see in mitral valve prolapse. So uh, this is why we have that there. So without them, uh, yeah, you're going to have uh, regurgitation occur. Um, so during systole contraction, some blood is going to the atria. Whoops. Um, so why would mitral stenosis cause dysphagia uh, and or hoarseness? Well, if you have mitral stenosis, you have a very stubborn, stiff mitral valve. You try to pump blood or push blood from the atria to the ventricles, but it's a little bit difficult. So we need uh, a little bit more of an atrial kick, a little bit of a stronger one. So there'll be hypertrophy and, and enlargement of the, um, of the left atrium. And the left atrium, so we'll, we'll notice that this is actually not how the heart sits. Uh, and that rotation is actually quite key. Uh, this is the apex here, and then the left side's a little bit more on the posterior. And so the left atrium is actually very posterior. So the left atrium is by far the most posterior thing, like we mentioned earlier. It's going to compress on the um, esophagus uh, and cause dysphagia, trouble swallowing, and it's going to compress the um, left recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is going to cause hoarseness. Um, and again, we see a picture of the left atrium uh, is in connection with the esophagus. Um, cool. Let's talk about all these fun terms, uh, the equations for those fun terms, and the even more fun graphs for all of these equations. Um, all right, little analogy, Ohm's law, V equals IR, voltage is the current times the resistance, uh, very much similar to pressure is equal to flow rate, uh, current times resistance. Um, if you break down resistance a little bit more, it's equal to resistivity times length over the cross-sectional area. We have a really similar thing with uh, Pousseau's law over here. Um, this is viscosity, which is basically resistivity, length over some sort of derivation of area. Long story short is that if you have a small uh, radius, then you're going to have a high resistance. There's not a lot of different pathways for the current to travel, similar for the blood. So low R is going to um, cause a high resistance. This would be a vasoconstriction. Um, and the viscosity of blood is also going to be uh, correlating with the 
amount of resistance that we gener generate. So anemia, there's not a lot of red blood cells, low resistance. Polycythemia, a lot of red blood cells, more resistance. Um, as we've mentioned before, most of the resistance, really the friction comes from the arterioles. They have a low elasticity and a very small radius. Um, in the same way that current goes from high voltage to low voltage, blood will go from high pressure to low pressure. And the continuity equation, which is really just saying that there's a, um, so this is now electricity and also water, um, the volumetric flow has to remain constant. It is the exact same when we're looking at it with pressure. We'll talk more about this. Kirchhoff's loop rule says that if you go in a closed circuit, you cannot gain or lose voltage. Um, same thing here is we're not going to gain or lose net pressure. We're going to lose pressure, but we're going to gain that pressure back up at the heart pump. And so the net pressure as we go through a full circuit should not change over time. Um, so same way that friction is going to slowly dissipate our kinetic energy, right? We're losing this to, to heat. Um, we see a similar thing with high voltage to low voltage. Um, this is being dissipated as heat, which we see in our toaster coils. Um, and it's the same thing with our, our blood, high pressure to low pressure, dissipating this off as energy and heat. So we should lose pressure. We saw this earlier going from the, uh, the arterial pressure high, venous pressure low, is because we lose so much of this energy, mostly through the arterioles. Um, so uh, water is the charge, the flow is the current, uh, and the resistors um, uh, are really just these narrow areas here. Um, and our water pump can be thought of as a battery or a heart or who, who cares. So if I'm at 50 tours over here uh, and then I lose a lot during my resistance where it narrows, um, I'm now at 10 tours and I should gain 40 here. So this is Kirchhoff's loop rule uh, applied to water. It also would apply to blood and of course it applies to our battery as well, our, our circuit here. Um, for volumetric flow, volumetric flow, uh, you know, so if Coming out of the my hose is 0.1 liter per second, uh, and you know you're hilarious. You're a little kid, and you're trying to mess with your brother or sister. You put your thumb over the end uh, end of this. Uh, a lot less fluid can come out, but we have to preserve that 0.1 liters coming out per second. So to to remain uh, its continuity equation because we must remain the continuous nature of the flow. It's got to come out a lot faster um, to still be 0.1 liters per second. Um, and uh, so we see this when we go from a, a large vessel to a smaller vessel, things should speed up in the blood. And if that's true, then why is it um, go slower from an artery, which is large, to a capillary, which is small? I would expect it to, to speed up. Well, it's because we need to think about the fact that it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. One artery does not lead to one capillary. One artery leads to thousands of capillaries um, shown here. So the aggregate, the integration of all of the cross-sectional areas for the capillaries is actually much larger than it is for the artery. Hence, it slows down and we want it to slow down because I want effective blood delivery. Um, you know, it's like the FedEx guy driving down your uh, single lane street and you want them to be going slow so they can drop off the packages and pick up, I guess, the garbage from the, all of the houses, the cells along the way. Um, so again, we see that the area goes up and the velocity goes down. Bernoulli's equation, long story short, um, here we have uh, sort of kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, pressure energy. The idea is that this is also continuous. So if we're not changing anything with the height, so let's ignore the gravitational potential energy. If what we just said is true with the continuity equation, this should be a higher speed. If this is a higher speed, that means that the kinetic energy component has gone up, which means the pressure should go down. That is exactly what we see. We see a lower pressure in these high velocity situations. This will come back. This is important. And... Um, trying to think what else about this. Uh, the, way, the way I suppose you could think about this is if this is going slow, it has all the time and energy in the world to kind of swing side to side and run up against the walls of this vessel. Um, that is what pressure is. Pressure is just particles banging on the walls. And in this case, the, the, the particles, too much of their energy is collaborating. It's directing itself um, in, in agreement to go in the rightward direction. So it has less time to bang up and to bang down, which is why the pressure becomes lower. Um, so if you look at an aneurysm like this, uh, the opposite should occur. If it's a large diameter, it should be a low velocity, uh, which means it should be a high pressure. Aneurysms are prone to rupture. Um, 
two main types of blood pressure. So if someone's 120 over 80, it's a systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure. The systolic pressure is when the heart ventricles squeeze, it pu pushes the blood out. You can feel this in the pulse. And the diastolic is this pressure reservoir um, with elasticity springing backwards. And the springing backwards keeps a little bit of pressure in the arterial system so we don't dissipate it as quickly. And it just pushes the blood continuously forward. We do not have this as much in the venous system. Um, so systolic, diastolic, pulse pressure is really just the difference. So 120 and 80 would give us 40. Uh, aortic regurgitation, if I have a leaky aortic valve, then that means the high pressure of the aorta is going to push, yes, forwards, but also backwards, back into the left ventricle. This is going to lower the diastolic blood pressure. And so this, you have a normal systolic pressure, but a much lower diastolic blood pressure, which is said to contribute to this water hammer uh, collapsing pulse. If I was cooler, I could tell you what a water hammer is, but it's some fun tool that I don't know. I don't know what it is. Um, but the, the, the you, you feel a normal pulse, but it collapses really quickly. That makes more sense to me. So the mean arterial pressure, we touched on this earlier, diastolic is twice as long as systolic. So two thirds and one third, twice as long. And so if we want the mean pressure, it's not just going to be the average of the two. It has to uh, lean towards the diastolic a bit. So um, two thirds, 80, one third, 120 gives us 93.33. What's another way of finding this out? Okay, we could also say that the mean arterial pressure is, um, you know, we just said this, but uh, if we know that the pulse pressure is the um, the systolic pressure is the pulse pressure plus the diastolic blood pressure. That means that we can plug in for the systolic blood pressure uh, this over here. So now I have one third the pulse pressure plus the diastolic blood pressure. When I multiply this out and add it, I get three thirds. Three third is really just one. Um, and so we get this fun equation. So on the test, I think this was a question on mine, um, was that the, I had to find the mean arterial pressure, but I did not have the systolic pressure. I only had the diastolic and the pulse pressure. So these are two ways to solve it. Uh, you could solve it this way, or you could solve it this way, depending on what you have. Um, I'm going to repeat again. So important that the uh, coronary arteries only fill during diastole. So during systole, we're going to push this up. This kind of closes enough so not a lot of blood can get in here to go to the coronary circuit. On the other hand, during diastole, um, the large pressure is going to snap these uh, valves shut. And now there's much more ability for the blood to flow down into the coronary circuit and feed the myocardium. Uh, more terms. Let's do it. Um, Preload is just the blood going into the heart. Often we could say it's the end diastolic volume. So diastolic is the filling period. So the end of the diastolic volume is just when the blood is, uh, the ventricles are the most full. Afterload just means the, really just uh, the amount of blood pressure, hypertension, the amount of pressure that really that we see in the aorta for the most part. Um, and so it's the resistance that the ventricles have to fight to get the blood out. Uh, we can use MAP to uh, mean arterial pressure to, quanti to represent this. Um, so if I want to change my preload, there's a couple different ways I can do it. Venous vasoconstriction. So if you squeeze the, the, the veins, um, remember that that's where about 60% of the blood is going to, is going to sit. The, the blood gets through, um, a little bit with skeletal muscle. We have valves, but if we could somehow squeeze them, there's a little bit of smooth muscle that is going to, uh, push the blood forwards as we can see here. And a dilation one, we're not going to push it as forward. So we're going to milk the blood through. We saw this with exercise or sometimes we'll see this with exercise. Um, laying down. So it's hard for the blood to get up here. It's easier for the blood. It doesn't have to fight gravity in this uh, case. We're, we're seeing the same effect uh, in this situation. Um, a leg raise, gravity is going to bring the blood back down to the uh, heart. Um, squatting is going to propel the blood forwards in addition to changing the afterload. Saline, well, you know what? If you just put more blood, uh, more fluid in my plasma, that's going to contribute to uh, higher volume. Is going to be a higher pressure. Um, and, uh, you know, something as simple as like RAAS, the RAS system, uh, aldosterone might, uh, and, and ADH might increase the amount of water reabsorbent in the kidneys that would also increase the blood pressure, uh, and therefore their preload. Um, and then nitrates are going to decrease it. Nitrates are going to cause, uh, vasodilation with an emphasis on the venous system. So they're going to decrease the amount of blood going back to the heart. Uh, the valsalva is going to increase the intrathoracic pressure, which makes it more difficult, uh, less incentive for the blood to be pulled in to the 
uh, the, the right part of the heart and the, the, therefore the left part of the heart as well. So uh, Valsalva and, and nitrates will decrease. Um, change afterload, a hand grip is probably the best way. Uh, when you squeeze, you're going to squeeze your arterioles, which increases your uh, total peripheral resistance. Um, nitrates are going to bring the afterload down. So this brings it up, this brings it down. Um, these are vasodilators and they, as we just said, they decrease, not increase preload. Um, so sildenafil, is something that increases CGMP, as do nitrates via uh, nitric oxide. And so they're both causing smooth muscle vasodilation. And I guess the idea is this effect would be synergistic. So if someone is taking sildenafil, also known as Viagra, this would, uh, if you pair this with a nitrate, it's too much vasodilation is going to cause the, uh, the, the blood pressure to, to drop precipitously, which is uh, particularly dangerous. So if you're an EMT, you, you often prescribe nitrates. Um, they're also helpful for dilating the coronary uh, circuit so that your, your heart can get more. So if someone has angina or a myocardial infarction, nitrates might help there. Uh, this is, I think, uh, something's got to give a uh, great Jack Nichols and Diane Keaton movie. He's dating this lady and he's on Viagra and he's in the hospital because he's having like a heart issue. And the doctor puts in nitrates to him and says, are you taking Viagra? Because if you are, it's going to be quite dangerous. Uh, and his, his girlfriend shows up and he's, he's trying to look cool like he's not taking Viagra. And he says, no, I'm not taking Viagra. And then Keanu Reeves, the doctor, says, well, if, if you are, like, we'll, we'll know. It'll kill you. And then as soon as he says that, he freaks out and he, he rips out the, the thing, putting the nitrate into his body because he's been taking a bunch of Viagra. It's pretty funny. Um, how do smooth muscles contract? Different than skeletal muscles. Um, We'll go more into detail this in the pharma section, but um, the contraction aspect, calcium comes in, combines with calmodulin, um, myosin light chain kinase, it is going to phosphorylate this, the phosphorylated myosin can now contract. On the opposite side, uh, nitric oxide and nitrate, it's going to increase the amount of CGMP, which is going to fuel uh, the myosin light chain phosphatase, takes off the phosphate. So now we have a relaxation. Relaxation is dilation, contraction is constriction. And there you go. Um, note that this is different than what we see with the skeletal muscle and the MCAT. Um, this is familiar. This is familiar. This is not familiar. This is a weird, different mechanism for contraction. So make sure not to cross the streams and apply all of that old knowledge about muscular contraction towards smooth muscle. It doesn't work that way. Um, uh, also a little bit different than cardiac muscle as well. So, um, you know, the classic MCAT, pre-med, undergrad stuff. Um, we send with our brains. It's quite cool. An action potential down our nerves releases acetylcholine, binds to the postsynaptic receptor. Uh, Ligand-gated sodium channel brings sodium in. This causes an action potential to move through the T tubules where it goes to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, releases calcium, calcium binds to troponin. Troponin shifts tropomyosin. Now the tropomyosin is out of the way. The uh, myosin can bind onto the actin and this can shorten the sarcomere and cause a contraction. Now, a couple more details, especially ones having to do with cardiac muscle, is that we have these things called DHP receptors, dihydropyridine receptors, which are really just um, L-gated calcium channels. And so this will allow calcium in. There's something called calcium-induced calcium release. So calcium coming in in the phase two of muscular contraction, which we'll get to, um, and is going to interact with the ryanodine receptor, which is going to now uh, cause more calcium to be re released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. More calcium being released now does really what we were just talking about, binds to troponin, tr uh, troponin shifts tropomyosin, etc. We then have this thing called circa. Circa, so I don't really understand the mechanism of this so much, but it's, it's as if when the calcium, it now binds to the troponin, it, it, it's sort of used up, or this is my dumb guy way of understanding it. So to do another muscular contraction, you have to somehow, again, it doesn't make sense because calcium is calcium, but you have to like recycle the calcium. So Circa has to put it back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this is an ATPase pump because it's fighting entropy and you need the calcium to get back in here. So this is lucitropy, relaxing the muscle so that we have more calcium so that we can push it out so that we can get another contraction. So Circa has a very important role because relaxation of the heart is necessary to have a good next powerful oomph contraction. Um, all of this is really just what I just said. Um, we have the uh, dihydropyridine receptor. This lets calcium in, calcium binds to the ranodine receptor, more calcium release. This is calcium-induced uh, calcium uh, release. 
Uh, calcium now binds to the troponin, you know, the rest is history. Now notice that we also do have these beta adrenergic receptors, which, you know, via G alpha and, and adenylate cyclase can make CAMP, CAMP makes PKA. PKA can go ahead and interact with the ryanidine receptors, the dihydropyridine receptors, and it can uh, interact with something called phospholamban, which is inhibiting circa. So it's inhibiting the inhibitors, so we get more circa, so we get more relaxation. So at the end of the day, this is just going to uh, promote healthy, strong heart contractions. Um, and Woo. Uh, yeah, a long story short, for whether you're dealing with skeletal, cardiac, or smooth muscle, more calcium means more contraction if you're ever confused. Um, and this is just a picture of what we just talked about. Um, this is uh, rigor mortis. So rigor mortis is, you know, keeping all of the calcium inside of this, we said, requires ATP. And so if I die, I stop producing ATP, um, and this, this pump's not going to work for free. So this is very low entropy and entropy wants to increase. And so if I run out of en energy, the, the calcium is just gonna flood out. It's gonna flood all over the cell and more calcium in the cell is going to uh, induce contractions, which is why people's muscles will stay contracted. In addition to that, um, um, for skeletal muscle, um, you need ATP to release myosin from actin and you're not producing ATP. So it's just gonna stay bound. The sarcomeres are gonna stay contracted and it's short. Um, Contractility is the ability to really just generate a, a strong, you know, stroke volume. So to generate X stroke volume provided a certain preload and afterload, um, it's how much oomph you get. As we talked about, catecholamines, beta adrenergic, uh, beta one receptors um, can interact with these and causes a bigger contraction. Um, the, you know, the vagus nerve is going to cause a smaller, less contraction and certain medications can alter this as well. Um, so the stroke volume we said is the end diastolic volume and then the um, uh, the end systolic volume, um, and, uh, bu 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 the ejection fraction is really just, uh, the stroke volume, how much gets out over the end diastolic volume, how much was there in the first place. Larger end diastolic volumes, uh, means more stroke volume, lower end systolic volumes means, excuse, uh, higher of this means, uh, negative effect on the stroke volume. Uh, entropy is just a, a measure of talking about what our contractility is. So more entropy, more contractility means a larger stroke volume as well. This is a good picture of end diastolic volume right before the contraction. And this is right after the contraction. Um, so beginning of systole, end of systole. Um, so preload is measuring this. Afterload is measuring this. Entropy, uh, it doesn't really have direct measurement, but, um, we can see that all of these, you know, increase, 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 decrease, increase, increase. If you think about this, this should make sense. More fluid means you're going to pump more out. More resistance means you're going to pump less out. Stronger heart, better contractibility intrinsically is going to mean stronger stroke volume as well. Um, cardiac output is uh, stroke volume times heart rate. So my stroke volume is, um, I don't know, let's say it's one liter, which is way too much. And my heart rate is 60, then my cardiac output is 60 liters per minute. Um, but there's a lot more that actually goes into what the cardiac output it is. Uh, the heart rate and the stroke volume, which again, have their own uh, factors. So if we just look at, um, actually uh, real quick, so uh, Ohm's law, P equals QR. Um, Q can be said to be cardiac output. So cardiac output is pressure over resistance and pressure is represented as mean arterial pressure divided by the total peripheral resistance. Um, heart rate. So heart rate, you might just think larger heart rate, more pumps, means more cardiac output, but it's, it's more complicated as, as I said. Um, so notice that the cardiac output's actually going down um, and the stroke volume is always going down. Why is that the case? Well, if you're pumping way too quickly, um, you need long diastoles. Diastole is where the ventricles fill with blood. And if it's not long enough, then you just won't adequately fill the chambers. Um, you know, this is similar to Hypertrophic, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or restrictive cardiomyopathy. If you can't fill the heart, then you get a crappy stroke volume and that decreases your cardiac output. So at a certain point, there's diminishing returns with the heart rate because it can't fill. Um, how do the uh, sympathetic and peripheral uh, or the parasympathetic nervous system affect the heart rate? Um, uh, they are going to mostly affect phase four. Um, the vagus nerve is also going to hyperpolarize it a little bit, but that's less interesting, um, mostly phase four. So um, we have this normal and we have this parasympathetic and we have this sympathetic. And what you'll notice is the slope here is meh, the slope here is less and the slope here is more. 
Based on this phase four slope, we'll determine what the heart rate is. We'll talk about this uh, in great detail later up, but this is the main mechanism of controlling the heart rate. Um, so as uh, stroke volume, as we talked about, if we wanted to just imagine what happens um, uh, with like an athlete and, uh, during exercise, um, the preload goes up because skeletal muscle contraction, especially in the venous system, is going to melt blood back to the heart. So increased preload means increased stroke volume. Uh, the afterload is up because this vasoconstriction is going to increase the uh, mean arterial pressure, right? Higher you know, constriction means lower um, radius. Lower radius means that the resistance is up. So uh, it makes it harder actually to get blood out. Um, because of the epinephrine and norepinephrine. Um, so that actually is, is bad uh, if you're thinking about wanting to get more blood to your body. That the contractility is up because of the catecholamines are also stimulating the heart. So this is pro, this is pro, and this is anti. So how does this, you know, all mix together at the end of the day? It turns out that the catecholamine uh, contractility factor is much larger than the afterload factor and also paired with the preload as well. So you're gonna get a much larger stroke volume at the end of the day if you're exercising. Um, Let's talk about contractility. So um, the rest of this unit is just going to be looking at starling curves and venous return curves and putting them on top of one another. Um, so if we look at this curve, the right atrial pressure or end diastolic volume or preload, a lot of these, you know, there's maybe slight nuances, but more or less they're referring to the same thing. Um, and here we have the cardiac output or the stroke volume, again, largely measuring the same thing. And this should make sense. As we go to the right, we're increasing the amount of blood in the heart. And as we go up, we're increasing the stroke volume uh, or the amount of cardiac output that we have. Um, and so we see this general trend. That makes sense. I should be able to output more blood here with a large stroke volume than if I am sitting right there. Um, now, note that there's many things we can do to change this. We just talked about exercise. This is going to dramatically increase the stroke volume because the increased preload and increased um, contractility offset the slight increase in afterload. Heart failure is basically when your heart sucks, whether it's systolic or diastolic, we're just not getting enough blood out. Um, hypertension, um, stenotic aortic valves, et cetera. Um, this is going to lower it. We should actually maybe look here for that. This is going to dramatically lower the contractility. But you know what? If you pair it with catecholamines or any sort of positive endotrope that increases contractility, we're going to go from here to here. Um, so there is a bit of a problem. Uh, how do we know what the actual um, cardiac output is? Um, Swan Gans catheter really just measures the uh, left atrial pressure to tell us uh, what the preload is. Um, uh, and so if we just to put this another way is, um, yeah, maybe we know that we're in the normal curve, but how do I know if I'm here on the curve or here on the curve or here on the curve unless I directly measure the preload? It's hard to know what the cardiac output is with this. So is there uh, a way to figure this out? Yes, obviously. Um, so to do this, we got to understand the venous return curve. So the venous return curve is similar and different, and we're going to mesh them together in a hot second. So talking about cardiac outputs, the amount of blood leaving the heart, this is more or less talking about the amount of blood returning to the heart. Um, X-axis is the same. So Y-axis is a little different. X-axis is the same. And again, we can just think of this basically as the amount of blood entering into the heart um, or, or, or the, uh, the, the right uh, atrium. Um, and uh, so I guess first, if we, if we just look at um, the, if the amount of blood entering into my uh, heart is very large, um, then I should have a relatively small uh, preload. Um, and if we increase the, uh, the preload, then the venous return goes down as well. Um, so this x-intercept is particularly important. Uh, uh, or medium important, let's not exaggerate. This is a mean systemic pressure. So this is really a theoretical thing. What this measures, um, if there was no movement of the blood, effectively, if your heart stopped, what would be the pressure in your entire circulatory system? Um, and if you think like, okay, well, my maybe my uh, arterial pressure is like 110 on it, maybe the mean, and then the mean venous pressure is like 10, right? The venous pressure should be much lower. Um, 10 plus 110 is 120 divided by two. Maybe the mean is 60, right? Is we just average the arterial and the venous side. It doesn't work like that because um, remember that most of the blood is actually in the venous system. So, um, so it, we're, it's not going to be necessarily 50-50 weighting. 
Um, and, and another way to think about the, the concept is that if you had blood here, it wouldn't want to go up and it wouldn't want to go down because the pressure has equilibrated throughout the entire body. Um, so uh, the pressure is going to be particularly low uh, for the MSP. Um, all right, now going back to the, the venous return curve, uh, what if we make alterations to this? So previously we did contractility and heart failure for the Starling curve. Uh, what about increased volume? Well, if you increase the amount of volume, yeah, you're going to increase the, the venous return here. Um, more volume just means more blood's going to get back to the heart. This is straight up. Uh, additionally, um, we should increase the amount of blood entering into the heart as well. Uh, so like the right atrial pressure should also increase. Like these two things kind of go hand in hand if you think about it. Um, increased venous tone is what we said, like milking the muscle um, through venous constriction. Uh, this is also going to increase the amount of blood coming back to the heart and therefore the right atrial pressure. Um, and on the other hand, if you decrease the volume or decrease the venous tone, it's going to move in the other direction. Um, if you increase the volume, this is also more blood in your circulatory system. At the end of the day, that's really what MSP is measuring. Um, uh, or that, that's maybe the most direct thing that it's measuring is just how much blood do you have? Because if you just die and you just let your blood equilibrate and just stand still, um, more blood in, in a closed system would mean that there's more pressure. Um, increased venous tone, I, I, I suppose this would mean that uh, most of the blood is in the venous system. And if we have uh, an increased venous tone, then this, uh, or I guess once you equilibrate it, maybe half of it would be in the venous system, but an increased venous tone should increase the amount of pressure, even if you have the same amount of fluid. And then vice versa for the uh, decreased volume and decreased venous tone. Um, mind blowing is that the venous return going to the right ventricle um, and the cardiac output leaving the left ventricle, uh, these need to be equal. Uh, on, on, in most settings. So the cardiac output must equal the venous return. And so we can overlap the venous return curve with the Starling curve. So uh, the x-axis represents the same thing it always did, but now the y-axis represents the cardiac output and the venous return, because again, they should theoretically be equal, right? If more blood is leaving your heart than coming back into your heart, maybe that can happen for a little bit. It can be off, but you can't go your entire day with more blood leaving than coming back. Like something horribly wrong with that. You would die and it's just not possible. So think about it. That, that should check out. Um, so uh, if we put these two things on top of each other, the sweet spot right here is going to represent what our actual right atrial pressure um, what our actual cardiac output, what our actual venous return are. Um, and so we can use this to, to gain an, an enhanced understanding of everything. So here's our Starling curve. And previously we said positive inotrope, higher contractility and lower uh, contractility. Um, and yeah, this kind of makes sense that, look, if you just kept your right atrial pressure the same, we see that here I have decreased cardiac output, here I have increased cardiac output. But do we really think that if we had a stronger contracting heart that the x-axis, the right atrial pressure, would stay the exact same? No, it's going to change a little bit. So that's where the venous return curve is going to come into play. Um, this is normally what our cardiac output would be in our right atrial pressure. But if you added a positive inotrope over here um, and a negative inotrope, now it's going to decrease the uh, right atrial pressure, but like we had imagined, it's still going to increase the cardiac output. And this one is going to increase the right atrial pressure and decrease the cardiac output. So the benefit here is just, a, yes, we can still see that the cardiac output increases and decreases, but we can also see uh, by overlapping with the venous return curve how the x-axis is going to shift as well. Um, you're going to do the same thing, uh, but in reverse, right? So I have my uh, Starling curve, but now I want to make alterations to my venous return graph and see uh, how the x-axis uh, would change. Um, so uh, things are going to shift in this particular direction with an increased venous return and, and uh, you know, whether that's tone or volume increase. And then the other direction if we decrease those factors. Um, decreasing the total peripheral resistance, um, nitrates uh, might do this. Um, both curves will change. So you're going to have an easier time pumping stuff out, uh, which is why the Starling curve is going to increase the contractility of the cardiac output. At the same time, if you have less resistance, it's easier to get everything through the body quickly and in one piece so that it gets back to the heart. So the venous return should also increase. So we see both of these increase and, um, uh, so this is going to be like hypotension. Uh, if you increase uh, the TPR with like a fistula or hypertension of vasopressors, um, it's going to decrease contractility because it's got to fight everything. There's a large afterload. Um, 
It's also going to make it more difficult to get back to the heart, right? The arterioles are really squeezing down. It's really just trickling through the venous system. You're going to have less getting back uh, um, to the, uh, the the venous side of the heart. Um, and notice that the um, uh, the mean systemic pressure uh, stays the same. I, I'm not actually sure the reason for this. My my guess, understanding could be wrong. Look it up. Is that the arterioles? Um, as they're like earlier, we had the venous constriction, and the venous system might represent like fifty percent of everything. So if I have venous constriction, that should increase. You know, once all the blood is just sitting there, you know, it's not moving; it's just you know, it's just pooling. You know, it starts exerting pressures, and we say that that pressure is pretty low. Um, and if you constrict the venous side, well, now it looks like this. So fifty percent of it is going to have you know, smaller diameter increased pressure. Um, but if you increase the total peripheral resistance, most of this comes from the arterioles. And the arterioles is just, you know, again, the blood is equilibrating throughout the entire body. And the venous might make up like half of that, but the arterioles are just making up a really, really small portion in the arterial system. So that actually wouldn't have a substantial effect on what the uh, the mean systemic pressures. Again, that's a total guess. I'm not really sure. So uh, feel free to look it up. I don't think it really matters that much. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about some more graphs, uh, pressure volume loops, and then the cardiac cycle curves. Um, whew, yeah, there's a lot going on here. Um, we have something with the left atrial pressure, something with the left ventricular pressure, something with the aortic pressure. Um, we're getting information about the uh, right atrial tracing, that dashed line there. Um, we have heart sounds, we have ventricular volume, um, the right atrial pressure. We just saw that over here, but we're seeing it again here, not superimposed on the ventricular. And the ECG or EKG if you're German. Um, let's talk about the EKG first. Um, note as well that we also have several phases, um, which we'll go into. Um, all right, EKG, the P wave has to do with the atrial depolarization, therefore contraction. Um, the PR segment is where it is traveling through the AV node. The AV node kind of plays defense, we'll talk about. It slows it down uh, significantly so that the ventricles have time to fill and contract. And then the QRS represents the ventricular contraction, um, which is their depolarization. Um, the actual muscle contraction, so I guess this is the depolarization. The contraction itself is actually takes a lot longer um, all the way up until the T. And then the repolarization and the relaxation uh, ensues. Uh, thereafter. So when we're going from the SA node to the AV node to the bundle of hist to the Purkinje fibers. Uh, we'll talk more about this. Um, so always remember electricity first and then contraction. So if we're looking at the ventricular volume now uh, in relation to the ECG, um, over here we have a P wave. You only see half of it in the EKG. Um, and notice that we have a little uptick in our ventricular volume. That's because the P wave is the atrial kick, the atrial depolarization. It's a little tiny atrial contraction just to push the, squirt the last little bits of blood into the ventricle. So it doesn't go up a lot, but it goes up a little bit. Um, again, electricity first. Notice that this precedes the rise. Similarly, QRS is the ventric ventricular depolarization. Um, but notice, I, I don't see an immediate drop in ventricular volume because electricity first and then light, electricity first and then contraction. So we have our electricity, the depolarization. It takes a bit for the contraction to really follow through, right? We, we've, we have uh, an upstroke phase zero, then we have to have a downstroke phase one with voltage-gated potassium channels, then we have a phase two where, you know, potassium and calcium are, are, are uh, tied, and this then induces a calcium release. All of this is happening, you know, the calcium release, the dihydropyridine L-gated calcium channels interact with the um, ryanidine receptors, which pushes calcium out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which binds the troponin, shifts the tropomycin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That takes time. That is why you don't just have an immediate emptying. You have the signal. This is the first domino, and then it takes a long time for everything else to happen and the ventricular volume to go down. Even as roller repolarization happens, we technically still are have a little bit of a contraction going on. Because um, it's, yeah. So uh, enough of that. Um, what causes a valve to close? Okay, let's look at the mitral valve. So, um, Again, we have our left atrial pressure is the dashed line, and the left ventricular pressure is, is this. So that's left ventricle, and that is left atrial. Um, notice that the left atrial is higher than the left ventricular during our uh, diastole. Um, this is also diastole, 
uh, and this is diastole, this is our systole. So it's not until the, um, the, we have a little bit of a contraction. Um, so we have our, our P wave, um, which pushes blood in. Um, so that the ventricular volume goes up a little bit, the QRS, the ventricle start to, so it's a combination of a little bit of blood's coming in from the atrium, the, the kick, and then the uh, ventricles are just starting to contract a little bit, and then the pressure starts to rise. And when the pressure of the ventricles exceeds that of the atrium, um, it pushes backwards into the mitral valve and it closes it. And notice, um, so I guess if we had a rule of thumb, it would be that uh, electricity comes first, and then contraction, and I suppose then sound. Um, so that the sound S1 is associated with the mitral valve cl closing. It happens a little bit after. Um, but if the mitral valve is closed, the aortic valve is also closed because the aortic pressure here is larger than the ventricular pressure here. And again, if, if uh, it's, it's a similar relationship. If the aortic pressure is larger than the ventricular pressure, the blood is going to push backwards and close the aortic valve, which means I have a contraction during this period while the mitral valve is closed and the aortic valve is closed, uh, I'm contracting against two closed doors, um, which creates a huge amount of pressure because the blood can't really go anywhere. A huge blood pressure increase. Um, and this is isovolumetric, uh, the volume is not changing, contraction. Then the ventricular um, ventricles become a little bit larger than the aortic valve, and then the aortic valve opens as a consequence, right? The, the pressure is large enough that it can push outwards against uh, the, the inward pressure of the aorta. Um, now we have an ejection, and um, note also that this is diastole, and then at the very top, it's gonna be systolic pressure, so diastolic pressure and systolic pressure. Um, and then what happens uh, as it goes through, um, you know, as more and more blood leaves, uh, the ventricles start to relax, they have less blood, their pressure starts to dip as we can see. And then right here, as the aorta, you know, reigns supreme again and has a higher pressure, um, it is now going to push back again and close the doors, close the aortic valve, and the ventricular pressure is going to go down. I have an aortic valve closed and a mitral valve um, uh, uh, closed as well. Uh, it opens here, which means from here to here it's closed. So this is going to be the isovolumetric uh, relaxation. Um, eventually, it's going to dip back down like it was originally below the atrial pressure. And when it dips below, that's where um, the mitral, the, the blood inside the atrium is now going to be pushing against the door and it pushes it open and then it spills into the ventricles. Uh, notice as well that the S2 uh, proceeds right after the aortic valve closes. That's what causes the lub dub. It's the mitral valve closing and then the aortic valve closing. Um, this is sometimes called the dichrotic notch right there where they deviate. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, Swan Gans is just measuring pulmonary pressure, which is effectively the left atrial pressure, which is in um, direct contact with the pulmonary veins. Um, and it's not a lot. Um, all right, the numbers are, I try to be accurate, but you know, they're not perfect. So just more, I'm interested in the concepts. Uh, let's start here. The atria are filling, atrial pressure is less than ventricular pressure, the valves stay closed. The aortic pressure is larger than the ventricular pressure, the valves stay closed. They, they push backwards to, to close the valves like that. Now the atria start to um, contract a little bit. Um, they, they're filling, actually, I guess they're filling first, technically. They're filling first, blood rushes and once enough blood rushes in, if the pressure in the atria is larger than the pressure of the ventricles, it's now going to push this open. There, we do have an atrial contraction in addition to the fact that the ventricles are filling. And now the pressure here becomes, and the ventricles themselves are contracting, the ventricular pressure becomes a little bit larger than the atrial pressure, and it pushes these valves shut. But it's not bigger than 80, so they stay shut as well. All right, this is where we have the isovolumetric contraction. Contraction, contraction, getting smaller, getting smaller, compressing, compressing, until it gets to like 81. 81, it's not bigger than 80. Again, don't, you know, these numbers are ish, correct? Um, it's going to vary depending on how healthy you are. So this is now going to push the gates open, aortic valve opens, and now I have uh, the ejection of blood um, until the aortic pressure gets so large and, and or the, the ventricular pressure gets a little bit lower because it's losing a lot of its volume so that this is now bigger than this and it pushes backwards. That closes the valves and here we start all over again with the atrial filling. Um, all right, this is uh, atrial pressure tracing. This is looking at jugular venous pressure, which should more or less be the same as the right atrial pressure because it's draining right into the right atrium. Um, and the uh, 
Uh, this is the jugular, which is a large vein, which drains into the superior vena cava. And this is how we get these measurements. So this is, again, a, a proxy for right atrial pressure is just measuring the pressure in the uh, jugular. Um, skip this, not the best picture. Okay, but also not the best picture. Uh, I like this one. Um, so if we're looking at the right atrial pressure through the jugular venous pressure, a um, couple things to explain. One, the A. Uh, the, again, electricity, the P wave of the ECG um, uh, goes first. It causes a contraction of the atria. It's the last little atrial kick to push blood into the ventricles. Um, this causes a rise in pressure. So the A is for the rise in pressure um, that we see associated with the P wave. As you can imagine, then, this is not going to be present in atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation, you do not have a coordinated atrial contraction. And so it's basically a flat line. And so you shouldn't have... Uh, the associated rise in pressure. It should be really large and tricuspid stenosis. Again, we're looking at the right side of the heart, and if there's a stenotic valve, then we really have to like contract hard to open it. Same with pulmonary hypertension or like an AV block. Um, we might have to contract really hard to open it. Um, we then really have a, an X prime and an X. So we can call this X, and we can call this X prime. So X is then just going to be uh, for the atrial relaxation, as the atria then are relaxing, um, they're going to uh, expand a little bit and the pressure is going to go down. That's what we're seeing. Um, and then notice, uh-oh, what do we have right here? Now we have the uh, ventricular contraction starting a little bit. Notice we go up a little bit. So X goes down because the atria are relaxing. Then as the um, ventricles are slamming so hard, we don't really have a good picture of it here, but they're, they're blasting so hard that they're pushing some blood in and closing the, you know, it's associated with the S1, the closure of the, the um, tricuspid valve is going to, it's going to actually push it into the atria. And if it pushes into the atria, the volume gets a little bit smaller, it's getting a little crowded and the pressure builds up. So that's the ventricle, you know, compressing so hard that it blasts the doors of the valve into the atria, which increases their pressure a little bit. Um, then we have the X prime descent here. Um, the X prime is that now the ventricles are, you know, yes, they're still blasting, but as they blast, you know, just imagine it's, you know, your hand shrinking and, and compressing smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's now going to actually, there's room to grow. It's going to pull the atria downwards. The atria are now expanding again. And this is actually going to dramatically decrease the pressure of the atria. Um, and um, then the, the V is going to be for the, um, the venous filling of the right atrium. So now more blood is coming back into the right atria, which is causing the pressure to go up. Notice that this would be much larger in tricuspid regurgitation, right? If during my contraction, I'm pushing blood back into the atria, that volume, that pressure for the atria during the V wave is going to be really high. Um, then we have the Y, which is just the where, sort of where we started a little bit before the A wave. It's the atria just emptying into the ventricles passively, no contraction, no kick yet. Um, and... Uh, cardiac tamponade, uh, it, it's going to be absent. So cardiac tamponade is uh, really like compressing on the ventricles. Or it makes it difficult for the blood to flow from the atrium to the ventricles. Constructive pericarditis is sort of the opposite. It's now going to be um, pressing on the atria, pushing blood actively into the ventricles. Um, so the ones you really need to know, this, 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 so maybe this one a little bit less, this and this too. Yeah, I guess we'll, <laughs> let's talk about all of them. Um, all right, constricted pericarditis, uh, we said that there is an unyielding pericardium which elevates the atrial pressure. In other words, it is pushing very hard into the atrium. Notice these really high pressures. And the second the valves open, boom, it's pressing so hard, it pushes all the blood out. Boom, it pushes all of the blood out. Um, and I guess all the blood's technically going out here. I'm not exactly sure. I guess if it can expand now, it can. It will expand because the pericardium is pushing onto it as the ventricle gives it room to, uh, to, to grow as the ventricles shrink. Um, peri pericardial tamponade is going to be really the opposite. Um, it, it's obstructing the, the passage from blood from the atria to the ventricles. So I have a, a relatively small V wave as opposed to the large V wave. Um, and the tricuspid regurgitation, we said that the V wave should be large because as you're contracting, you're pushing it back into the atria. Um, tricuspid stenosis, we need a really large atrial kick to get to open those valves and, and, and to, uh, to, to get the last little bit out. Um, and atrial septal defect, um, it's going to fill a lot uh, during the V uh, because we have a larger uh, blood flow coming from a higher pressure left atrium. Um, and the complete AV block. So 
if we have an arrhythmia, an AV block, or some sort of um, some sort of dysregulation between the ventricle contract, contraction and the atrial contraction, it might be possible that the atria are contracting while the ventricles are also contracting. The ventricles win. So uh, long story short, the AV valves or the tricuspid valve specifically is closed because of the ventricles. Uh, but the atria don't know that. They're, they're, they're not coordinating. And so they contract really hard into these closed valves. That is going to create an enormous pressure called a cannon wave. Um, atrial fibrillation, uh, very important. We mentioned that just you don't really have any atrial kick. So we're not going to be uh, no A wave. Um, all right, pressure volume loop. So let's tie it all together a little bit. Um, starting here, this is number one. Uh, this is going to be a relatively low pressure. Um, and moving here, this is going to be a higher pressure. Um, and notice here, this is where, uh, this was isovolumetric. Now we have the aortic valve open. So what happens to our ventricles? The volume should decrease, right? This was the diastolic filling. And now we're going to be pushing a lot of the blood out. So now we push the blood. So this isovolumetric contraction. Um, uh, now going here, we're pushing a lot of the blood out. Um, and this is the ejection phase. Um, then we're closing the valve and, and relaxing, isovolumetric relaxation, and then the diastolic filling period. Um, we go and, and head over to the next one over there. Um, all right, so everything in red is our systole. Everything in blue is our diastole. Uh, notice that you're not necessarily filling during all of diastole, uh, just from four to one. Um, although, I don't know, maybe time-wise, four to one is a larger period of time than three to four. Who cares? doesn't really matter. Um, so... Uh, you can also think of this as the uh, the mitral closing, aortic opening, aortic closing, uh, and then the mitral opening again. Um, and if we look at this, remember that the, the the stroke volume is really just the difference between the end diastolic volume uh, at the end of diastole when it's as filled as it can filled as it can be. This is the ventricular volume on the y-axis. Um, the end systolic volume is after the contraction, after we've put out, pushed out as much as we can. The difference is the stroke volume. Um, well, this, as we mentioned, is the end diastolic volume, this is the end stroke volume, and therefore, or the end uh, systolic volume, so the difference is the stroke volume. Um, on the other hand, we can look at the atrial and ventricular uh, pressure tracing. Uh, the diastolic pressure is going to be the lowest aortic pressure that we have, um, and the systolic pressure is the highest aortic pressure that we have, and the pulse pressure is really just the difference between them. So this is also just going to be the pulse, pulse pressure shown over there. Um, so what happens if we increase the preload? If you increase the preload, preload is measured by the end diastolic volume. You should push your graph to the right. It's exactly what we get. Um, we have the same afterload, so we're going to push about the same amount out. So the end diastolic volume goes up, and then this entire difference is their stroke volume should also go up. What if we increase the afterload? Remember, the afterload means that we have, uh, you know, maybe aortic stenosis or we have just a, a lot of hypertension. There's a lot that the ventricles have to battle to get the blood out. Therefore, the main thing that we should note is that the pressures are going to increase. It's just difficult to contract and push everything that we want to push out to push it out. Um, and because it's hard to push everything out, we're probably not going to push as much out, which also means that the end systolic volume should be higher. We're not getting as much out as we want to get out. And if we just put those on top of each other, you can see where I'm going with this. Uh, the stroke volume is also going to be decreased. So pressure's up, end systolic volume is going to be up, and then the stroke volume is going to be down. Um, what if you increase the contractility? already have a little hint over here. Um, well, you're just going to be able to, your stroke volume has got more oomph, right? Uh, it's not anything necessarily to do with the end diastolic volume. The preload might be the same, but the end systolic volume should be a little bit less. We're just going to be pressing, compressing more, pushing more out. Stroke volume should be a little bit larger. Um, and all right, let's go ahead and see if we can pair these. So starting with aortic stenosis, this is really just a huge afterload, huge afterload I see over here. Um, on top of that, we can look at the ventricular atrial pressure tracing uh, versus the, so this is the PV loop. This is the ventricular pressure and atrial pressure tracing in aortic uh, as well. Uh, all three of them paired together. Um, we have these super large pressures shown here, super large pressures shown here. Bing, bang, boom, that is my aortic stenosis. Okay, what about aortic regurgitation? So aortic regurgitation, uh, we should have a larger preload. The reason we have a larger preload is because um, preload is really just the amount of blood in the ventricles during the end of diastole. So if uh, during diastole, a bunch of blood is leaking from the aorta into the ventricles, well, that you know what? That increases our volume, so our preload is going to go up. In addition, um, notice that this is supposed to be isovolumetric. Um, 
I have a little bit of a slant right there. A little bit of a slant. Why? Because this negative slope is because some, um, the volume is, is getting um, smaller uh, because um, a little bit of the blood is leaking out. Um, in addition, we have these, actually, is this, oh my gosh, uh, embarrassing. Yeah, I was, I was about to say, it just didn't make sense. So let, let's explain this in the terms of mitral regurgitation. Mitral regurgitation, you will also have an increased preload. Uh, for a similar reason, um, during when the ventric ventricles are contracting, it's pushing blood from the ventricles into the atria. And um, this is... Uh, um, uh, you know, if you're pushing it back into the atria, that means during the next diastole, you have way more blood in the atria. So the ventricles are also going to fill. So that's also going to have a, a similar increase in preload. Both regurgitations will increase preload. I think that's important. Um, one big tip off for this, uh, probably what I should have detected, is that the tall uh, V wave, um, this is the right, uh, this is the atrial pressure. Um, and so there are, are, we're going to have a lot larger of a venous return um, uh, filling of the atria if during contraction um, there's mitral regurgitation. So during a ventricle systole, I'm supposed to only be pushing it through the aorta, but some of it's also getting through this leaky mitral valve, which might increase the atrial pressure, or definitely will. That's why we see what we see there. Um, and, okay, how do we explain this? Um, this is supposed to be during isovolumetric contraction, right? But no, it's, it's, it's not. Uh, the aorta might be closed, but the mitral valve is open. So some of that volume, it's supposed to be maintained in the ventricles with a fixed volume is actually going backwards into the atria. That's why we see this negative slope. So that, that, that is very telling. Um, we go ahead and look at the next one. So I'm not gonna get burned again by my own slides. The next one, again, where do I see an increase in preload? Here, this is an increase in preload. So this is probably aortic regurgitation. Um, but notice here I'm seeing the, during, you know, this is kind of isovolumetric. This one's a little bit of a negative slope. And that's because this is during the relaxation phase. It, it should be isovolumetric relaxation like we see here. Um, but what's happening is during this relaxation, during this diastole, a lot of the high pressure aorta, a lot of the blood is pushing backwards and leaking through that leaky regurgitant insufficient aortic valve. Um, that's going to increase my volume. Um, we are also have a very large pulse pressure. Systolic pressure is fine, but diastolic pressure has to do with what happens after the ventricles are done and the aorta is left to its own devices. If a lot of the blood leaks... Ah, technical difficulties. Okay, like I was saying, so the diastolic pressure has to do with what happened uh, after the ventricles contract, the, um, the aorta is left to its own devices. That's the pressure, that's the diastolic pressure, which is shown here. And it's very low in aortic regurgitation because a lot of that blood that should be in the aorta that should be contrib contributing to a large diastolic pressure is actually spilling backwards into the ventricle, which dramatically lowers its pressure. Remember that sometimes we call this a water hammer pulse uh, or a collapsing pulse. We have a large uh, pulse, the systole is no problem, but it quickly goes away as you have this aortic insufficiency and in regurgitation. Uh, and then, well, lastly, we know now that this must be stenosis. So how can we figure this out? Um, it's it's mitral stenosis, so it's not really uh, the aortic stenosis is what increases the pressure significantly. This should be a decrease in preload because the aortic valve is um, very difficult to get blood through. Um, so we're just having a hard time getting blood from our atria to the ventricles because of this stubborn door. And as a result, the preload decreases. And we, we see evidence of that right there. Um, and... Uh, that's probably the best way to figure it out. Um, now, if we look at the right atrial pressure, um, the, the mitral stenosis means, one, I have more blood in my atria because it's hard to get them, the left atria, because it's hard to get it through into the ventricles. On top of that, it is, um, uh, it, it might hypertrophy, it might become larger and tougher, and that's also going to increase the pressure. Either way, we should see that the left atrial pressure is much larger than it normally is. Remember that it normally kind of hovers like right along the same value for most of these other than during systole shown here and shown here, et cetera. But it, here it's just screwing way higher. So it should be a giveaway. So com combining all of these, whether you have one graph or two, you should be able to figure out more or less uh, what type of issue you're, you're looking at. And these are probably the four main ones, but you could easily run into um, you know, something like AFib that we saw earlier.
All right, uh, let's talk a little bit more about blood pressure, um, how it's regulated, and, uh, and how it can lead to shock. Um, shock here at the bottom. Um, all right, yeah, uh, that's pretty gross. Weird to think we all got one of these ticking on uh, inside of us right now. Grody. Uh, osmotic pressure. Okay, so you'll remember from Gin Kim, osmotic pressure is one of our four colligative properties. Uh, pi equals IMRT. And effectively, if we have a large concentration inside um, some, some container, some volume, and there's a semi-permeable membrane, water will want to rush in. This is the most important net effect. So water would rush in here, and boom, what do you know? You got more water. So osmotic pressure is technically defined as the theoretical pressure needed to prevent osmosis. So if we exert enough pressure, that'll prevent the pressure of water coming, wanting to come in. Now, typically, we never actually have this pressure. It's theoretical. So at the end of the day, this is typically what happens. Water does rush in rather than little invisible green men pushing on a thing to, to prevent, you know, against a cell membrane to prevent water coming in. So this is, you know, osmotic pressure, high concentration means water moves to that region. Boom. Um, uh, boom, boom, bing, bing, boom. Exactly. Uh, all right. So two types of, types of pressure, hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressure. So... Um, on the arterial end, hydrostatic pressure is just if you fill up a balloon with water, the, the water particles pushing against the balloon, that is the hydrostatic pressure. So it's classic quintessential pressure. So there's so much fluid here, more than there is in the interstitial space pushing back in. So it wants to push out. On the other hand, we do have some interstitial fluid with uh, hydrostatic pressure trying to push water in. It's less, but uh, still it, it exists. Similarly, there's so much little salt particles and especially albumin. So if you hear oncotic pressure, that's just talking about the osmotic pressure due to proteins, which is mostly what the osmotic pull is from and mostly that's albumin. So osmotic pressure is basically oncotic pressure, which is basically albumin. Um, again, this is like a negative sucking pressure. So it wants to pull the fluid in and then we also have little particles in the interstitial fluid wanting to uh, pull the fluid from the blood into the interstitial. So uh, from the... The plasma side, hydrostatic pushes out, osmotic pulls in, and then from the interstitial, hydrostatic pushes into the blood and the osmotic pulls out. So how does this work out at the end of the day? Um, at the arterial end, we have a net efflux. Um, and it has to do with the fact that the net um, hydrostatic pressure is like 35 compared to the osmotic pressure pulling in of 25 means that we're gonna have a net 10 pressure pushing fluid out. So this is helping us deliver water and glucose and, and uh, oxygen and whatnot. Um, it kind of overshoots, it overcorrects. So the osmotic pressure actually never changes, the, the net osmotic pressure. Um, but the hydrostatic pressure, we pushed out too much fluid, so now it's 18. So now it pulls negative seven back in. So we push out on the arterial side, we pull back in on the venous side. Notice also these numbers, plus 10 and minus seven, we're pushing more out than we're pulling in. Well, if you think about that over time, the net effect of pushing out more than you pull in for the interstitial fluid means it would just swell with fluid. That's what we would call edema. And this obviously does happen under some circumstances. Why do we not always have edema? It's because of our lymphatic system. It's a drainage system. It picks up all the super superfluous fluid and it just eventually, you know, at our, at our cervical area, it just will reconnect with the circulatory system. Um, and so causes of edema, um, you know, remember we have these, these uh, many factors. If the hydrostatic pressure is too high, this will uh, push too much fluid out. So this could be uh, in congestive heart failure, the, the fluid backs up if you have right-sided heart failure. Um, or it could be, uh, you could talk about pulmonary hydrostatic pressure being too high if we have left-sided heart failure. Kidney dysfunction, we have too much uh, renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. The ROS system is elevated. And so this is increasing the hydrostatic pressure due to increased fluid uh, because of aldosterone. And also angiotensin II is increasing vasoconstriction, increasing the hydrostatic pressure. Uh, pregnancy also increases the hydrostatic pressure. Um, also, the, the osmotic pressure pulling blood and fluid back in could be too small. Um, liver failure, liver makes albumin, not enough liver. You look at people who are alcoholics and have severe end-stage cirrhosis, uh, they're going to be a little bit swollen. And one of the reasons is because they can't produce albumin. So the osmotic pressure stinks. Malnutrition, uh, quash your core. If not just uh, being hungry and, and starvation, but not having enough nutrients, specifically enough protein, we need the protein to make albumin. And so in developing countries where people are malnourished, uh, their liver won't be able to produce an adequate amount of albumin. So the pull inwards is, is not sufficient. Um, increased capillary permeability. 
Um, I guess infections can cause this, burns as well can cause this, uh, and then uh, lymphatic obstruction. Um, you could kind of guess which one, is it this one or this one, where the lymph nodes were removed, it must have been this one, right? Because there's edema and there's swelling. Often this is because of malignancy. Maybe it's a central node biopsy. Maybe there's a lymphoma. Maybe there's radiation and it damaged some lymph nodes. Um, but whatever the case, you're not draining properly on their right leg, hence the edema. Um, pitting edema is where you press into it and then you just leave it and a pit remains for a second or a couple of seconds after you remove your finger. Um, this is just classic sign of edema, also known as hyperperfusion. We're pushing uh, too much blood out. Um, so shock is really just the opposite of edema in a sense. Uh, it's, it's effectively hypoperfusion. So um, uh, if this was you know too high and too low, then I guess it would stand a reason that it's just the reverse of all four of those. Yeah, you would think, but realistically, it's actually just these two. Um, and in fact, this one, it's really not even that. It's actually really an increased capillary permeability. Um, the reasoning, it's a little bit weird. It's kind of like DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation, where we consume so many clotting factors in one region that in another region of the body, when we do need a clot, uh-oh, we already used up all of our reactants, so there's no clotting that can occur. Similarly, if you push out too much fluid in one part of the body, it's difficult to have uh, adequate perfusion in another, another part of the body. Um, but for the most part, this is far and away the most important factor for shock. So hydrostatic pressure too low, what could contribute to that? Um, the heart does not work. Uh, that's cardiogenic shock. Uh, if there's just no blood, it's missing. This is hypovolemic shock. Uh, if there's an obstruction, if there's a block, this is going to be obstructive shock. And if the blood's in like a, a weird, inappropriate place, right, whether it's distributed to the non-vital organs or it's distributed to the interstitial fluid when we want it to remain in the plasma, um, this is going, and this is kind of what I meant when I said that there's a DIC. Uh, this is distributive shock, of which there are three subtypes sepsis, anaphylaxis, and neurogenic shock. Um, you can picture it this way uh, hypovolemic shock, there's not enough volume. Uh, D, obstructive shock, there's something preventing blood from getting back to the heart and being pumped. Uh, B, cardiogenic shock, it's just not working. And then C, distributive shock. This is probably the trickiest one to conceptualize. Blood is, again, being shunted away from the vital organs towards the non vital organs. Um, so both a combination being pushed towards the non-vital organs and kind of like the, the DIC con concept, it's being pushed into the interstitial space too much of certain regions. So now that means at the end of the day, we do have less fluid for, uh, you know, to maintain an adequate um, hydrostatic pressure. Um, it's cardiogenic shock, heart sucks. Um, this is like severe heart failure. Heart failure is kind of like a chronic concept, uh, cardiogenic shock is like more acute. Like for whatever reason right now, your heart is really, really, really not getting enough blood out. Um, we have techniques that our body automatically does called compensation, vasoconstriction, right? It's just trying to increase the hydrostatic pressure to get adequate perfusion. Vasoconstriction, um, it can make your heart pump more, uh, more strongly and, and the rate increase uh, via catecholamines and also the ROS system. Um, now, this might work a little bit in the short term, but I would say it's myopic because it's, it's going to, you know, eh, I guess there's trade-offs, but it's going to damage your heart in the long run, especially with heart failure if you have all of these techniques that are uh, putting more stress in an already stressed heart. Um, so uh, MI, cardiomyopathy, uh, which can lead to heart failure um, with the heart's just not pumping uh, enough, um, myocarditis or, or arrhythmias can all... Uh, lead to cardiogenic shock, especially uh, VTAC and VFib. Um, hypovolemic shock. So most of this is just, uh, you know, someone's in a car accident, they're losing a lot of blood. Um, they could also maybe have a colon cancer. And then whether it's cryptic or non-cryptic, they are slowly losing blood, uh, you know, over the course of maybe a year in their stool. And then now they just don't have enough blood fluid. And uh, this is the same thing. So that's hemorrhagic from bleeding non-hemorrhagic, so maybe you have a pathogen causing massive diarrhea, you're still losing fluid, more, losing more fluid than you're taking in. Um, burns, so you're increasing the vascular permeability, which effectively means that fluid is leaking out into the interstitial space, so you're losing uh, blood volume. So some people argue, and I don't really care, but just be aware, that some people argue that this technically makes this a distributive shock because it's being distributed um, to the interstitial space in certain areas, and it's not in the plasma where it should be. Um, and again, this is one of the reasons that I made the analogy with DIC. Maybe it's an imperfect analogy, but it, it at least works for me. Um, and then salt wasting, if for whatever reason your blood, your urine is particularly, uh, particularly high osmolarity, this is going to increase your urine output um, and lead to a low volume of your, of your plasma. Um, distributive shock. So 
vasodilation, um, I guess it's a couple things. Uh, if for whatever reason you have massive vasodilation, um, uh, your blood pressure is going to go down. That's one thing. A second thing is the um, loss of plasma to interstitial fluid. So this is kind of one loss of plasma to interstitial fluid. Uh, this is kind of the DIC concept. Uh, both of those contribute to less blood pressure. Also, you know what's really important? My heart, my lungs, my brain. You know what's not important? My skin, my, my fingers. So blood is being shunted away from the important organs towards the less important organs. So what can cause all uh, these, these three things to occur? Um, sepsis, so a bacterial or you know maybe viral, usually bacterial infection, um, is going to cause cytokines. They're going to induce vasodilation and, and redistribute where blood should be. Um, anaphylaxis, so an allergic re response, um, Histamine induces vasodilation, so same same general idea. And the neurogenic shock, your central nervous system is not functioning, uh, and your central nervous system is necessary to vasoconstrict. And if you can't vasoconstrict, you know what happens? By default, you vasodilate. Um, and all right, all of these three kind of summed up. Um, hypovolemic shock is you know uh, you're you're hemorrhaging or you're dehydrated or you're you know, there's burns. Um, the heart rate is trying to compensate, right? It's saying, hey, we're, our blood pressure is really low. Let's pump out more. Um, why are you cold? Because you're distributing blood. You're trying to your body's trying to redirect blood away from your skin and towards your more important organs. Um, and because it's going away from your skin, the, the blood is what gives you. Um, uh, like a nice color, uh, and so pale would just be because you're not getting enough uh, oxygen to your skin, your your peripheral extremities, and uh, clammy is your sympathetic nervous system is kicking into gear to try to increase your heart rate and vasoconstrict. Um, your preload is down because you you know uh, 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 pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So your uh, this is really just measuring how much is going into your right atrium and your right ventricle. So this is your preload. It's going to go down because you know what? You don't have enough blood. That just sort of checks out. And yeah, sure, our heart rate's gone up. But it depends what the numbers are, but very likely that we've just lost so much uh, blood that e even though the heart rate's increased, the cardiac output overall is going to be a, a net detriment. Um, and then the systemic vascular resistance, also called TPR, this is going to increase. Uh, again, this is the sympathetic nervous system trying to increase the blood pressure. Treatment here is just IV fluids, right? Hypovolemic shock, not enough fluids, just give people fluids and that should hopefully balance it out. Cardiogenic shock, whether it's MI heart failure or an arrhythmia, um, your heart rate is gonna increase for same reasons. Um, the sympathetic nerve system, the catecholamines are going to try to increase cardiac output. Cold for the same reasons, you're redistributing away from your extremities and towards your visceral important organs um, and your sympathetic nervous system cause clamminess. Really everything here is the same other than what is the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So if it's the left part of the heart that's not working, um, this should be up because it, we can't get blood into the left part of the heart. So the pulmonary system is gonna be backed up and it's gonna have uh, more fluid and more pressure. And if it's the right part of the heart that's failing, um, and usually the left side leads to the right heart. So if it's progressed to right heart failure, we can't even get it into the lungs in the first place. And so in that case, we might have a decrease in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Um, again, heart's not working, cardiac output's gonna be down, and we're gonna try to vasoconstrict to increase the, the blood pressure. Same, same deal for obstructive shock. I'm not even gonna go over it again. Um, if the obstruction's on the left side, um, you know, maybe there's a clot in the pulmonary veins, or excuse me, if it's a, yeah, a clot in the pulmonary veins, that means there's more fluid in the pulmonary system and that is going to increase. If the clot is in the pulmonary artery, right, as you're entering the pulmonary circuit, now the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is going to go down. Um, and here, increase contractility, maybe get rid of the fluid to, um, you know, a lot of times it's going to cause edema. We want to get rid of that. Um, here, relieve the obstruction. You know, was it a pneumothorax? Is it pulmonary embolism? Do we need, you know, uh, thrombolytics? Uh, now, uh, honestly, all of these three above are very similar and you'd be, you do well by yourself to remember that. Distributive shock, whether it's sepsis, anaphylaxis, or CNS injury, um, the heart rate is going to go uh, down. Um, the, uh, and that, that's, we can probably best explain it by thinking about the central nervous system. Uh, you don't have the sympathetic response. So the catecholamines cannot increase the heart rate. Um, the, um, the massive vasodilation and redistribution of blood um, in, in ways that are inappropriate means that maybe more blood's going to your 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 skin and less to your brain and and, and heart and, and lungs and liver and so your skin's going to be your extremities are going to be warm. We don't necessarily want them to be warm, but they will be warm. Um, 
The pulmonary capillary wedge pressure uh, should be uh, down um, the cardiac output. Um, now, for the most part, I think if we consider this from a um, central nervous system perspective, the cardiac output should be down um, because we cannot induce uh, increased contractility and heart rate with catecholamines. You can with sepsis anaphylaxis, which is why the cardiac output might go up. Um, and then the systemic vascular resistance is going to go down. Remember, the main thing that unites all of these is there's a you know, vasodilation, vasodilation, and inhibition of vasoconstriction, which is really just a vasodilation. So one way to think about all of this is that um, these three are effects. The, we have not enough fluid, heart's not working, or a block, so we have low blood pressure. So vasoconstriction is an attempt to increase the blood pressure. Um, those are effects. Those are, those are secondary. The distributive shock, this is really what starts it, more or less. Um, for, we have a vasodilation, which decreases the systemic vascular response, and then everything else is going to be secondary to that, is, is maybe an appropriate way to think about it. Um, and uh, Terminator 2, who could forget Miles Dyson, uh, what type of shock is this? Hypovolemic shock. He's been shot, and uh, you can see the sympathetic nervous system is, is kicking in. Um, he's, he's clammy. He's probably cold. Uh, you know, his, his heart rate's probably kicking up. Um, and uh, so we have some peripheral um, uh, baroreceptors. So in the carotid, you have baroreceptors to sense the pressure. So this is for pressure regulation. And in the uh, aortic arch, we also have baroreceptors. And these can feed information back to the, uh, the central, service, central nervous system, which will inform what the vagus nerve does and what the sympathetic response is in terms of constriction, in terms of the heart rate, in terms of the contractility, etc. cetera. Um, so if our arterial pressure did go down, um, this would cause a decrease in baroreceptor firing in the aortic arch and in the carotids. Um, this would increase sympathetic response, decrease vagal response, which will have a net effect of increasing the cardiac output via increased uh, contractility. The phase four is going to increase for our pacemaker cells, and the um, contractility will increase for various mechanisms we'll talk about. It's also going to cause vasoconstriction to increase the systemic vascular resistance to try to get back to normal. Um, and negative feedback, I don't know whether it's positive, there should be negative, uh, is eventually going to sort of fix the system and then, you know, we'll, we'll stop uh, whatever these uh, shifts were. Um, and what happened if we have a carotid massage? So if you apply pressure uh, to the carotids, this will increase the pressure. This increases the stretch of the baroreceptors, which increases their firing rate. And this is going to cause a parasympathetic slowing of the heart. So upregulating parasympathetic and decreasing the sympathetic response. Um, so we can further fine-tune local blood flow by vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Um, and it's sort of like, almost like a buffer is a better way to think about a regulation. So if I have ridiculously low blood pressure, um, you know what, the, the mean arterial pressure in, I don't know, let's say my kidneys is just not going to be enough. Uh, it's maximally, maximally dilated. It's trying as hard as it can, but there's just not enough pressure. Um, and, I, and if I have too much blood pressure, um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's constricting as much as it can, but it, it's, it's still not going to be able to fix this. The idea, though, is to maintain like a constant amount of flow is that as I increase the mean arterial pressure here, um, by making this smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, I'm actually going to make sure that the overall flow is going to remain constant. So I might have said a pressure earlier and I misspoke. The blood flow will stay constant due to the alterations in constrict, uh, uh, of constriction and relaxation, dilation and narrowing of the blood vessels. And again, this only works as a little buffer zone here. At a certain point, the blood pressure is too low, and so the flow is going to be too low. At a certain point, the blood pressure is too high, and there's going to be too much flow. But again, we're regulating the diameter uh, in response to this changing pressure to keep the flow consistent. Um, so uh, a lot of molecules are going to help uh, uh, regulate and buffer the, the blood pressure. Um, so what, what causes this? How does it know how to do this? A lot of it is uh, CO2. Um, so you can imagine if we produce a lot of CO2 and then we notice that the CO2 is kind of like lingering around the tissues, it must be that we're not getting enough blood flow because the blood's supposed to come in and wash the CO2 away. So if I notice in a local level that my CO2 is high, I might choose as that organ to vasodilate to increase the amount of blood that's coming in. On the other hand, if I have a low O2, this one should be more obvious even, 
uh, amount of low amount of O2 is going to say, hey, I'm not getting enough oxygen. I probably could use more blood flow. So it's going to dilate the area so more blood comes in. And that's what we're seeing here is that a higher amount of CO2 would cause vasodilation and a lower amount of O2 would cause vasodilation, um, uh, the reverse for vasoconstriction. Um, arterial blood flow. And uh, um, so if we look at uh, the peripheral chemoreceptors, these are going to interact with oxygen and interact with CO2. So oxygen and CO2 for peripheral chemoreceptors. The uh, central nervous system chemoreceptors, which can measure CO2 in the cerebrospinal fluid, I just said it, will only do CO2. So they do not do oxygen in the central nervous system, um, mostly the medulla here. Um, and chemoreceptors that are encountering you know, uh, lots of receptors sort of go on strike. You know, if, uh, if you have too much sugar throughout your life and um, uh, there's too much insulin receptor, um, uh, too much insulin receptors being summoned, this is going to blunt the uh, response of the insulin receptors. Same thing here is that if you are chronically high CO2, the chemoreceptors are going to go, ah, this is, we're being overworked, we quit, we, they're going to go on strike. So the blunted response means that now actually um, you're going to be more uh, reliant on oxygen receptors and less reliant on carbon dioxide receptors. Um, recall, though, that CO2 through carbonic anhydrase uh, is converted to carbonic acid, which makes bicarbonate and H+. Also recall from Gen Chem 2, we have Le Chatelier's principle. If you increase the amount of CO2, you increase the amount of H+, which means you're decreasing your pH. So a lot of times these receptors, sometimes they interact with CO2, but I would say more often than not, they're going to just directly interact with the H+, which is effectively a proxy, an indirect measurement of what the CO2 is. So in our arterial blood, if we have large CO2, I'm going to have a large H+, which means I'm going to have a low pH. And the chemoreceptors can detect this, and they will um, assume that if I have a large CO2, it means that I'm not ventilating enough, and it will increase my ventilation rate until things get back to under normal, uh, in which case negative feedback will then stop uh, the initial stimuli uh, that, that changed the system. Um, and, uh, you know, the exact opposite in this scenario. Um, so long as we work the opposite of what we mentioned earlier. So earlier we said, look, if there's, um, if there's not enough oxygen in an area, we're going to vasodilate because we want more blood to flow in that region to bring oxygen in. Uh, here we're going to say that lungs work in the opposite manner. Um, if I don't have enough oxygen coming to this set of alveoli, it's a completely different scenario. It's, it's, it's the waste of your blood to go to that alveoli if it's not bringing in oxygen because it wants to pick up oxygen. So we're actually going to constrict this here and say, don't waste your time. There's not a lot of, it's not worth the squeeze. So we're not going to send a lot of blood to that, um, particularly alveoli, and we're going to increase blood flow to the other alveoli. So this is called hypoxic vasoconstriction, and it's very important, both for the pulmonary uh, unit, and also we'll see it time and time again in this uh, cardiovascular unit. Uh, natriuretic peptides, so, you know, hyponatremia is uh, hypo, not enough, natri uh, sodium and emia blood, so not enough sodium in the blood. Um, sodium uretic just means like diuretic, uh, peeing a lot effectively. Um, so these are helping us pee out sodium. Um, this is the opposite effect of what we saw with the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Mainly aldosterone helps us retain sodium in the distal convoluted tubule, which means we're going to increase the amount of uh, blood volume, which means we increase the blood pressure. Um, so this is doing the opposite. It is decreasing the sodium reabsorption. Um, therefore, we get less water and less pressure. It's also just going to counteract directly the, the vasodilation. Um, uh, this is going to cause vasodilation, which counters the vasoconstriction that angiotensin 2 induces. Uh, a and P comes from the atria. Uh, B and P, B is for brain, but that's just where it was discovered. It's really from the ventricles. So A and P is from the atria. B and P is from the uh, ventricles. Um, B and P has a longer half-life, and it's uh, part of the diagnostic workup for heart failure. Let's talk action potentials. A um, couple different types of action potentials. Uh, cardiac myocytes, pacemakers, also known as nodal cells. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the effects of sympathetic versus parasympathetic control of heart rhythm and contractility. Also, uh, effects of hyper and hypokalemia. Um, electrical current is generated in these pacemaker, also known as nodal cells. Most importantly, it'll originate, or hopefully from the SA node, um, waves will look like this, and then it'll transmit from one cardiac myocyte to the next cardiac myocyte. Their action potentials look like this. 
These are the ones that are actually contracting. These are simply originating the current. Um, just another fun picture. Uh, notice that the, um, the ions are moving through these gap junctions where calcium and sodium can travel through. Uh, it's kind of like the equivalent of the nodes of Ranvier, uh, where sodium can, can leak through to initiate the next action potential of the adjacent node. Here we're initiating the next action potential <clears throat> of the adjacent cardiac myocyte. Um, mostly phase zero, uh, just sodium and, and a little bit of calcium that's leaking through these, uh, causing, uh, you know, passing the signal on, but also causing sarcomeric contraction. Um, so it's really just, again, hitting this point home, just one domino knocking over another as the signal is passed from one cell to the next. Um, uh, so we start off in the SA node, you go to the AV node where there's a delay. This also plays defense. We will talk about that. This then goes through the bundle of Hiss. There's a left bundle branch and a right bundle branch. The right bundle goes to the right ventricle. The left bundle goes to the left ventricle. Probably for most of these, we'll just think about it in terms of the left ventricle. Also keep in mind that the left ventricle is going to be much more important for uh, arrhythmias and also pairing things up with anti-arrhythmic uh, medications and ECGs. Uh, just because it, it, it's the, the dominant and much larger uh, of the, the ventricles. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of similarities to neuronal action potentials, but um, one, you can just see how different these look. That's one millisecond. Um, and in uh, skeletal muscle, it might be two to five milliseconds. It lasts a little bit longer. Cardiac muscles is very long, especially because of this uh, plateau phase, phase two, and this slow repolarization phase three. Um, flow of ions is also uh, going to be different, as, as we'll see in a second, not just, and of course, I guess the flow of ions is what makes the graph look different. Um, so on top of this, uh, we also have, you know, probably 10 different types of uh, action potentials, three main ones. Um, we can think of the pacemaker cells in the SA node and the AV node. Um, SA node has a faster rate and is therefore dominant over the AV node. Um, so in other words, every time the AV node or the SA node fires, um, you know, if it fires twice as quickly, um, as it fires, maybe if it's twice as quickly, the AV node will be halfway through its depolarization, its initiation, but it gets reset by the SA node's previous firing that hits it. Um, that's what we mean when we say the SA node is dominant. We'll see an example of that later. Uh, we also have the cardiac myocytes, the atria and the, ventricle, uh, the ventricles. Um, notice that these have the flat and then these are, this is also considered flat. It's, it's a little bit weaker. That's why it looks uh, different. Um, also, when we're looking at ECG, just I'm going to say this again and again, the ECG is only pairing up with uh, cardiac myocytes. It doesn't actually pick up anything from the pacemaker cells. It's just not a strong enough of a, uh, an, an electrical signal. Um, and then lastly, Purkinje fibers. So Purkinje fibers are kind of like cardiac myocytes. Uh, they're in the ventricles, but you know what? They also have this, um, uh, they also have this, uh, the, the phase four here is drawn like this. The reason I corrected it is it should be like this. This down slanting phase four is very important. It's really what gives pacemaker cells their distinct flavor is this, uh, this automatic inbuilt uh, rhythm. Um, so the Purkinje fibers have a little bit qualities of both of them, uh, and then the, their, their rate's going to be really small. So SA node is going to be dominant over AV, which is dominant over Purkinje. Um, so in the MCAT and PREMAT, we're used to salty banana, sodium on the outside, potassium on the inside. Um, and now we're bringing calcium into the picture too. So um, we can think of this as like <laughs> salty, milky banana, right? Salt on the outside and uh, banana on the inside, but now it's uh, salt and calcium and banana potassium on the inside. Um, same for a nodal cell as well. Um, so the ion gradients different, but they are uh, similar, but there, there's a lot of differences between the action potentials that we'll get into. Um, this is probably more detail than you would ever want, but I, I really think not only can they get pretty meticulous, uh, and, and, and um, and, and detail oriented for the NBMEs, but it also, understanding this is really going to set the groundwork for understanding arrhythmias, understanding ECG, ECGs, EKGs, and um, anti-arrhythmic medication. So, you know, if you want to just brute force memorize everything, go, you know, by all means, but I think this will just make it easier down the road. So if you have like a firm understanding of the uh, physiological principles. So for a normal neuron, 
uh, slight uh, impulse, um, you know, baroreceptors are stretched or whatever, or a little bit of sodium, you know, rushes in, not enough to get it to the negative 55, nothing happens. Um, here we're starting at negative 70, enough of a uh, stimulus causes us to go to negative 55, voltage gated sodium channels open all the way to positive 40, those close, voltage gated potassium channels open, repolarizes, hyperpolarizes, which is why we have a little bit of a refractory period, and it um, goes back to the resting membrane potential. Uh, the membrane potential is set by the potassium gradient, which is leaky, and um, the uh, sodium potassium ATPase pump. So that's neuron. All of that is just, that should be a uh, refresher. Um, and I'm, I'm mainly just illustrating that to, so you can understand better how the uh, pacemaker and cardiac myocyte action potentials are generated. So um, starting at negative 70 or so, um, it's going to automatically creep upwards, right? Here we needed some big stimulus. Here it just automatically, it's just, it's just built into the system that it slowly lets in a little bit of sodium. Um, some people say these are sodium potassium channels, but for, from what I've seen in the research I've done, it's mostly just sodium. So these are called funny channels. Uh, it's called phase zero. These are funny channels. Excuse me, phase four, funny channels. Sodium's coming in and it's slowly depolarizing it, right? I mean, if a cell is um, uh, zero over here and negative 70 over here, then a sodium coming in should uh, make it, you know, go from negative 70 to negative 60. And that's exactly what we're seeing. This is happening during diastole and this is depolarizing it. So this is called DD diastolic depolarization. At about negative 50, calcium channels open. What kind? T calcium channels. I think T for timely because they arrive, I don't know, on time. Um, a little bit later, negative 40. Um, so that the calcium coming in is gonna, you know, even it's gonna exacerbate the, uh, the depolarization negative 40, I think L for late, but really it's L for long because they are open for a lot longer. The, the T channel shut, the L1 stays open, and that is responsible for the phase zero. This jumps all the way up to, I don't know, positive 20, voltage-gated potassium channels open, L channels close, and it now repolarizes. It's very analogous to what we see with the neuron. Um, and then it goes here, and then it just automatically creeps up again. So it is this right here that is responsible for setting the heart rate. Um, you know, for the most part, if, if this happens once every second, then you could imagine that we our heart beats once every uh, second. Um, obviously, this takes a little bit of time, but I would say this is the main factor for heart rate. Um, all right, so then we're going to go ahead and look at cardiac myocytes. So this was the, previously was a nodal cell uh, pacemaker SA node. Now we're looking at a cardiac myocyte. So starting at negative 90, um, unless it's a Purkinje, this should be a flat line. So we're not having the up slope. Um, and the like or initial neuron or action potential uh, phase called phase zero, so phase four flat, phase zero is really what's kicking everything off, is voltage-gated uh, sodium channel. So voltage-gated sodium channels are opening, uh, or it depolarizes, I guess, a little bit to negative you know, 70 from negative 90. Then the voltage-gated sodium channels open, bumps it all the way up. Now voltage-gated potassium channels open, brings it down a little bit, those close, and now we have this this inward, outward, inward, outward fight of calcium and potassium. Slow, delayed rectifier potassium channels open, which want to uh, exodus, and uh, L calcium channels are open. The same L calcium channels that we saw in the pacemaker cells. Pacemaker cells are really the only ones that utilize the T channels. So the calcium out, potassium, uh, excuse me, the calcium in, potassium out that we have for phase two causes this plateau. And this is associated with the QT interval and, and uh, ventricular contraction. And then as the L channels close, um, the fast delayed rectifier channels open. And, and with you know the, flat, the fast ones on top of the fact that there's less calcium coming in through the L channels, we're gonna have a uh, vigorous repolarization uh, bringing us down to the resting potential. Um, during this, this is where all of the calcium induced, calcium released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum with the uh, ryanidine receptors and uh, the, um, the binding to troponin and the tropomyosin is all occurring. Um, and uh, note that towards the end of this, circa sucks the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which we've talked about before. Um, all right, so that's a lot of information. I do think it's important, but you know, more important is just to get the basic gist. Phase four of the pacemaker is diastolic depolarization. Phase zero, calcium runs in through L-gated channels, also known as dihydropyridine channels. Um, phase three, potassium leaves 
and uh, that is the uh, nodal cells, the cardiac action potentials. Phase zero is sodium in. There is a balanced calcium um, uh, trying to run into the cell, uh, potassium trying to run out of the cell, and uh, eventually the calcium channels close and the uh, other uh, you know, fast delayed rectifier calcium or potassium channels open, which causes even more potassium to leave, not countered by calcium anymore, and that repolarizes everything. The resting potential again is set by the leaky potassium channels uh, in addition to the sodium potassium pump. Um, so if that's still too long, you can recognize the differences. This is flat and there is no flat portion here. The flat portion is associated with the contraction, which lasts for uh, quite a while. Um, so the impulse is passed to the next cell, you know, really after this point. Um, so it's being passed to the next cell and this first cell, yes, it's passed the signal, you know, electricity first, contraction second. The electricity is passed really quickly, but the contraction actually takes a while. Um, so the plateau corresponds with myocyte contraction, dihydropyridine, L-type calcium channels. These are going to do uh, calcium-induced calcium release uh, with ryanidine receptors, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Eventually, circa is going to try to, uh, you know, after we've had our contraction, right, the calcium uh, binds to troponin, shifts tropomyosin, myosin binds to actin, sarcomere contracts, et cetera. And the calcium needs to be recycled and needs to be put back into the calcium, uh, excuse me, back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum if we want to initiate another muscular contraction. Um, and we want a nice full contraction. We need a lot of calcium in so we can have a big calcium release. So circa is really necessary for the relaxation and the relaxation is necessary for a big next uh, contraction, a large subsequent following stroke volume. Um, we have some protein called phospholambin, which is inhibiting circa, which means we'll have less contractility and less relaxation. Um, Beta adrenergic receptors via PKA can phosphorylate the phospholambam, inhibiting it or inhibiting the inhibitor, which means the circuit can work. So beta adrenergic receptors, in addition to stimulating this, in addition to stimulating this and getting us better contractility, also uh, are going to stimulate the circa by inhibiting phospholambin, which is further stimulating contractility and stimulating uh, lucertropy relaxation, which is also necessary for a maximum contraction. Um, and this is just, uh, you know, old news. We know about sarcomeres contracting. We know about calcium binding troponin. Um, and this is just a nice pretty picture of the beta-1 agonist, um, the epinephrine, the norepinephrine um, binding to that receptor. You know, uh, it's a G protein coupled receptor. We get a G alpha, we get a denylate cyclase, we get CAMP, that gets PKA. PKA phosphorylates the phospholamban so that circuit can do its job and uh, push calcium against its gradient into the sarcoplasmic reticulum to sequester it for the next contraction so we can get a full contraction after uh, our, our first contraction. Um, how does this relate to an ECG? Um, the, the, I know it looks complicated, but at the end of the day, that is the direction of the current. This is lead two. And um, we said that this is the atrial contraction, this is the ventricular contraction, and then the actual, uh, and when I say contraction, I, what I really mean is the uh, electrical signal. The actual contraction is technically happening here, right? The actual contraction of the atria is actually happening right after. Um, and and the, the ventricular contraction is going to take a lot longer. And then this is the repolarization. So I know that some of the, let's just look at the P wave. Some of it's probably going that way. Some of it's going that way. Some of it's going that way. What we're doing is we're integrating the signal from the cardiac myocytes. And if it's going towards the lead two, we call that a positive deflection. And um, we are not, again, concerned with nodal pacemaker cells. They do not show up. Um, like this is the AV node, right? It's all completely flat. This is muscle, this is muscle, and this is the repolarization of muscle. Um, and so, yeah, if we put it all together, um, you notice this is our pacemaker cell, uh, the SA node, this is yellow. And what do you know? Yellow is flat. What do you know for green? Atrial muscle, boom, we got an upward deflection. Um, what do you notice for the ventricular muscle? Boom, you get an upward deflection and another upward deflection for the repolarization. Um, and uh, trying to think what else about this. Um, yeah, the ventricular muscle is really just the, uh, you know, epicardium, endocardium, and, and mainly the myocardium is where most of the muscle, most of the oomph is generated. Um, and as we said before, here's our electrical contraction, but the actual phase two and contraction is probably going to happen somewhere in this region over there. Um, we have this refractory period here. 
uh, where the cardiac myocyte cannot fire again. This is just to make sure that um, it's to prevent reentry circuits, it's to make sure that everything is contracting, you know, kind of they're moving the electrical impulse along in a nice single file line. So we have a coordinated muscular contraction. What happens if we don't have this? You get something like atrial fibrillation, ventricular fibrillation, where there's a quivering of the muscles. They're all firing at, at different rates and, and kind of ignoring the domino effect. And if everyone's not coordinated, you don't adequately push the blood from the atria to the ventricles or from the ventricles to the um, to the aorta or the, the pulmonary circuit, which has obviously catastrophic consequences. Um, so how can we change the pacemaker cells in the cardiac myocytes? Um, sympathetic nervous system and the uh, parasympathetic nervous system uh, can affect the pacemaker cells. Um, those same things can also affect the cardiac myocytes. Uh, hyperkalemia and hypokalemia changes to calcium can affect the nodal pacemaker cells, and they can also affect the cardiac myocytes, which we'll talk about right now. Sympathetic nervous system, you know what? This does a lot. It affects the calcium. It changes the, the resting potential. Let's just focus mostly on phase four. So sympathetic nervous system increases the rate of phase four. And if I increase the rate, we said that this is really what determines the heart rate. That's a quicker heart rate. This is a normal heart rate. And then this is a slower heart rate, which is the vagus parasympathetic nerve. Um, that's really it at the end of the day. Um, sympathetic nervous system, we said, stimulates dihydropyridine receptors, which are really just L-gate calcium receptors. Um, more calcium in the cytosol really just means that the contractility is up. Um, they, they can also stimulate the ryanidine receptors. And we said that through PKA, they're going to phosphorylate phospholamban. Um, this means that circa is now uninhibited, so it can absorb more calcium, uh, sequester it, increasing the contractility for the next uh, contraction. Um, Hyperkalemia, so this is really important. This will come into uh, arrhythmias, into the ECG, into the antiarrhythmic drug. So I think it's, it's really complicated. It's really important to have a sound understanding of this. So hyperkalemia is when we have more potassium on the outside of, uh, or let's say in the, in the plasma, at least in the blood. So normally this is the picture. We have zero, we have negative 70. And it might seem like if I put a bunch of uh, potassium here on the outside, it might seem like, okay, now it's going to go from negative 70 to an even larger differential. Now it's going to be something like negative 70 to negative 90. And it turns out it's the opposite effect that you would think about, which we'll talk about briefly. Um, so hyperkalemia depolarizes the cell. So it's going to bring it from, so this is normally where it sits, and now it's going to sit right here. Um, and it might seem like... Um, so there's a, yeah, this is because there's a decreased incentive for potassium to leave, which we'll talk about. Note that hypoxia and ischemia also produce the same effect. Um, if you don't have ATP, you can't fuel the potassium gradient, so you can't put the potassium on the outside. But nevertheless, um, we'll get more into this. Both of these are going to have the same effect by pushing us from here to here, depolarizing it. Um, that might seem like a good thing. It might seem like it more easily fires um, and we have a faster rate, but it, it actually turns out that if you depolarize, it's harder to open up our sodium channels, which means that we're less likely to initiate uh, a subsequent uh, contraction. Um, we'll, we'll get into the details of that a little bit. It, it's crazy confusing, uh, very important. Um, and the polarization, so going down here is actually going to be better to uh, sufficiently activate the funny channels. And uh, so the sodium channels of the uh, pacemaker cells and also the sodium channels of the ventricular myocytes. So long story short, hyperkalemia will cause bradycardia. Um, now note that these effects are particularly salient for Purkinje cells. And um, so this can cause lots of arr uh, arrhythmia, specifically uh, ventricular tachycardias, which we'll get to. Hypokalemia, all the opposite effects. This hyperpolarizes the cell. Again, this is paradoxical. We'll talk about this um, and, uh, this is going to increase the phase four, uh, slope, which is going to cause tachycardia. Um, now a cure for high, uh, hyperkalemia is one, just insulin. If you have insulin, insulin, you'll talk about this in the renal unit, pushes potassium into the cell. So too much potassium outside the cells. Well, good. Just get, get some insulin. It'll push them in. Uh, another cure is actually calcium. So, what does calcium do? Calcium does a couple different things. Um, one, it contributes a little bit to the depolarization of our pacemaker cells um, through the calcium channels. Uh, 
Um, two is it can stimulate the sodium channels directly by binding to calmodulin and stim- stimulating the, so- uh, the calcium channels. Probably most importantly is it somehow raises, so high potassium might raise our uh, resting potential from here to here. High calcium, on the other hand, raises the, um, excuse me, it raises this, raises the uh, threshold potential from here to here. So if I need to get from here to here to have a firing, you know, that's a certain amount of distance. Um, getting from here to here, by, by we've raised the resting potential. So if we raise the threshold potential, the actual difference between those might be the same. That is one way that calcium helps. Sometimes people say this stabilizes the membrane potential, but that's really what they mean is it raises the threshold potential so that, you know, if it was, I don't know, negative 80 to negative 60, when well, now it's negative um, 70 to negative 50, something like that. Um, and yeah, okay, so let, let's talk a little bit about exactly how this is happening with the, um, the potassium. Um, is this is maybe our normal state of affairs for a cell. We have more, you know, salty, milky banana. I have more sodium and calcium on the outside of the cell, more potassium on the inside of the cell. And at the end of the day, I made up these values. This is negative 10. And um, actually, I suppose we should say that this is zero and this is negative 10. So that's zero and that's negative 10. Um, now we have hyperkalemia. So this initially Initially, like the second I eat like 8,000 bananas, I now have very high potassium levels in my blood. Um, this is going to cause it to go um, to, to now technically be uh, hyperpolarized, right? And this seems, this is what we might think. It's like, yeah, if you have more potassium, this should cause a hyperpolarization. So what is Will talking about when we say that it is a, um, it's depolarized? Well, this is just initially. Um, notice as well that, um, Initially, potassium is balanced. There's a concentration gradient trying to push it out, which is countered with the electrical gradient pushing it in. Why does it want to go uh, out? Because there's a lot of cal- uh, potassium inside the cell and not a lot of potassium outside of the cell. Why does the electrical gradient want to push it in? Well, because it's uh, particularly positive outside the cell, zero, and it's particularly negative, negative 10 inside the cell. Something like calcium, it's going down both its electric and uh, concentration gradient. Same with sodium. So potassium is a little bit more... Um, confused here. Now, if we initially uh, put hyperkalemia into the equation, now what we've done is there's maybe an equal amount of, there's six potassiums on the outside and six on the inside. So there's not actually any concentration gradient anymore. I only have an electrical gradient, in fact, a stronger electrical gradient than we previously had. So this is going to cause a bunch of the potassiums to run into the cell and now that the, a lot of the potassiums have run into the cell, it changes up our math a little bit so that now the difference is negative nine. It's, it's negative nine and zero. And this is, at the end of the day, lowering the, um, so hyperkalemia at the end of the day, after everything is equilibrated and whatnot, this is actually going to depolarize, not hyperpolarize it. Another way of putting this is that, um, Potassium is what sets the membrane potential. And if I have a lot more potassium on the outside of the cell, then the potassium does not want to leave. Um, so effectively, uh, the electric potential potassium might be negative 100 normally, but now it's going down. Or actually, I guess it's negative 84, but now it's going down from negative 84 to um, maybe like negative 74. So uh, having potassium on the outside decreases the electric potential, the desire of potassium to leave, and therefore the membrane potential becomes uh, more depolarized. And a depolarized membrane potential means that the uh, voltage-gated sodium channels, both for the pacemaker cells and for the cardiac myocytes, are slightly disabled. They're still active, but they are less active, which contributes to less contractility and um, less uh, a slower um, a slower heart rate as well. Um, and I suppose the last thing to talk about this is that, so here we have our, our hyperkalemia, and this is actually a pretty good picture. So maybe it, maybe normally the membrane is around here. So if you hyperpolarize uh, the cell, which would happen with hypokalemia, hypokalemia, um, hypokalemia is going to cause it to hyperpolarize, which means the 
this is specifically referring to the VMAX for the sodium channels. So hyperpolarizing it causes these channels to be more open, which is going to cause a more intense phase zero climb and a faster action potential um, and a faster rate. On the other hand, if you um, uh, depolarize it, which we said would happen in hyperkalemia, so hyperkalemia, so hypo is going to go here, hyperkalemia is going to lower the membrane potential. So this would be hyper. So lo lower in the sense of the absolute value. So it's going to become more depolarized. Now we can see that the Vmax is lower, which just means the sodium channels aren't working. This is what you're going to get. This is a classic hyperkalemia. Normally we shoot up very intensely. We're shooting up a lot more weakly now. Um, another important thing is that the... Um, Actually, maybe before we even get to that. So it is, um, if I therefore have hyperkalemia, um, it means that it, it's going to be more difficult to initiate an action potential, um, not just in the cardiac muscle, but also in the skeletal muscle. And one way you can think about this is that there will be paralysis and weakness uh, because we have a harder time initiating um, an action potential because the sodium channels are not properly activated. Again, they have to reach a very negative potential to be activated, and that's just not occurring here. Another thing to note is that, again, kind of ironically, paradoxically, um, uh, potassium um, is going to leave the cell more intensely, which doesn't, to me, make a to whole lot of sense um, because the main reason that potassium didn't want to leave the cell is because we had this large electrical gradient, um, negative 10. And I would think that now that it's at negative nine, it, it, you know, it, that that's gonna be smaller, has more incentive to leave, but it's just not the case for whatever reason. So um, we're gonna see a sharper uh, repolarization phase three in hyperkalemia and a lower one here. So uh, I know that this was a lot and I probably could have articulated better. Um, big takeaway is that hyperkalemia causes slower phase zero and uh, a more intense phase three. Um, at the end of the day, this means that there is a shorter refractory period here um, and hypokalemia would be the exact opposite. So we'll talk more about this in uh, the arrhythmia ECGs and the, um, the antiarrhythmic drug section. Let's talk about arrhythmias. Um, we're going to just talk about like a general breakdown of action potentials, um, how the conduction system moves through the heart, get into um, different supraventricular tachycardias, um, uh, ventricular tachycardias, uh, et, et cetera. Uh, and especially a big thing is reentry circuits and just how they work. Um, so tachycardia versus bradycardia, tachy too, too fast, brady too slow. Um, specifically less than 60 beats or more than 100 beats. Um, so if you have a fast rhythm or a slow rhythm, that's not necessarily bad, right? This could be a normal sinus rhythm. Sinus just means that it's um, uh, systematic, it's regular. Um, you know, if you're going on a run, you're going to have sinus tachycardia. If you're sleeping, you're going to have sinus bradycardia. Um, if you're an athlete, you just in general walking around have a lower resting heart rate. So that will also be a sinus bradycardia. But it could be irregular, and that's typically what we're worried about. So signs of extreme tachycardia and extreme bradycardia, again, we're going to mostly be concerning ourselves with irregular um, arrhythmias here. Um, so you're going to decrease your cardiac output. Uh, now, if you have bradycardia, well, you're not, you know, Cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. If your heart rate's too slow, then you're going to have a low cardiac output. If it's too fast, we said, well, if it's so fast, you might actually have a problem filling during diastole, so you also have a low stroke volume. Um, you might have an abnormal pulse, uh, particularly slow, or a racing heartbeat if it's a tachycardia. Uh, syncope, uh, which is fainting and dizziness because there's not enough oxygen getting in your brain. General fatigue because there's... Uh, not have oxygen getting anywhere in your body, chest pain, which is due to coronary ischemia, and then cardiac arrest, um, also known as sudden cardiac death, uh, which is where you die within one hour of the onset of symptoms. Things like VFib, VTAC, or asystole that might develop. Um, 
reasons this might happen. So if it's sinus, it's just going to be the catecholamines or the vagus nerve, the sympathetic or the parasympathetic. Um, now for the irregular tachycardias and bradycardias, the pathological arrhythmias, which we're concerned with, um, could be that an MI or ischemia or coronary heart disease generates scar tissue somewhere. And this increases the likelihood of reentry circuits, which is an island of non-conduction uh, and the center of conducting tissue, which we'll, we'll see. Hypoxia. So we mentioned earlier, hypoxia leads to cell depolarization. Um, and this is because you can't fuel the sodium potassium pump, which pumps uh, uh, potassium in and, and, and sodium out and helps maintain this gradient. Um, and if you're not fully depolarized, um, excuse me, if you're not uh, fully hyperpolarized uh, after um, uh, an action potential, this doesn't fully activate the sodium channel. So you have a slower conduction velocity um, uh, and, and a slower funny current um, for the pacemaker cells and the myocytes, uh, respectively. Um, and uh, hyperkalemia causes the exact same effects. Again, it causes a depolarization, which causes all of the same stuff, in addition to the fact that we might have a shorter... Uh, uh, a more intense drop in our phase three, which leads to a shorter refractory period. Remember that Purkinje fibers are particularly vulnerable to changes in electrolyte concentrations in particular drugs. So this will help us uh, explain how we can develop ventricular tachycardias. Hypokalemia has the opposite effect, hyperpolarization. Um, it's a faster phase four. Uh, the diagnost uh, uh, um, diastolic depolarization, which leads to tachycardia. Um, antiarrhythmic drugs can also lead to irregular tachycardias and bradycardias. So note that for all of this to occur for the most part, it's really just changes in conduction velocity, repolarization, um, diastolic depolarization, uh, that, and, and the generation of these scar tissue non-conducting islands that mostly lead to arrhythmias through reentry circuits. Um, and again, here we have a good picture of what hyperkalemia looks like. Notice that it has this lower resting potential for our cardiac myocyte at a, a slower uh, phase zero. The sodium uh, uh, pumps are, are, the sodium channels are not as activated as they should be. The slower conduction velocity means that uh, it's going to take longer to pass the message from one cell to the next cell. And when you've got billions of cells to get through, uh, this means that it's going to take, you know, a couple extra, um, you know, uh, fractions of a second uh, to conduct a, a full uh, heartbeat. Um, in addition, we have a shorter refractory period and a much more intense drop in our uh, phase three repolarization. Um, so bradycardia, we mentioned, this is just the vagus nerve. Um, you know, maybe you're sleeping, maybe you're an athlete and you're resting. Um, and again, this is just decreasing our phase four slope. Uh, a conduction block is... Um, you could have a conduction at the SA node, you could have it at the AV node, you could have it at the bundle of Hiss. Uh, these are typically caused by beta blockers, whether it's type 2 or calcium blockers, which are type 4, or just ischemic damage due uh, to the, the AV or the, the bundle of Hiss. Um, this can also just slow conduction uh, moving from the atria to the ventricles. Um, less concerned with bradycardia, more concerned with tachycardia. Um, a couple different ways this can develop. Abnormal automaticity. For the most part, this is caused by catecholamines, which we mentioned can speed up um, uh, the, the phase uh, for diastolic depolarization. Um, triggered activity is new. So this is where uh, an especially long phase two or phase three, a long QT period, can actually somehow, there's like an issue with the ion channels, it can initiate an, another action potential, sort of in the middle of an action potential. If, it, if it's towards the end of phase two or phase three, it's early after depolarization. Um, and if it's right after, it's delayed after depolarization. So uh, triggered activity. As I mentioned before, though, the main way is just reentry circuits. Now you can have these on a global level where it goes from the atria to the ventricles and then back to the atria. Or you can have it on a local level as we will see in the node, um, uh, the AV node. Uh, we'll talk about both of these in, in more detail. Um, and uh, so just a reminder that the, the we start at the SA node, we go to the AV, we go to the bundle of Hiss, and then we go through the Purkinje's. This is not a full loop. Um, we have all of these reentry circuits, which are loops. Um, and to, to understand them, we have to remember that action potentials can typically go both ways. So we're so used to the MCAT and pre-med <clears throat> where you initiate an action potential at the axon hillock, and it just slowly moves in this particular direction 
I guess technically it moves where we have the nodes of Ranvier and the sodium comes in and diffuses over and then another action potential. So we typically just see the action potential generate, uh, you know, be carried in, in one particular direction. But if you had a nerve and you just electrically, artificially, externally stimulated right here um, and there was no action potential, you would technically get an action potential that moves in both directions. So again, this isn't a normal physiological state, but you could artificially induce an action potential to move in both directions. The only reason it doesn't normally do this is that we have repolarization, which is part of the hyperpolarization. We have a refractory period, so it won't go in both directions. So it just moves in one direction. Um, so long story short, uh, things can go in both directions. They don't normally, but if they do, it leads to a pathology. So how can in a cardiac myocyte or a nodal cell... Uh, how can we have things moving in both directions? So I mentioned earlier that you could have an MI or ischemia, which could lead to this um, non-conducting scar tissue over here. There's other ways that you might have these non-conducting uh, regions, but this is the main one that I'm aware of. Um, and so we might have an action pot potential moving down here, and some of it goes this way, and some of it goes this way, and some of them go this way, some of them go this way. And when they do, they're going to collide and cancel. And then some of them will go that way, some of them will go that way, and this is probably leading to the ventricles. It's probably coming from the atria. Um, and a reentry circuit is somehow this gets into this eternal loop where it just continually goes around and around and around and around. Um, uh, this is just a nice picture showing that the island of non-conducting uh, in the center is often due to a heart attack. Um, and it can lead to a, uh, a reentrant loop. Um, very important for this is, uh, you guys are probably so sick of me saying this, but I'm going to say it again. Um, hyperkalemia and hypoxia will lead to... Um, slower phase zero uh, and larger phase uh, three slopes. Um, this leads to a shorter refractory period. Um, on the other hand, if something has a fast phase zero, this would be like a wild type, um, it's gonna have a slower, a slower, longer refractory period. So fast conduction leads to long refractory period and slow conduction leads to short refractory period. Um, and so let's imagine that all of these are cardiac myocytes, and again, fast uh, with long refractory and, and short with uh, short refractory with, with slow. And let's see how this moves. Boom. Notice that one goes really quick. And this is all in refractory, 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 refractory. Done. Let's watch that again. You'll notice that the fast one uh, stays in refractory longer than the slow one. Refractory, 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 refractory out of refractory, still in refractory, still in refractory, still in refractory, now it's out. Um, so that is very important. And again, that all has to do with this. Um, and again, what you think about hypoxia, hypoxia would be induced during an MI or something like that. So it's so a nice little connection there. Um, so a normal thing, we have this infarcted tissue. I have an impulse coming down. Some of it goes this way. Some of it goes this way. Let's say that the blue one is slow with a fast refractory period. Um, the fast one is going to get through first and then it's going to loop around and then it's going to cancel on this. This is, again, the normal state of affairs. So that's great. I just have one signal in and I have one signal out. Hurrah. And this is going to the ventricles and going to cause them to contract in a nice coordinated fashion. But what if, um, you know, quickly, you know, maybe like one second after. Um, so I guess if we have these impulses every second, then this would be a, a heart rate of 60 beats per, per minute. Um, so if, if, if shortly thereafter, um, I have another action potential come down the road, maybe remember that the red is a slow refractory period. So maybe it tries to go in this direction, but it can't because the red area is in refractory. So instead, it just goes the only way it can, which is the blue. Why is the blue not in a refractory? Because the, the blue is a very fast refractory recovery. Um, and so then it's, it's moving along, moving along, moving along. And then we can continue the picture here. It's moving along. And you know what? Now blue wins. Blue is now going to win it out. When the day moves down, it activates the ventricles. But as it has moved down, the, the red has just ended its refractory period. So it can now actually, and it, it's unfortunate that my color is, is, is red. So ignore that. This is just pretend this is blue. It now can just continue in a little circle as we see in this picture over here. And uh, now it's just going to, it's in this eternal loop, which it will never exit. And it will send some signals this way and some signals this way. I mean, again, this will just... Uh, initiate a ventricular contraction. And this, every second when the newer action potential comes in, 
it will it will crash into it and it'll stop it. It'll reset everything. And this is actually pretty fast that things can move around the loop. So we said it was one second, which is 60 beats per minute. Now imagine that these you can go around this circle once every quarter of a second, every 0.25 seconds, which means we have 240 beats per minute. This is this is a re-entry circuit. This is how we get um, atrial tachycardia and ventricular tachycardia. Um, so these things can be local on a small scale, like whether in the atria or the ventricles, or they can be global, which is where we're going to go from the atria to the ventricles. So we're going, woo, we're going all the way around. Now, how, do, how does this happen? Um, the main way, the only way that I think you'll really encounter is something called the bundle of Kent, which is sometimes called an accessory pathway. And this is, so bundle of Kent is the accessory pathway and the disease, the pathology where this is the issue is Wolf Parkinson White. So those three things are together. Bundle of Kent, Wolf Parkinson White, and accessory pathway. Um, so rather than the, the SA node uh, traveling straight to the AV node, some of it goes through this alternative route. And remember that the AV node is particularly slow, so it's likely to gonna get to the ventricles more quickly. And it might, it might also go through the AV node, but it's just quicker through the bundle of Kent, and it's going to excite the ventricles a little bit prematurely. Um, and, and we'll talk more about this later, that there's a lot going on with that, but that's just the idea of a local versus global. So, um, you know, here's our heart. Uh, here is our atrias, and here are our ventricles. Um, if you have a tachycardia which originates uh, from above this line in the atria, that is a supraventricular tachycardia. If it's below this, it is a ventricular tachycardia. Um, we're typically going to have a normal or narrow, I mean, let's just think of it as normal QRS complex, and the SA node is, for the most part, still there. So even if I have a really large, uh, like typically when things start in the atria, the, the S, um, and this is the SA node, this should say the AV node. The AV node is there to um, try to prevent and delay um, signals that are coming to it too quickly from the atria to being passed on to the ventricles. And we'll see how this works, when this fails, et cetera. Uh, the, the types of superventricular tachycardia is atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, and avian RT, which is atrioventricular nodal um, reentry tachycardia. Uh, we then have the ventricular tachycardias where there is no AV, no defense. Again, SA is where they originate, AV node is where there's the delay. Um, and uh, widen QRS complexes, this could lead to V-fib. V-fib and V-tac, both are the major forms of uh, cardiac arrest, also known as sudden cardiac death. Um, so supra, above, ventricular, ventricles, tachycardia, fast heart rate. Um, if something's paroxysmal, it just means that it's every now and then, it's not like constant, and usually this just means it's in an earlier form. It might progress to a chronic, long-lasting, permanent um, tachycardia. Um, so again, these are our four types. Uh, far and away, the most common is the AVNRT, and then the um, Wolf Parkinson White AVRT, AVRT versus AVNRT, are the um, uh, is the next common, and then atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation are uh, a little bit less common, um, and and they they might still be common in in terrible pathology, but in terms of the tachycardia, it might be a little bit less common than the. Uh, the RTs, the uh, reentry tachycardias. So atrial fibrillation is when um, this is what we want to happen. We want things to you know go at the SA node and then move nicely through uh, the AV node and then move down here in a coordinated fashion. Just looks beautiful. And this one is just chaos. We just have all signals and some completely quivering, um, non-synchronized manner. And if it's non-synchronized, that means I'm going to have cardiac myocytes contracting at different times and not in a coordinated fashion. And this leads to um, irregularly regular heartbeats. But uh, most importantly, this means that I don't have a P wave. I don't have an atrial kick. Um, so an ectopic foci is just some pacemaker cell which initiates the impulse more quickly than the SA node. Randomly, this is often the pulmonary veins. The cells there can initiate their own uh, diastolic depolarization current. Um, Reentry circuits can also sort of serve as, um, you know, the, the focal point, uh, the thing originating. I suppose, I suppose they're more just maintaining a um, uh, an action potential and just passing around in this forever eternal loop. But ectopic foci, reentry circuits, and both of them are going to be caused by uh, just the weathering of time, coronary uh, artery disease, alcohol, especially which is called holiday heart syndrome things like cocaine, antiarrhythmics, et cetera, 
Um, notice we have these nice little P waves, that is the atrio contracting together as a unit. And then I have these fibrillations, which are just random chaos. And notice we get this just silly little thing, which is just this non-coordinated. Because everything's for everything to contract at the same time, we get a nice, um, clean electrical signal. The, the current is moving in one clean direction. But you get something like this, where it's just all contra contracting at different times. Um, and uh, so if we look at this, uh, we could have a, a, a reentry circuit, the pulmonary veins, um, um, somehow dominating, beating out the SA node. Um, and you probably have lots of them. Um, so atrial flutter is very similar. The main difference is that we typically just have um, one dominant source of conduction. So rather than lots of many different competing things, we just have one. So something is still beating out the SA node, but it's just one. So there's a little bit more uniformity. Um, so we still have the AV node, though, to act like defense for the ventricles. So uh, effectively, so here's my SA node. And the point is that the uh, reentry circuit is winning out. So let's see what happens. It might move really quickly. One, two, three, four, and then it gets passed through the ventricle. So that is the AV node playing defense when I say that. That's what I mean. <clears throat> um, it has a long refractory period and a slow conduction velocity. And as a consequence, it might be four signals from the atria from this reentry circuit, uh, again shown here, that is knocking at the door saying, hey, can you let us in? Can you let us in? We want to get under the ventricles. But the AV node, because of the refractory period, can only do one in four or one in two or one in three. Uh, it'll, it'll usually be a clean ratio. And the details there are just going to depend on the types of damage, the types of, um, you know, it just depends on how screwed up the heart is. Um, and you can kind of see here, we have a little bit more one, two, three, four. This would be a four to one block. And I guess that's what we saw in our picture, one, two, three, four, boom. Um, so yeah, it could be two to one, it could be three to one, but so if I have a 300 uh, uh, beats per minute from the atria because of this uh, this conduction loop, it might be 150 beats per minute for the ventricles. Uh, AVRT, so atrioventricular reentry re tachycardia. So again, this is Wolf Parkinson White, the bundle of Kent, also known as the accessory pathway, and it's uh, second most common supraventricular tachycardia. Um, so the idea is usually we go from SA to AV, but there is this alternative route, and this alternative route is likely faster because the AV node is notoriously slow. That's sort of its job. Um, also, 0.1% of people have Wolf, Parkinson White, which is actually relatively common. So this could be bad for a couple of reasons. One is that um, like we just saw we have this defense over here. Bum, 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 bum. Ah, so four and one. So we had a really, really large, um, you know, you could imagine if it was four to one, you could imagine it's 300 beats per minute. And then it's only 75 beats per minute when we look at the ventricles um, because of the uh, AV node defense. But in a situation like this, if I somehow had an atrial tachycardia for whatever reason, maybe I develop a reentry circuit on a local scale in the atria, it's going to pass through the accessory pathway and it's going to initiate the ventricles to also beat at 300 beats per minute. Um, there is no delay. There is no refractory period uh, of, the, of the AV node to save me. So that's one reason that it's bad and can lead to a tachycardia. Second reason is that it, it might just... Um, so this is Wolf Parkinson White without the reentry on, on a global scale. This would be the reentry on a global scale. So um, rather than originating here, it might just say, you know what, it's much easier and more fun just to initiate, just to continue moving in this direction forever and ever and ever and ever. So this is orthodromic when the impulse moves through uh, in an anterograde fashion through the AV node. But it could also be an antidromic, which is really just the same thing. It's just now it's moving in the other direction. But both of these are global reentry circuits. Global makes sense. It's the whole heart. And it is AVRT because it's atrio, uh, atrium in the ventricles and it's reentry. So all of this, the names actually are kind of perfect. Um, AVNRT, N is for nodal, um, and AV is for the, uh, 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 the, like the AV node, basically. Um, and so just people getting older, genetics, um, females randomly, this disproportionately affects them. Um, uh, there might be many different ways to get through the AV node. Or we have ischemia, like we said, which creates an island of non-conduction, et cetera. Um, 
But because it's at the AV node, it's kind of like past the gatekeeper to some extent. So uh, we, we pretty much don't have the uh, gatekeeper phenomena anymore, which means it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So for every time the atria contract, the ventricles also contract. Um, and uh, we kind of see, so this is maybe a normal heartbeat. This is P, this is our QRS, and then this is our uh, T wave repolarization. But here I'm going to see a, a QRS and then a, uh, and then a P and then a QRS and then a P and then a QRS and then a P and a QRS and a P. Actually, you know, I take that back. I don't even think this is a P. I think this is a T wave. But the idea is it's very quick succession and it's one to one and it's one to one and it's a, um, it, it is a regular rhythm. Um, but it, it, it's, it's much faster. Um, also, uh, just a note I meant to make earlier, um, we, we see the repolarization and the T wave of the ventricles. Where's the repolarization of the atria? It's technically inside of the QRS complex, but because it's so small compared to the ventricular contraction and conduction signal that it kind of gets lost and obscured by the larger QRS amplitude. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, okay, ventricular tachycardia. So now we're south of the border. Um, similar to atrial flutter. Atrial flutters, we have one um, ectopic foci or one dominant reentry local loop that just generates a current, um, but it, it gets blocked at the AV nodes. That's why we have the four to one, three to one, two to one, et cetera. Um, but here it's already in the ventricles. So it's already past the AV node defense. So the ventricles can contract uh, to their heart's desire. Um, so it's still coordinated. Um, and again, we have coordinated ectopic foci or local reentry circuits, which are uh, what's going to be generating this. Um, uh, VTAC can evolve to, uh, we should say, V-fib. Uh, it can also uh, evolve to cardiac arrest and asystole and, and things like that. Um, so this is the SA node beating out. Let's watch that again. This is the SA node winning. Notice that the SA node beats every one second. The AV node beats every two seconds. But if the SA node... Signal gets to the AV node while the AV node is still in process of doing the diastolic depolarization. It resets everything. And that's exactly what we see. It never gets really past here. But now we're going to cross this out and now see what happens. Boom. Now it does it on its own, but it goes much slower at the ventricles. Now, if it gets irritated, they can go much more quickly. So earlier I said the AV node, but it could also be the Purkinje fibers. So um, they're, they're now calling the, uh, the, the shots the... Uh, ventricles if they become faster. So you could have that the, you know, SA node or AV node are damaged and the Purkinje fibers take over, but more likely they get irritated. You have a hypokalemia. You've got something wrong with them. Someone's taking too much alcohol. There's too much cocaine and the ventricle, it, it affects. Um, remember, they have their own little tiny phase four, but it's very sensitive. And so it, it the slope increases dramatically and it becomes 0.5 seconds and it now becomes the dominant. So that is probably the main mechanism by which we generate a ventricular tachycardia. Um, ventricular fibrillation is just like atrial fibrillation. So we have all of these ectopic foci, we have all of these um, reentry circuits, but there's just not a coordination. There's not one dominant one. So we've got, just got signals coming all over the place. And so we're not gonna have a coordinated, um, regulated uh, team effort contraction, um, which is necessary to get the blood out it's just going to be all chaos, uh, this quivering effect, which is what fibrillation means, um, and can evolve from VTAC, uh, can again lead to cardiac arrest. All right, now that we've set up um, how the pacemaker and cardiac myocyte action potential operate and have a basic under understanding of reentry circuits and arrhythmias, now we can get to EKGs. Um, all right, uh, I was watching X-Men Origins Wolverine clips on YouTube, as one does, uh, and I realized that X-Men is very unrealistic, and it's not because of the adamantium or the super healing. It is that they tried to pass this off as an EKG in the movie, uh, and hopefully by the end of this, um, this little section, you guys can tell why this is an absolutely ridiculous EKG. That is just laughable how little research they did. Uh, one of the many reasons that movie tanked. Um all right, so we've talked about this SA node to AV node, the bundle of Hiss, the Purkinje fibers, fun stuff. Um, all right, when current is moving, so the current's going to move from the SA node here all the way kind of in this direction to the Purkinje fibers. So if I have a lead, like lead two, which is right here, um, as the positive ion, so as the sodium and calcium are coming in, we're kind of kind of have this like positive current moving in this direction. It is going, the lead is going to pick this up and it is going to give us an 
upward deflection, which is why that goes up and why that goes up and why that goes up. Actually, that one's a little bit more complicated, but ignore that. Um, on the other hand, if I looked at something like AVR, AVR lead is over here. Here, the current is traveling away from the AVR lead. So in this case, we should have a downward deflection. We'll see later that AVR and lead two are, have amplitudes really pointing in the opposite direction. Um, also keep in mind that uh, the EKG only picks up myocyte signals. It's the integration of many different signals, some of which are going in different directions, but we're getting the net direction from the myocytes. And that gives us this lovely picture right here. Um, all right, we have 12 leads in total. Um, so six of them are like, kind of like frontal leads and six of them are horizontal leads, also uh, probably more known as precordial leads. Um, uh, so we're kind of going to move clockwise. Um, so one, two, and three. And then we have left, F for foot, and then R for right. Um, the precordial leads now, um, you know, you can see them here, but it's probably a better picture here. The septal leads, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is going to be on the front of the chest, kind of near the sternum, maybe a little bit under, a little inferior, and then they're just going to move laterally along the chest. Uh, you can picture here as well. Um, this is maybe a better picture of the precordial leads. And uh, this is what it looks like on a person. Um, and so this moves down in uh, kind of kind of logical fashion. So one to two to three. And you're really just making a clockwise twist and a clockwise twist as we go from one to two to three, just continually moving clockwise. And then we're going RLF. So this is in like anti-alphabetical order. Um, but it's also moving in clockwise fashion. Uh, clockwise, clockwise, and clockwise. Um, and then one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, that's just an increasing numerical order. These are the precordial leads. And we're going kind of from the medial portion of the sternum uh, a little bit more laterally. Lead two is like the most important one, the most famous one. Again, that is where the current is kind of passing straight to lead two, um, the, the net current. And so that's just the classic one that you see. So that's one of the things wrong with the Wolverine thing is they're just showing one EKG lead when it should really be 12 of them if you want to get a real picture. But often you'll see at the bottom of an EKG just, you know, you, you've got all 12 of them, but then they'll just really highlight two by, by giving it its own space at the bottom. And it's the same as we saw up here, but they're just reiterating because, you know, if you got a quick, hot 10 seconds to glance at an EKG, maybe you just want to look at lead two. If you got more time, you're going to go through all of the leads a little bit more meticulously. Um, and these all have uh, different sections that they're looking at. So uh, 2, 3, and F, these are all um, uh, looking at the, um, the inferior portion. AVL and 1, I think of this 1 as like its own L. These are going to go to the, the left. Um, and now these portions of the, the body, so this is the lateral circumflex artery. Um, and the 2, 3, and AVF, RCA is going to cover the inferior portion of the heart. Um, the uh, um, uh, anterior descending widowmaker, the LAD, is going to be um, uh, is going to be. Ooh, sorry, it's uh, spacing. Um, the LAD is going to be. Oh, this makes sense. So this is in the medial portion of the precordial leads one and two. Um, uh, three and four arguably are going to be in between the LAD and the LCX. And then we also have the five and the six also on the side. Uh, so these are also going to be the lateral circumflex. Um, just uh, another way to think about it. Um, and yeah, there we go. Uh, all right. So when we're looking at this little box is going to be 40 milliseconds. Um, 40 milliseconds times five is one big box, which is going to be 200 milliseconds. 200 milliseconds is just 0.2 seconds. You get five of these big boxes up, um, you have yourself one whole second. Um, and yeah, we should expect the QRS complex to be about 100 milliseconds, PR interval about 160, QT about 360. And if we counted, you know, this is one, this is two, this is three, and this is four. This is four boxes. Um, that's 0.2 times 4. That's 0.8 seconds per beat. If I take 60 and I divide it by 0.8, that's going to give me 75 beats per minute. 
if I had three boxes, that's going to be 60 divided by 0 0.6, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6. It's going to be 100 beats per minute. Um, and if I have five boxes, this is going to be um, one beat per second, 60 beats per minute. So this is the RR interval. And this is the best way to figure out, one, if it's in sinus rhythm, is this a consistent interval? And then two, just is it tachycardia? Is it bradycardia? Um, so we've mentioned these, these, we have mini pacemaker cells with um, up slanting slopes for phase four um, for the nodal cells. The SA node is the dominant one. It says the highest rate, 60 to 100. The AV node is going 40 to 60. A bundle of hiss is tied, but we don't care as much about that. Uh, we don't care as much about the uh, left and right bundle branch fibers. Burkinji fibers, we said, are particularly susceptible to electrolyte imbalances. Um, you know, hypokalemia and cocaine and things like this can induce faster rates in the Purkinje fibers more so even though they have a really slow rate they're so susceptible it can actually make their rate higher in the SA node and then they'll be dominant um, whenever an electrical signal hits a node it basically resets which is why this is the dominant one um, and this is ventricles atria faster rate as you go up um, so notice it resets 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 now this is stopped now when this goes here it resets. <laughs> you can watch it again and you guys can just play it back again. This is actually a really great way to understand this. I think this is a, a beautiful uh, gif. Um, all right, normal sinus rhythm. Uh, notice that we just have these smooth, regular intervals. Okay, um, now let's count the number of boxes. There is one box, two box, three boxes, not quite four boxes, but almost four. Three boxes is 100 beats per minute, four boxes, 75 beats per minute. So I don't know, this is about 80, 85 beats per minute. Um, Normal sinus rhythm, sinus tachycardia, that's fine. Maybe we're exercising, sinus bradycardia, that's fine. Maybe we're sleeping. Um, so these would be the irregular tachycardias that are probably a little bit more important. Atrial flutter, um, atrial fibrillation, ventricular fibrillation, and ventricular tachycardia. AFib, uh, so we would say this is an irregularly irregular heartbeat. So um, it, it's it's not a sinus rhythm, and then the rhythm as well keeps changing. Um, and the... Um, there's just completely uncoordinated contractions. There's several ectopic foci, several reentry circuits, all of which are firing at, at different times, and there's just no coordination, and electrical signals are crashing into each other and canceling out, and we have contractions over here while we also have contractions over there, and at the end of the day, it just kind of looks like this little chaos we see over there. Um, this is the quivering, and this is why we don't get any atrial kick. We won't have a P wave um, because it's there, there are contractions, but they're you know it'd be like trying to squeeze toothpaste out of your um, out of the bottle, um, but like squeezing with your fingers all in random different directions. Like maybe a little bit comes out, but not not really. You've got to kind of squeeze in like a smooth, coordinated fashion. Um, we see the same thing with V fib, um, atrial flutter. We have an ectopic foci. We have a reentry circuit, but we just have one dominant one that is setting a regular rate. The rate happens to be above the SA node, which is why this is the dominant. Notice that this is spinning over here several times. It does like a couple loops, maybe two or three loops um, every time that the ventricle uh, passes. And that's, that's the AV node playing defense, is that I can go around a few times before the AV node passes one of those messages along. So we could have an HL rate of like 300 beats per minute and then a... Uh, ventricular rate of 150 beats per minute, that would be a two to one AV conduction. Maybe it's an atrial rate of 300 beats per minute and a ventricular rate of 100 beats per minute, that would be a 300. So I have one, two, three P waves for every QRS complex. Here I have one, two for every uh, QRS complex and here would be one, two, three, four for every QRS complex. And whether it's one or the other, just, I don't know, it depends on a bunch of random stuff that we don't have to worry about. Um, cool. Wolf Parkinson White, 0.1% of people have this. It is an accessory pathway um, where we can go here. Sometimes it's over here. We basically don't have to go through the SA, SA node. Um, now, this can be bad in and of itself because if we have an atrial tachycardia, then we don't have any defense, any gatekeeper at the, at the AV node, so it can induce a ventricular tachycardia. Um, uh, Notice that because we don't have the delay when we go through the bundle of Canthi accessory pathway, 
we're going to initiate ventricular contraction and signals a little bit earlier, which is why we get this QRS that kind of comes up prematurely, right? Normally it goes like this. And now it's going like this, right? It's, it's starting a little bit earlier. That is called a delta wave when it does that. Um, now, one of the problems with this is that not only can we just go through the bundle of Kent, but this is bidirectional. We mentioned this earlier that the signals can move bidirectionally. And so you can actually get a global atrioventricular reentry circuit. Um, and uh, that's no bueno. Uh, so this can lead to a tachycardia. Uh, this is the second most common cause of supraventricular tachycardia. Um, so again, same general idea. Um, a short P interval because the, the delta wave really, um, the pre, you know, the long, elongated QRS. So this can uh, proceed to AVRT, uh, orthodromic, this is anterograde, or it could go uh, retrograde. And the same friggin' picture, but you guys get the, get the idea. Um, all right, AVNRT, so this is nodal. Um, and because it's at the node, we don't really have the node playing defense. I guess it's already sort of past the defense, so the refractory thing that we're looking forward to in the AV node isn't really here. And at the end of the day, so like this is a normal one shown here um, and uh, an abnormal one. This is just, you know, look at this, this is a very short, um, this is, uh, I'm trying to think what the rate would be for this. This is going to be over like 150 beats per minute. Um, as quite, quite fast. Um, so it's tachycardia um, and we have a just nice regular reoccurring rhythm. Um, and it is, uh, yeah, and that, that is just because, as we see in this lovely picture, um, unlike we had an atrial flutter, every single one of these gets into the ventricles. Um, and of course, no, no P wave because, uh, you know, we're, we're not contracting uh, the, the, uh, the AV NRT is really calling the shots or the, the reentry circuit at the AV node. Um, PVC, a premature ventricular contraction. Um, often we just leave these alone. They're not really a big deal. Um, AFib, we might say the same thing. It, it's not always a big deal on its own. You know, they might progress to worse arrhythmias. Uh, and this might progress to VTAC, which is uh, life-threatening immediately. Um, and often this is due to enhanced Purkinje automaticity, hypokalemia, um, or ischemia. The hypoxia in, induces the, or sort of in, uh, prevents the sodium potassium pump from working, cocaine, alcohol, all of these things will have disproportionate effects on the uh, phase four slope of the Purkinje fibers. Um, so here we have a premature ventricular contra contraction, particularly large. And so if you're counting between normal, you know, here's a normal beat and that's a normal beat, uh, it's going to be particularly long. Um, Additionally, we have also kind of a long time between this and this, which means that there's a lot of diastolic filling going on during this period. So this should be a particularly large contraction. So we're sort of, we have a premature contraction. We're sort of skipping a beat in some sense. And uh, then we have a large uh, contraction, which is a palpitation that follows. Um, so I guess the way to think about this, um, we have a premature ventricular contraction here. So the ventricles depolarize, but... Depends on the timing, but in, in, you know, in the conduction speeds and, and lots of different variables. But if they uh, fire, we get a big premature contraction. And this tries, like, like we talked about, things can go bidirectionally. It tries to go up and ignite the atria and cause a depolarization or a, a contraction there. But we have a refractory period. And if the atria are in the refractory period, then uh, it's, it's not going to do anything. Um, now the atria come out of their refractory period as they as they should, and then they initiate just a normal impulse. Um, but that impulse now can't travel down to the ventricles because now the ventricles are in refractory period. Um, and that's why we get this long, 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 long uh, uh, break, basically. So we did not have a, like this is where we should have had our normal QRS firing, but we didn't have it because the ventricles, as we saw here, were in the refractory period. So we would need to wait another second. Um, so this is a pause, uh, a large pause between normal uh, contractions. This is called a compensatory pause if it's exactly two times the normal sinus inter, uh, interval. 
Um, and the, the, the longer pause that we said uh, allows more filling. So we have a large uh, contraction here, uh, which is our palpitation. Um, now, a non-compensatory pause is really just starting off the same picture, premature ventricular contraction here. Um, but now it's just the timing is perfect. It moves into the atria and it induces a... Um, uh, uh, doesn't exactly induce a, um, a contraction of the atria, but it travels into the atria and it and effectively resets everything. And so it resets everything. So now we have to go ahead and wait a, um, a whole second. Let's just say that the heartbeat was going at one beat per second. Um, so now in this case, it's, it's 0.88. Um, we're counting from this P wave to this P wave, 0.88 and one. This is now two times, or excuse me, less than two times a normal sinus interval um, so this is a non-compensatory pause. If it makes you feel better, I don't think the PVC's compens compensation and non-compensation pauses are really high yield. You're responsible for them, and you might see them on your EKG test, um, but not you know not the worst thing in the world if that doesn't make perfect sense to you. Um, so VTAC can technically be qualified as three premature ventricular contraction, right? Occasionally you have pre premature ventricular contraction. doesn't mean you have VTAC, but if I have one, two, three in a row, now we say that you're in VTAC. Um, and we mentioned before, enhanced automaticity, um, local reentry circuits, ectopic foci from antiarrhythmic drugs, from cocaine, from alcohol, from hypokalemia, from hypoxia, all sorts of stuff. Um, if we have one dominant ectopic foci or reentry circuit, it's monomorphic. If we have several, so that's going to be kind of like atrial flutter a little bit. Um, if we have several, it's going to be polymorphic. This is a little bit more like fibrillation, but it's not quite fibrillation. It's, you know, it's some kind of in-between thing. I guess if you had enough of these um, where it's so uncoordinated, then it would be uh, in-between. So my, my guess, I'm talking out of my ass here, but I'm guessing we'd have monomorphic, sort of like a fibrillation, or excuse me, a, um, a polymorphic, and then we might have a fibrillation over here. Um, where this is just one foci, this is a few foci, and this is probably so many foci that it's completely uncoordinated. It's a guess. Um, okay, let's uh, let's keep going. Um, so V-fib, uh, this is uncoordinated contraction. There's too much firing in random directions, and it's just, you know, it's just quivering. It's just quivering. There's no actual um, coordinated contraction, so we don't really get blood out very effectively. And when we look at the EKG, it looks a little bit like we saw with the atrial fibrillation. It's not a very large amplitude, and it's just crazy chaos. Um, and uh, this can evolve in cardiac arrest, um, and it can often evolves from VTAC. Um, so this is also a ventricular tachycardia, but torsade de point, or torsade de, I think it's torsade de point. That's why I say that way. Um, we're going to have this sort of like sinusoidal nice, rhythmic pattern with like how the um how the amplitude changes that's really what distinguishes this so it's a type of type of vtac it comes specifically when people have a long phase two or a long phase three really just a long qt interval this can be established by class three antiarrhythmics um, which prevent the potassium uh, influx from the delayed rectifier channels which just elongates that Hypokalemia also, kind of paradoxically, you would expect it to be a large um, influx, but for whatever reason, the, the channels aren't uh, properly activated. Um, also is going to cause a, uh, a, an elongated phase three, which makes people susceptible to, I think this is um, the, the early after depolarization, um, which, which triggers the torsade de point. Um, and uh, yeah, just, just so you can notice all three of these being a little bit different, large amplitude, wide QRS, ventricular tachycardia. This is one foci, this is several foci, and this is typically a long QT interval caused, and they all just look a little bit different, right? This one does not have the nice, smooth, rhythmic um, sinusoidal waves, right? That doesn't really fit here. It does fit a lot better over here. Um, okay. Uh, hypokalemia um, for the cabillionth time. Actually, let's start with hypokalemia. We've done this one more. Slower phase zero due to the, it, it is depolarized. And if it's depolarized, the sodium channels are not activated as much. Hence the flow, slower phase zero of the cardiac myocytes. Um, and, and randomly, it also, it, it super activates the, this is also paradoxical. I, you wouldn't expect the 
uh, potassium channels to be extra activated, but they are. So we have a, um, uh, a steep phase three. And again, this means that we have a shorter refractory period. And this is what we saw. This is what allows reentry circuits to really do their thing is that, um, you know, here's our island of non-conduction. One of these things is going fast, but with fast with long refractory period. That's going to be um, this line here. Um, and then the other one is going to be a slow with short refractory period. And that is going to be this one over here, right? It's slow going up. It's slow at passing the baton on to the next cell, right? That This is what designates how quickly the dominoes fall. But it, it has a very short refractory period shown here. Um, so it can be ignited again. And then this allows the reentry circuit to, to occur. So that's hyperkalemia. Hypokalemia is just the exact opposite. So if you look at hypokalemia and you see that there is this very slow, elongated repolarization phase three, that's this. And because it's slow and weak and long, it's going to be shallow. And here I have a very, very intense um, uh, steep phase three shown uh, here, th this line there. Um, that is going to correspond with a tall peaked T wave. Um, Perchoriditis, often caused by a virus, causes an ST segment elevation. So a lot of this is hypoxia induced. It also causes a PR depression um, and a uh, ST segment uh, elevation. Um, and it's diffuse. So it's in all the leads. This is a big way to distinguish this from myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction is going to be just, you know, like I'm having the MI on my LAD. Um, so that's only going to affect, um, you know, maybe like leads like three and four, um, but not, it's not going to affect my, uh, my AVR. It's not going to affect my AVF, right? But the, the pericarditis would elevate all of those ST segments, which we'll talk about right now. So this is normal, not occluded. We have an end STEMI, which is a, um, it's like a more mild heart attack, um, MI, myocardial infarction. Um, and yeah, there's there's some plaque, maybe there's a clot. Here the clot is just a little bit worse. And so this is a STEMI, it's total occlusion. Um, all right, so what does STEMI even stand for? ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. What does NA stand for? Non-ST segment uh, elevated myocardial infarction. We see this is a depression and that's an elevation. Um, we also have unstable angina, which uh, also causes this. Unstable angina is really just the same thing as NSTEMI. Maybe it's a little bit less severe, and it does not have um, cardiac biomarkers like troponin. Um, and, you know, there, there's a lot of reasons for why we have the elevation. Uh, my dumb guy way of understanding it is that there's severe hypoxia, and severe hypoxia induces um, a similar effects to what we see with hyperkalemia and um, what we um, just saw with hyperkalemia is that we have a large T wave. So I don't know, uh, they're kind of similar and uh, you know, the, the sodium potassium pump not being fueled affects the potassium gradient, which somehow causes um, uh, over activation of the delayed rectifier channels. I don't know how true that is, but maybe it's a useful fiction. Um, and anyways, most important, and STEMI is the depression, STEMI is the elevation. And uh, we're looking at the interventricular septum, the right ventricle and the left ventricle. Here is my epicardium, here is my myocardium, here is my endocardium. Same thing over here, IV, right ventricle, uh, and then the left ventricle muscles, epi, myocardium, endocardium. Um, where does the coronary artery come from again? It comes from right here. It comes from right here, the epicardium. So. If I have an end STEMI, this is not as severe, um, this is perfectly fueled with blood, right? That is where the blood is coming from. So if there's an occlusion, this is going to be the last thing to suffer. It's this area, which is farthest away, which is going to suffer quickly. You might say, wait a second, Will, isn't there a lot of blood in the actual chamber of the heart? Yeah, but remember, diffusion sucks. It can't really get to the middle over there. So this will suffer. That will infarct. Um, now, if you have a STEMI, which is really bad, this is going to be the STEMI where it's a transmural, meaning it affects all of the muscles because it's a really serious infarction. Um, cardiac tamponade often involves from 
uh, pericarditis, if the pleural, if, if the pericardial effusions uh, occur really quickly, can occur from cancer, um, or a, you know, uh, one to two week myocardial infarction, you might have a anterior free wall rupture, and then blood leaks in. So you got all this blood in the pericardial space, and it starts contracting, like pushing, applying pressure on the ventricles, preventing them from fully contracting. So we get these weak QRS um, amplitudes, uh, much smaller than normal, um, like a vigorous QRS amplitude is a, a, a contraction is large, and a, you know, a smaller one would be weak. Uh, on top of this, the heart sort of swinging back and forth um, as a, a result of the compression and trying to contract. Um, and so these oscillations in the heart floating back, you know, moving back and forth is going to cause uh, differences in amplitude. Uh, this is called electrical alternons. And um, uh, yeah, so, you know, tall, or that's medium, that's taller, and then this is shorter. Um, electrical alternants. And Heart block, so bradycardia, by by far less concerning, um, well, not less concerning, but just those many less examples of it. Type four antiarrhythmics uh, can can induce this, as can type two antiarrhythmics, which are really just beta blockers, specifically beta one. We're always talking about beta one with the heart. And first degree, we have a long PR period, another long, another long, another long. They're all equally long. That's first degree. So. We have some damage to the AV node or the bundle of Hiss or something like that. And it just, the delay, which is just the PR segment is even longer because however long the refractory period was, however slow the conduction velocity is, it's even worse now. It's exacerbated. Um, second degree, I have a PR interval that's long and then it gets longer and then it gets longer and then it just completely drops the ball and I don't have a QRS um, signal. It doesn't get past the ventricles. Uh, second degree is really the same thing, um, you know, uh, effectively the same thing. I, I have a, uh, I have a uh, QRS, like we drop the ball in one of them, this, this Mobitz, also known as type 2. The difference is that the PR intervals do not get progressively longer. The PR interval here is the same as the PR interval, PR, PR interval there. So if you drop a QRS randomly um, without a premature ventricular contraction, it's uh, second degree. Now, if the intervals are getting longer, 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 it's type one. Otherwise, it's type two. Third degree is that there's just no connection. I wasn't even trying to make a joke, but they are literally on different wavelengths. Um, the atria contracting. So um, the the rate of atrial contraction has nothing to do. You know, earlier we were doing like 300 atrial contractions for, you know, every one ventricular traction. So uh, or th uh, th um a two to one ratio, so it could be 300 beats and 150 beats, that still is a connection, right? Here I'm, we're saying that there's absolutely no connection. So the uh, PP intervals and the R intervals have absolutely nothing to do with one another. So that is a third degree block. All right, let's talk about uh, auscultation and murmurs. What causes them? Um, when do the valves shut? What is splitting? Um, you know, what is a, you know, trying to, we have a couple of audio clips, what normal heart sounds like, um, PDA is a continuous murmur to only one, I uh, think get into systolic murmurs, diastolic murmurs, maneuvers like Valsalva and afterload to make murmurs louder or quieter. And then, uh, our two exceptions, um, hypertropic, uh, cardiomyopathy, and then the mitral valve prolapse. Um, so pulmonic, valve, aortic valves, and the tricuspid valves all have three leaflets, and the mitral valve is sometimes called the bicuspid valve. It only has two leaflets. Um, most common murmurs we're going to see are stenotic valves, where the valves are really just stiff, like imagine a door that won't open, and a regurgitant valve, a, a door that won't fully close, so stuff will leak backwards um, during contraction. Ventricular septal defect is just a hole in the ventricle. Now, the left side of the heart when you're an adult or even a kid, is always larger than the pressure on the right side. It's, of course, the opposite when you're a fetus. Um, so blood will go from the left to the right side. Uh, a patent ductus arteriosus, so the pulmonary artery, um, so from the right side of the heart going to the lungs, it's a little connection to the aorta. This is also a vestigial feature from, from birth. Sometimes it remains. Um, and you can imagine that the aorta is much higher pressure than the pulmonary veins, so blood is going to rush into the pulmonary veins. Uh, the Patent formen ovale. The formen ovale is something that, again, we have as a fetus. It's supposed to go away. It's supposed to shut. If it doesn't shut, it's called patent. And it's also it's very similar to an atrial septal defect. It's still a hole between the atria. 
again, the left side is higher pressure than the right side, so we see this left to right flow. Um, a mitral valve prolapse is a is effectively like a diet regurgitant, also called insufficient valve, where it's it's a little bit leaking backwards, but it's mostly that it's just that they're prolapsing or ballooning up towards um, the atrium when the ventricles are contracting. Um, laminar flow is like normal. Uh, fluid is is flowing in a, a nice organized parallel sheets, and as you increase the kinetic energy, so the continuity equation, the small diameter here says that the velocity would increase. The velocity increase, the increased density of the particles causes them to get all screwy. This turbulent flow, you know, it's gonna, you know, light won't refract through it. becomes opaque. It becomes very loud. So this whooshing sound that we hear is associated with turbulent flow. And as you can imagine, if you had a, um, let's say like a, uh, a patent formant ovale, so blood is rushing from the left atrium to the right atrium, it's going through this tiny little hole and it's going to make a little whooshing sound as it moves through. It's the same thing really going through the valves. Um, and the smaller the hole, actually, the louder the sound will be because the higher the kinetic energy. So paradoxically, a really large PFO is not going to sound as bad as a small PFO. Um, valves are different. Valves are, we should always have, um, um, you know, a little bit of sound going through the valves, but it's going to get exacerbated if I have like a stenotic or a leaky valve and, and it's a teeny amount of volume and space uh, where the blood can rush through. So fun little sample. Let's take a look at this. Water is falling down in parallel sheets. Uh, it's translucent, it's transmitting light. Um, it's relatively quiet and we increase the volumetric flow, the velocity, the density of the particles. And we have turbulent flow, not translucent. It's very loud. This is what our murmurs are going to be like. Fascinating. Uh, what a Bill Nye the Science Guy. I guess you have his own show. All right. Aorta, um, pulmonic valves. This is in the second intercostal space in between the ribs. And then we have the tricuspid valve and then the bicuspid or mitral valve at the apex of the heart in the fifth intercostal space along the mid-clavicular line. Lub-dub, 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 lub-dub. So that is um, the lub is S1 as the mitral valve and tricuspid valve close. And then the dub is the as the aortic and pulmonary valve close. Um, we uh, get the, the dub. And this is systole. Um, this is, it makes it look like these are even, but remember diastolic is twice as long and you will feel this pulse. If you put your finger right here, it bulges upwards. That's what we feel when we feel the pulse. Um, so what causes a valve to close anyway? So we've already talked about this um, a little bit, but let's, uh, let's take a look. So Imagine it works really the same as, as the venous valve. So if I have a pressure of five here and a pressure of four here, we go from high pressure to low pressure, the blood is going to go up and it, it just pushes these valves open. Now, for whatever reason, we're pooling blood here. We have more blood here than here. The pressure is six, the pressure is five. It's going to go ahead and push these backwards and it shuts them. So it shuts the valves. It's the same thing for the heart. So if the atria are 12 and the ventricles are 10, the high pressure of the atria is going to push the doors, push the valves open. Now, as the ventricles fill with blood um, and maybe start to contract a little bit, um, we're going to see this pressure rise above the atrial pressure and it's going to slam this mitral valve shut. That is our lub. Um, ventricle continues to track, contract uh, isovolumetrically as both valves are closed and that just increases the pressure, increases the pressure, increases the pressure until the, H, the aorta is 80 and when this gets to 81, bing, bang, boom, it pushes the aortic valve open. And now blood is going to empty, it's going to fill into the aorta, the aorta systolic pressure is going to increase, 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 increase. And once it is a little bit higher than the ventricular pressure, you know, it might not be 101 and 100, you just made up numbers, it is now going to push backwards and close the valve, and that is our dub sound. Um, so technically the S2, the dub, um, is actually you, could, supposed to, you should, could supposedly delineate it to two sounds. Now the closing of the aortic valve and then the closing of the pulmonic valve. The aortic valve closes first, 
due to the very immense pressure of the aorta pushing backwards. The pulmonic valve is a little bit wimpier, so it doesn't really close as easily. There's not as much pressure in the pulmonary circuit. So if you can listen really closely, maybe you can hear it. I think I delude myself into thinking I can hear it, but it's pretty difficult. So it's like lub, dub dub, dub dub. <laughs> I can't really hear it, but uh, just know that A2 comes before P2 and you'll be fine, I think. Um, so uh, this is, uh, so splitting of the A2 and P2, um, we can do this during inspiration. So when you breathe in, you decrease your intrathoracic pressure. Um, on top of this, you're bringing in oxygen to your lungs and, and this causes uh, vasodilation in response to the increased oxygen. This also is going to further decrease the pressure. And so this is going to um, the decreased pressure plus the increased flow coming through the pulmonary valve really just means that it's going to take longer uh, than normal to close. So this is normal, A2 and P2, and then A2 and P2 during inspiration. P2 takes even longer. So we have an even longer delay than when we normally have during inspiration. Um, now we could exacerbate that. So we, we normally have a delay, uh, A2 then P2. If you uh, take a big breath in, the delay is longer. Now it might be even longer on top of that if you had a right bundle branch block because the ventricle takes a little bit longer to receive the electrical signal and contract. So it's going to be aorta, wait, 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 then pulmonic. So it's going to be a really long. And then pulmonic stenosis, um, it might, if it takes a long time to open the valve, it also um, is going to take a lot longer for the, the blood to get through and then the pressure in the pulmonary circuit to be large enough to then close it. So this is also going to cause uh, an abnormal delay. An atrial septal defect, so this is a hole between the atria. We're going to have high uh, pressure from the left atrium flow into the right atrium, and this is going to cause uh, a larger uh, gap as well because we have this increased um, right atrial pressure, increased right uh, ventricular volume and pressure, and so it's going to take it's more blood to get out basically, and so it's going to take longer to get all the blood out and for the valve to ultimately close shut. This is a fixed uh, delay though, I would note this. So if you inspire, it doesn't actually change it. That's an ASD. Um, now there's something called paradoxical splitting. So it's typically aorta first, then pulmonic second. But what if we had a left bundle branch block? Or what if we had aortic stenosis? Then it takes a long time for the signal to get through or it's really difficult to open the valve. So it takes a long time to get all the blood out. In that case, it now might actually switch the order that P2 E for expiration or, or normal, P2 comes first and then A2. Well, now if you inspire, the same stuff that we saw over here, it really just still applies. The, the pulmonic valve is going to um, take longer to close, but now it's the pulmonic valve that was first, that used to be second. So now it takes longer. It's actually closer to when the aortic valve. So this is paradoxical because normally during inspiration, we expect an increase in the time delay between the aortic and the pulmonic valve closure. But now it's actually a, a decrease in the time gap between the two valves closing. And that's, again, because the pulmonic valve closes first if the aortic valve has issues or there's a left bundle branch block. Um, take a listen. Lub-dub, lub-dub, lub-dub. Beautiful. Um, so a PDA, patent ductus arteriosus. Note that this goes from the aorta to the uh, pulmonary vein. Now look at this difference, 130 at its best, 90 at its worst, 25 at its best, 10 at its worst. No matter what, no matter whether in systole or diastole, you know what, blood is going to flow from the aorta to the pulmonary vein. And we're gonna be able to hear it. Uh, and so this should be continuous, regardless of whether we're in systole or whether we're in diastole. It will be worse during systole though, because that is when the pressure differential is the highest. So let's take a listen. Kind of like the ocean a little bit. It's just a continuous, they might call it machine-like murmur. Um, systolic murmurs during ventricular contraction is where we're going to hear these murmurs. And you think about it, this is when blood, aortic stenosis. I'm During systole, I push it out of the aorta. During systole is when if there was a leaky insufficient valve, I'm going to have regurgitation. Um, mitral valve prolapse is really just diet regurgitation, so same thing there. And ventric ventricular septal defect, 
um, uh, there's a hole between the uh, two ventricles. Notice these pressures, 130 and 10 and 25 and 5. At diastole, we have 10 versus 5. Yeah, that's a pressure differential. Yeah, I'm going to have blood going from the left atrium to the right atrium, but not with a lot of oomph. So it's not going to really generate a lot of sound. So there's not much during diastole. On the other hand, during systole, 130 versus 25, yes, ma'am, that is a large pressure differential. And so blood is going to flow um, very vigorously through during systole, which is why this is a systole murmur. So I think just knowing that's more than half the game. So let's go through these uh, one by one now. Um, something to note about these is that um, because it's between S1 is a loud sound and S2 is a loud sound and there's sound in between, it kind of just sounds to me like there's just one long continuous screech. And at the very least, I mean, they don't expect us to be experts for this on the NBMEs. Um, so if you can just notice that, you would know that it's a systolic murmur. Um, so this is a crescendo. It kind of goes up and then it goes down a little bit at the end. Um, this is the most common one. Uh, often it's due to calcification um, and then just it's age related. Um, and bicuspid valve is people who have Turner syndrome get these and these are particularly prone to uh, age related calcification. The sound will radiate to the carotids. Um, it's going to be weak because it, it takes so much effort to push open the valve. So we're not actually getting out as much blood as we want. And it's delayed. Um, we mentioned that uh, this might lead to paradoxical splitting. It takes longer to push all of the um, blood out. So the pulse will be a little bit delayed. Uh, mitral regurgitation uh, due to rheumatic fever or infective endocarditis. This radiates to the left axilla. And it's, uh, it's a blowing murmur. So let's take a listen. Again, notice that it's kind of just one long continuous sound as it goes from S1 to S2. Um, the mitral valve prolapse, um, S1 and S2, it's it's mostly continuous sound, but it's a little bit quiet right here. You should have a, a mid-systolic click. And this is, again, effectively just a premature um, mitral valve regurgitation. It's prolapsing or pushing the valve into the atria during ventricular contraction. It's usually benign. Um, often, often females have them, young female athletes, and uh, they might lead to uh, various pathologies later in life. You can kind of hear it. Uh, all right, so ventricular septal defect, um, and you hear this at the tricuspid area, and uh, let's take a listen. To me, that sounds a lot like uh, mitral regurgitation. But again, uh, you, you just want to be able to discern a little bit and, and take context clues to figure out the rest. Diastolic murmurs, um, as we're filling the ventricles, we should hear these. So uh, remember that during diastole is when the aortic valve is supposed to be closed. But if I have a high pressure in the aorta and a leaky valve, blood is going to leak downwards back into the ventricle. So that's why this is a diastolic murmur. Mitral stenosis is this is when the atria is filling the ventricles. And if it takes a while to push the valve open, we should be able to hear that. So um, let's take a listen. It's going S1, S2, bah, S1, S2, bah. You can kind of hear it. Um, all right, so this is also blowing just like the, both of the regurgitations, mitral, systolic, aortic, diastolic, both the regurgitations are blowing and that's how they're described and they kind of sound like it. A little screechy. Uh, also rheumatic fever, infective endocarditis, bicuspid valve from people with Turner syndrome, aortic root dilation can be a lot of different things from some aneurysm, from hypertension, from syphilis. Um, and you should have a wide pulse pressure. We saw this earlier. The diastolic pressure goes really low. The diastolic pressure is due when the aorta is left to its own devices after the ventricles are done contracting. That reservoir of pressure is diastolic. But if all of the blood's leaking backward to the ventricles, the diastolic pressure is going to be low. Somehow this is described as a water uh, pulse pressure or a collapsing, uh, uh, a collapsing pressure. Um, and... Uh, so yeah, wide poles collapsing and water hammer. Um, mitral stenosis, you have this opening snap and it's often a sequela to rheumatic fever. So let's take a listen. Very 
Okay, cool. Um, all right, a brewy is um, if I have a clot in my carotids or I have a clot in my abdominal aorta, you'll auscultate this um, in your y'all's intro to clinical medicine. Uh, maybe you'll auscultate the carotids, and this is just to see if there's a clot or it's a very narrow. Again, this is blood flowing through a very small diameter. Continuity equation tells us the velocity increases when the velocity increases and tr transitions from laminar flow to turbulent flow, and we should be able to hear that upon auscultation. Um, all right, that uh, must be the wrong one. Um, let me uh, take a listen on this. Okay. Um, and maneuvers to increase or decrease the sound of a murmur. Um, you know, we've talked about passive leg raises. This raises preload squatting. Um, significantly increases preload, a little bit increases afterload. Hand grip especially increases afterload. We haven't really talked so much about Valsalva. Um, Valsalva is going to increase intrathoracic presser, pressure, which uh, means that less blood will flow to the lungs, and so less blood goes to the left heart. In other words, this is just a way of decreasing preload. So Valsalva decreases preload. Um, inspiration. So uh, in, we kind of have a little nice picture here. So inspiration decreases the intrathoracic pressure. And this is going to cause the lungs to inflate, but it also causes the atria to inflate. So that's something to keep in mind. The atria inflate, the ventricles inflate, inflate in addition to um, the lungs. Uh, this is going to increase the venous return of the right heart. It's kind of sucking blood in. In addition, the oxygen going into the pulmonary circuit is going to cause vasodilation, which allows more blood to um, enter into this low-pressure pulmonary environment. Um, that's why the venous return of the right heart increases. Now, if you think about the low pressure in the lungs, we, you know, we go from high pressure to low pressure. So it goes from the venous system to the low pressure pulmonary system. But if the pulmonary system is low pressure, it has a hard time then pumping to the left atrial pressure, right? Because that would be low to high or low to medium or whatever. So uh, it's going to do the opposite effect, decreasing the venous return to the left side. <coughs> um, and a good, maybe it's good to familiarize yourself with this, but this is probably the, the best way to think about it. Um, actually, maybe the one thing that's not on this is that uh, right-sided murmurs will increase um, when, when basically when more blood goes through something, the murmur, uh, the, the, there's more turbulent flow and the murmur is going to increase. So um, right-sided murmurs will therefore increase with uh, inspiration. Um, Left-sided murmurs will decrease with inspiration and would increase with expiration. Um, so a good summary of, of the previous slide is that uh, preload is really going to increase all murmur noises. The ex exception being Hockham, uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and MVP mitral valve prolapse. Um, afterload decreases the amount of fluid that gets out of the ventricles. We're thinking more the aorta. So the increased, uh, so if you can't get, we saw this earlier with a pressure volume loops. If you cannot get, um, if you can't get blood out of the ventricles, that just means you have more blood in the ventricles. More blood in the ventricles is going to increase um, the mitral regurgitation and the ventricular septal defect. Um, uh, and that should make sense. If we think about it, more blood means uh, it's going to, you know, leak backwards to the left atrium, and it's also going to leak through the hole into the right ventricle. Um, again, we have, this is very similar to what we saw earlier with the preload. The exceptions will be HOCM and MVP. It doesn't really have much of an effect on mitral stenosis if there's a lot of blood and, because, you know, the a lot of pressure for the aortic valve. That doesn't mean much for the mitral valve. Um, and it just means there's more volume in the left ventricle. So it doesn't it has some small effect, but, but not much in the mitral stenosis. Um, the extra aortic pressure does push more blood through uh, a regurgitant uh, aortic valve, though. Um, and I uh, hope that makes sense. If you have a lot of pressure in the aorta, that's a lot of afterload. And so it might push forwards, but it also might push backwards through the left ventricle. Um, so let's think through this. A systolic murmur, uh, which one of this during ventricular contraction? Um, this is going to be passive filling during diastole. Uh, this is going to be during ventricular 
contraction. So here uh, it will be the mitral regurgitation. What about inspiration? What's going to happen? Well, inspiration increases uh, right-sided murmurs. Both these are on the left side, so this is going to be quieter. The valsalva means we're going to decrease the preload. Decreased preload is going to um, make everything quieter except for Hockham and MVP. What about hand grip? So if we increase the afterload, the afterload, all of this extra pressure is going to push blood backwards. It's going to push blood backwards. So we're going to have an increased amount of volume in the ventricles. Well, that doesn't really do much for stuff going through the mitral valve. Um, but a bunch of blood here, though, is going to uh, cause us to spill backwards a little bit more. So this is going to increase the mitral regurgitation sound. Um, now, why are Hockham and mitral valve prolapses exception? You can see the picture a little bit better with Hockham. Um, the hypertrophied interventricular septum um, at, a, at a normal state is going to largely obstruct the uh, aortic valve. So it's hard for blood to get in through here. And remember that when blood goes through a really small area, the velocity increases, becomes turbulent flow, and it becomes loud. So this is very loud. What happens if I increase the preload, I'm now going to cause this left ventricle to swell because there's so much fluid in there. The swelling actually pushes the IV septum a little bit to the left. Now blood can get through here more easily. It's less occluded. And because it's not going through a small heart, we don't really have a murmur. Um, mitral valve prolapse, I've been told, is the same explanation. I haven't really found a good picture on it, but mitral valve prolapse, you know, this is where the... Uh, valves should lie, but prolapsing means they're pushing in to the atria. And um, this is normal, but if you increase the preload, you increase the amount of fluid in the heart, somehow it causes this, this is to flatten out so that we don't have it prolapsing. And uh, we're not going to have uh, the blood flowing through this tiny little hole as much. Um, so it's a similar explanation, I think, than Hockham, but I just haven't found a great picture for it. I've combined the embryology and congenital heart defects section. You never really need to know much about embryology and it just fits better to have them together. Uh, we'll talk about fetal circulation, uh, right to left shunts, and then left to right shunts. Left to right shunts are far more common, um, but the right to left shunts are a little bit more sinister. Um, and then the coarctation of the aorta briefly. Um, so heart develops about four weeks. You know, this is a little bit debatable. What is a heart? What is beating? Um, some people go uh, and say up to, updates all the way to six or seven weeks. Um, obviously, that has a lot of interesting ethical implications. Um, fetal circulation. So uh, veins, typic, veins always go back towards the heart. They typically have deoxygenated blood. One exception we know of is the pulmonary vein. Another one is the umbilical vein coming from mom to the fetus. Um, because of the high uh, pre like pressure and flow from the umbilical vein, uh, we don't typically want the blood to go to organs that don't need it for two reasons. One, it might damage those organs if we have too much blood flowing into them when they're early in development. And two, if there's high resistance in an organ, then we're just going to lose some of our like energy, some of our oomph as the blood is traveling, trying to get through and, and feed uh, the baby's tissues. So a couple of... Uh, features developed, evolved over, over I'm sure, billions or no, millions of years. Um, the ductus venosus, uh, we're going to bypass hepatic circulation. Um, then we have the foramen ovale from the right atrium to the left atrium. The right atrium is higher in pressure in fetal uh, uh, life, and, and uh, the left atrium is higher in pressure in, in adulthood. Um, and then the ductus arteriosus, going from the pulmonary veins to the aorta. Um, so some of the blood might leak through to the right ventricle that doesn't go through the foramenal valley, it goes to the pulmonary vein. Again, why go to the lungs? We don't need to oxygenate it. We're just going to slow it down. There's resistance in the lungs. We're going to damage the lungs. So we want it to go into the aorta. Um, again, in fetal life, this is higher pressure, but of course the pressure gradient is reversed in adulthood. Um, all of these should decay uh, as someone's born in a couple first days, months, years of their lives. Um, when it doesn't, a pathology develops. A um, couple things. Notochord becomes the nucleus pulposus. The foramen ovale becomes the fossus ovalis in the right atrium. The ductus venosus becomes the ligamentum venosum. And most important probably uh, is this and uh, I guess this. 
the ductus arteriosus becomes the ligamentum arteriosum. Um, endomethacin is an EDZ, which is sometimes needed to close it if people have a patent one. Um, PGE2 prostaglandin uh, keeps it open, so uh, it makes sense that the NSAID might counter that. And here we have a little picture uh, of the connection. Um, so normally what happens is the septum secundum uh, fuses with the septum primum, and um, we, we close the gap and, and uh, shown here, um, but sometimes a little bit remains open, and this is the uh, patent foramen ovale where blood can uh, leak through. Um, and uh, once a baby is born, it takes its first breath. Uh, we have this decrease in intrathoracic pressure. We have oxygen coming in, so we have hypoxic vasodilation, which further decreases the pressure. So I'm going to pull more blood in uh, to the lungs. So usually some of the blood escapes the lungs through the foramen ovale, some escapes through the ductus arteriosus. Um, but you know what? A little bit more is going to get in once the baby starts breathing. More blood into the lungs means more blood into the left atria. And we get to a point actually where the left atrial pressure pretty early on after a baby's born is higher than the right atrial pressure. It then can close the flap of the uh, foramen ovale and then the, the septum fuse and uh, hopefully it goes away. Um, so left to right shunts, I think of L to R. This is late ter, later in life. These are less severe. These are more common. Um, and yes, they come later in life in adolescence or adulthood. So these are acyanotic. Uh, people typically won't be blue because they're not as severe. Uh, vape, VSDs, ASDs, ASDs are also basically PFOs, PDAs, and then Eisenmiger um, phenomena. Um, the larger hole is obviously the worse uh, the outcome, uh, but remember that a large hole means that we're going to have um, a little bit slower velocity than a small hole due to the continuity equation, and it's the small hole that causes turbulent flow, which causes the whooshing sound. Uh, so if you're listening to a murmur and it's very quiet, that might actually be a worse VSD, a worse ASD. And when you have these left to right shunts, you should expect the right ventricle and pulmonary system to be higher in oxygen than it normally is. A VSD, typically these close on their own when they occur, you know, someone might have heart failure, right? If you're trying to pump stuff out of the left ventricle, it's just going to go into the right ventricle. So uh, you're not going to get oxygen to your body as efficiently. Um, as a result, people be, uh, be fatigued and, and maybe bluish, often not. Again, these are acyanotic. Um, this is hollow systo systolic, and that's because there is always a larger pressure in the left ventricle to the right ventricle, but it's not that big of a difference during the diastole. So the amount of blood flowing through the VST is pretty small. But during contraction, the left ventricular pressure skyrockets. Now we have a lot more blood coming in, which is going to be associated with a higher, uh, uh, a louder sound, which we can pick up as a, a systolic murmur. Um, atrial septal defect, uh, basically a PFO. So instead of left atrium, left ventricle to uh, right ventricle, it's left atrium to right atrium. Um, here we have extra fluid going into the right atrium, which means the right ventricle has more fluid to pump out. This is going to further delay the closure of the pulmonic valve. Remember, for the S2 sound, it's aortic first, pulmonic second. And now we have a fixed delay because more blood is coming in constantly through the left atrium. So this is associated with Down syndrome. We have something called a paradoxic uh, embolus. So like 90% of the um, uh, clots that somebody gets might come from the deep veins of their legs. This is going to go through the venous system. It's going to enter to the right atria, the right ventricle, and then it goes into the lungs where usually it's going to get caught in the lungs. And, you know, that's not good, a pulmonary embolism, whether in the venous or arterial portion of the, the lungs, but it is much better uh, to, to go there than for it to get caught in the brain or something. So if you have an atrial septal defect, the um, embolus can flow uh, the, from the right atrium to the left atrium, which goes to the left ventricle, and they can get pumped up through the aorta, and it goes to the brain. So a lot of people will get strokes as a result of this. Um, ASD can be due to uh, a defect in the secundum, defect in the primum, um, and uh, so it's a missing tissue issue. Um, alternatively, we have a PFO, which is like 98% similar. 
the difference is that ASD, there's missing tissue. Um, while PFO, there was just improper fusion or closure of the foramen ovale. Um, PFOs are, are probably a bit more common, and they're also smaller too, which means they will be louder. Um, so uh, during embryological development, we have this uh, ostium is the opening, and primum is the first, the first opening, and the first septum. Um, and then later we have a ostium secundum. Um, now we have a septum, a second septum form, the septum secundum. Um, and then we have the foramen ovale. So blood is going to just rush in like this. So this is normal during fetal development. Um, after birth, though, as we said, the large decrease in intrathoracic pressure and the um, um, oxygen-induced vasodilation means that we're going to get more pressure to the left atrium. And it should ideally close this bad boy. Um, if it doesn't, it's a PFO. And if we have a defect, it's an ASD. Most of these are secundum defects, 90%, 10% are primum defects. These are going to be largely associated with Down syndrome. Um, and as we mentioned, the lungs act as a kind of a filter. They play defense. They catch all of the clots that come from your the deep veins of your legs. Um, and uh, so they, they don't get pumped out through the, vent, the left ventricle to the rest of your body. But if you have an ASD, they might go through, um, I suppose it could happen with a VSD too, but for whatever reason, it's more commonly associated with ASD, I think. Um, feel free to fact check me on that, but it goes through the ASD and it get pumps to the brain anyways. Um, patent ductus arteriosus. So remember that the aorta is at a very high pressure always compared to the pulmonary veins. So whether you're a systole or diastole, you're always going to have lots of blood rushing through this, which is going to create a whooshing sound, which we can hear. So this murmur is going to be a continuous. It's the only murmur I know of that is both systolic and diastolic in nature. Um, now, it's going to be a little bit louder during the systole because that is where the pressure differential is even larger. Um, but again, as opposed to the VSD, where you only hear it during systole, this is merely louder during systole, but it's always present. Um, so as we mentioned, prostaglandins keep it open, so endomethin and NSAID is going to close it. Um, Eisenmenger syndrome. So all of these left to right shunts at the end of the day means that the right side of the heart is gonna be pumping more blood. This is more strain in the right ventricle. It is therefore going to hypertrophy and the vessels due to the uh, hypertension are going to um, uh, remodel becoming thicker. Um, now it's the right side of the heart that is uh, the, the, the particularly strong one. And that what was a left to right shunt now might be a right to left shunt. So if I had a VSD, it used to be um, high pressure left ventricle, lower pressure right ventricle. Uh, but now, um, you know, it's been working out. It's all, it's all, it's now that badass in town and it, it pushes the, it's a high pressure and it pushes blood towards the left side of the heart. Um, this is associated with clubbing of the uh, hands and fingers. Most clots, or excuse me, most um, defects we said are left to right. They show up in later in life, um, VSD, PDA, ASD, and um, now the cyanotic ones, which we're going to switch to, it's a much smaller portion of the pie. Um, the tet tetralogy of uh, phthalate is the probably the most common of the cyanotic, but I would just maybe keep these um, relative numbers in the back of your head somewhere. Um, so this is more severe, it's less common, and it's cyanotic. Babies are going to turn blue, it's fetal onset, it's, you know, these all connect. The fact that it's severe is why it's fetal onset and why it's called cyanotic as well. So uh, it's a bigger deal. <laughs> you get blue babies and you get birth, the three Bs. You will also see ASDs and VSDs in these. Um, don't let this confuse you. I would just consider these secondary to the more primary cyanotic pathology, right? So if in... If in uh, um, tetra, tetra, tetralogy of phthalate, we see a VSD, I would still consider this a cyanotic rather than acyanotic. So these will be considered the dominant and the VSD, ASD will be considered secondary. So here we can think of the 60s, truncus arteriosus is one vessel, transposition of great vessels is two vessels, tricuspid atresia is three, tetralogy of, of phthalate, well tetra is four, and there are four major features that we have to know about this. TAPVR is five letters, which stands for Total Anomalous Pulmonary Venous Return. And then Epstein Anomaly, I always just thought of the, the anomaly factors, the fact that it, it doesn't really fit into this. There's no T, there's no six letters. Basically, that's a cop-out. Um, truncus arteriosus, during development, we have the truncus arteriosus, which is going to branch off into the aorta and the pulmonary artery. 
Um, those are separate, of course, but if you have this, this particular uh, birth defect, um, they're going to be merged into one. Uh, obviously, it's not good. Um, transposition of great vessels. So you're supposed to have like a twisting of the aorticopulmonary septum, and this rotation um, during fetal development causes the uh, pulmonary artery to be where it is and the aorta to be where it is. But for whatever case here, the transposition, these things it doesn't twist properly. And now the right ventricle actually goes to the aorta, uh-oh, and the left ventricle goes to the pulmonary artery. Um, so if blood is coming into the right atrium and then going to the right ventricle, then it's going straight to the aorta. Um, technically, it would never get over to the left side of the body. It would never get to the lungs. And um, most importantly, and so this is not compatible with life. You know, this would only potentially work if you have a VSD or an ASD for viability. Um, but obviously, it's like having another defect to cure the first defect, which is still terrible. Um, tricuspid atresia. Atresia means something's gone away. Tricuspid is in the tricuspid valve. Um, so we can see that this is a normal heart. Here's my valve. Here's my right ventricle. Here, uh-oh, where's the valve? It doesn't exist. So it's going to go right from the right atrium. It would just be trapped in the right atrium. This is also not compatible with life. It would just be trapped in the right atrium. It wouldn't, you wouldn't have a full circuit for your system. But if you have a VSD or an ASD, then maybe it could go over to the left side. It could go to the lungs, and it is compatible with life, though it's still terrible. Um, the As you can imagine, if blood's not going into the right ventricle, maybe through uh, like an ASD, we're going to have this really teeny tiny, weak, puny right ventricle. So that's the hypoplastic, underdeveloped right ventricle as a consequence of the lack of a connection between the right atrium and the right ventricle. Um, tetralogy of phallet. So um, this is associated with the George syndrome. And the infundibula, which is just part of the interventricular septum, is going to be, um, it's the top part really, is going to be pushed towards the right side of the heart. So um, the, let's see where we would start with this. Um, the infundibular displacement, so I guess it should go there and it's, it's kind of going here. It's going to make this very narrow. So, uh, infundibular displacement is, is the interventricular septum sort of blocking off the pulmonary valve, um, which is really just a form of stenosis. It makes it really difficult to pump blood through the pulmonary uh, valve and into the artery. Um, this is going to cause right ventricular hypertrophy um, it, because it has to pump against this large like pulmonary afterload. It, it's going to toughen up, um, uh, kind of like Winslow that we saw earlier, the mouse. Um, now, the, uh, the infundibular displacement, right? It's supposed to be connected. It's not connected, so it creates a ventricular septal defect. If the ventricular septal defect um, is going to allow blood to rush in that is not oxygenated and go straight into the aorta. This is called an overriding aorta, which really just means that oxygenated blood is mixing with the deoxygenated blood of the aorta. Um, these children are said to have tet spells where, um, for whatever reason, they, they just the cyanosis becomes much worse. So the solution here is that they would squat. This would increase the afterload, um, which increases the right atrial pressure, um, uh, which um, excuse me, if, if we increase the uh, if we increase the afterload, um, this would likely cause blood to prefer not to go through the aorta and instead to go into the pulmonary system. Um, so it's gonna the afterload increasing is gonna cause blood to go into the pulmonary artery, um, and uh, this is one way to increase afterload is just pushing the the legs in. And you might have heard of the talk show host Jimmy Fallon. His son had a heart condition, and it was tetralogy of Fallon. I only mentioned it because it was in a lot of news stories, just maybe to make a connection. TAPVR um, again, five letters, and uh, the pulmonary. Uh, veins, of course, are supposed to connect into the um, left atrium. Um, but in this case, we have the pulmonary veins connecting into the right atrium. Another picture here, pulmonary veins should be going in here, but instead they're going to the right atrium. So this is obviously uh, quite bad. So an atrial septal defect might um, develop just to deal with the large right atrial pressure. Um, Epstein's anomaly, again, the anomaly is that it's, six has nothing to do with it, T has nothing to do with it. Um, uh, lithium exposure, which is a treatment for bipolar and antidepressant disorders, um, 
in utero can, can cause this. Um, the tricuspid valve is, is normally like this and it's going to be pushed significantly downwards and it's going to be open a lot more. So two things. One, you can imagine that um, this right ventricle is teeny tiny, puny, weak. Uh, so I'm going to have right heart failure. In addition, this valve looks like it kind of stinks. So a lot of the blood is going to just go back into the right atrium. So we also have severe tricuspid regurgitation. Um, coarctation of the aorta. So for whatever reason, I have a little narrowing here in the descending aorta right after the arch. Um, it's going to make it difficult for blood to flow down here. So instead, the blood is just going to flow upwards. Um, you know, normally we have this picture, but here we have this picture, which means we're going to have a high pressure in our upper extremities and a lower pressure in our lower extremities. Uh, you can also see this on an uh, 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 radiology image and um, on an x-ray specifically, uh, you see this notched appearance. It's really difficult to see, but you can kind of see these little like, weird spider web type things coming out. Um, so this is just uh, like collateral circulation. So we still need to get blood down through the you know descending aorta, the abdominal aorta, but it's just difficult to get there. So it's going to take all of these weird uh, superfluous roots and um, go through the intercoastal arteries and, and come around to find an alternative way to merge with the abdominal aorta to get down there. But this thickens them over time and this eventually can just be noticed on an uh, x-ray. Um, a couple risk factors to George syndrome, we said, uh, leads to tetralogy of phthalate. Lithium for bipolar and antidepressant uh, leads to Epstein anomaly. We have no tricuspid. Um, Turner syndrome is a bicuspid aortic valve, which can lead to many different things, uh, including the coarctation of the aorta. Marfan syndrome uh, leads to many different issues. Um, mitral valve prolapse, aortic regurgitation, uh, aortic aneurysm dissection, which we'll talk about later. Down syndrome leads to uh, an ASD, and fetal alcohol syndrome can lead to any of our acyanotic disorders. Let's talk about hypertension and its sort of twisted toxic relationship with arterial sclerosis and how they can feed back to one another uh, and create this positive feedback loop. Um, we'll then go into the different types of arteriosclerosis with an emphasis on atherosclerosis and then uh, delve a little bit into how um, damage to the vessels can lead to aneurysms and dissections and uh, potentially uh, ischemic heart diseases like heart attacks. So hypertension, usually we're going to say it's around 110 over 70, 120 over 80. Uh, obviously, the top number is systolic when the heart is contracting. Lower number is the diastolic when the heart is relaxing. Arteries are elastic, so they're sort of these pressure reservoirs. Uh, hypertension is more common in African Americans. Uh, people who smoke is actually uh, particularly high for hypertension, uh, obese individuals, and there's also a strong genetic link. Um, we, we typically measure it on the brachial artery, but really most of the arteries should be more or less uh, equivalent in, in what their blood pressure is. Um, couple different stages of hypertension. Um, uh, we'll really just be concerned with this one. So anybody who has a, a blood pressure of 139 uh, systolic or larger is technically hypertensive, uh, or if the diastolic pressure is 90 or larger. And, and amazingly, over 47%, so about half of Americans, have hypertension. Um, obviously, it can go to stage two. And then hypertensive crisis is something you should know, uh, over 180 or over 120. Um, and then there's two types. There's an emergency hypertensive crisis. Uh, the emergency is where there's acute end organ damage. The hypertension is so bad it's damaging the organs. And then the urgent one is where there is not immediate uh, end organ damage. Um, types of hypertension. So primary or essential hypertension. So this is like 90% of the hypertensions we're going to be uh, interacting with. Most of these are just age related, just as people get older, their, their vessels become crappier, their heart becomes crappier, and uh, um, you know, we develop hypertension. Um, and so just increased cardiac uh, output and uh, total peripheral resistance. And, and there's just many factors that will integrate to form this. So uh, we kind of just shrug our shoulders and say it's idiopathic for the most part. Uh, it's just entropy. Um, but well, then some people have very specific targets that we can point to that caused their hypertension. This is secondary hypertension. The, there's a couple different ones. I mean, you could have like a pheochromocytoma. Uh, Someone has like a, an adrenal medulla um, 
uh, cancer and it's just generating tons of catecholamines that are causing massive vasoconstriction. That's one, but probably the main one you should think about is renal artery vasoconstriction, um, where it's now just for whatever reason overproducing renin, which is going to activate the Ross system, which causes hypertension. Um, so, uh, things that contribute, we talked about the many factors that integrate to cause primary hypertension. Uh, let's go through them one by one. Um, and it may be helpful to remember that pressure is equal to flow times resistance. So if the flow or the resistance goes up, the pressure should go up as well. So let's look at things that increase the flow, basically. Um, and this is specifically going to cause higher diastolic. So smoking is a huge one. Uh, this is going to increase the heart rate, which increases the cardiac output. Uh, obesity, it can stimulate the ROS system. ROS, uh, one of the end products is aldosterone. Aldosterone means more water retention. More water retention means more preload. More preload means more cardiac output. ROS also increases the contractility of the heart. Um, obesity itself can also lead to hyperlipidemia, which is sp specifically going to contribute to atherosclerosis. Uh, excess salt intake uh, is going to cause a very similar mechanism. More sodium means more water is reabsorbed, which again, just same thing as, as we saw here, we're going to have more preload. Um, now, what about the resistance side? Um, this is going to contribute to higher uh, diastolic and uh, systolic pressures. Um, so smoking can vasoconstrict arteries. Um, also damages the arteries, and if they're damaged, it's going to make them more susceptible to all versions of arteriosclerosis, but especially atherosclerosis, um, which can then positively feed back and cause more hypertension. Uh, obesity, as we said, activates RAS. RAS causes vasoconstriction. This is going to increase the total peripheral resistance. Stress activates the sympathetic nervous system, which in addition to increasing the, car, uh, the, the heart rate is also going to um, cause vasoconstriction. Uh, and then the uh, diabetes, high blood sugar can damage the vessels, which can cause arteriosclerosis, uh, a specific kind called hyaline arteriolosclerosis. Um, and this is just showing that hypertension, most of it is primary. Uh, it, it is just a shrug of the shoulder saying, I don't know, people just get old and they break down and their vessels break down and hypertension develops. Um, secondary hypertension, like renal stenosis is one way that you could have your uh, kidneys overproducing renin. Um, and you get this like string of beads appearance on your uh, renal arteries. So that is a, it's a big giveaway. Um, so why is hypertension bad? Let's just think about it in two domains. It damages uh, and stresses the heart, and then it damages the endothelium. So um, if there's a lot of afterload, the left ventricle has to pump harder, and over time it remodels and it, it hypertrophies. So we now have left uh, ventricular hypertrophy due to the afterload. Um, this leads to heart failure, both diastolic because it has trouble filling because it's so large, and systolic because... Um, it's uh, the, just the afterload is, is too much for it to fight. Um, now, this left ventricular hypertrophy, um, now that it's particularly large, the, the idea that there's heart failure due to the diastolic and systolic causes we just mentioned, plus the fact that a large heart kind of squeezes the coronary arteries, compresses them, so less blood is going to get to the heart, plus a large heart has an increased oxygen demand. All of these three factors are going to lead to coronary artery disease, ischemia, and potentially myocardial infarction. Um, additionally, the changes, the remodeling of the heart changes things like conduction velocity, the repolarization, the refractory period, et cetera, and, and asymmetries in, uh, in, in, in these traits for different cells uh, in combination with the ischemia that we mentioned in the non-conduction scar tissue island is going to lead to things like reentry circuits. It might lead to ectopic foci. All of this is just going to contribute to arrhythmias. So damage to the endothelium, uh, this predisposes individuals to clots, um, specifically because the endothelium, if it gets damaged, the endothelium is necessary to generate thrombomodulin, uh, tissue plasminogen activator, and heparin sulfate, all of which are anticoagulants. And so if we damage the endothelium, one of its job is to make these, and we don't get these, which means we have more clotting. Um, just in general, um, uh, uh, it's going to weaken the, so yeah, we see all of that here. It's going to weaken the vessel walls. So 
just hypertension, too much pressure is just bad for the, the walls. It damages them. This can contribute to aneurysms and dissections of we, a weakened wall. Uh, promotes arteriosclerosis. Um, so this is what an artery should do. Notice it's elastic and it stretches, right? And a, a rubber band is elastic. It stretches, but then it snaps back. But here we don't even have the stretching in the first place for, for arteriosclerosis. So um, if these are particularly stiff, we don't have the pressure reservoir, which means the pressure goes right through. So we're going to have a really high systolic um, uh, pressure, uh, because it's, it's not giving any, um, and you know, this, uh, is then going to feed back, um, and, and cause more hypertension means we're going to have, uh, more arteriosclerosis means we have more hypertension, etc. Uh, additionally, uh, this is just going to more afterload, more hypertension means that we're going to further stress the heart. So it's feeding back there as well. Um, arteriosclerosis also contributes to atherosclerotic uh, plaques, which lead to clots. Clots lead to strokes and coronary artery disease. Um, this also is something that's contributing to the, um, the issue we had here with coronary uh, artery disease and the trouble feeding the heart, right? So the heart is large, um, so it requires a lot of oxygen. The coronary arteries are compressed. It's failing on the top of this. Now we got all these plaques, which are limiting blood flow. Um, this is just further going to contribute to the MI. Um, it's a silent killer. Most people just don't really know or worry about their hypertension. Um, you know, like we saw 50% of Americans have it, and over time it can lead to heart attacks and strokes in the brain. So uh, these are the, just the most susceptible areas to clots um, with the worst outcomes. Uh, brief word, they're bad. Uh, <laughs> I need to get a new team of writers. It stinks. Um, all right, so hypertension leads to arteriosclerosis. Uh, arteriosclerosis then feeds back in and causes hypertension a little bit. So the direction, it's it's more of a cause here than it is the other way around, but it is nevertheless a uh, positive feedback cycle. The blood vessels, so we have uh, the tunica intima, the endothelium with the basement membrane with a uh, layer of internal elastic uh, tissue. Um, then we have the tunica media with the smooth muscle surrounded by the external elastic lamella. And then the adventitia, which is the tunica externa, which has lots of collagen and, and elastin and things like that. Um, and, you know, long, big picture is the endothelial cells plus the basement membrane is the intima, followed by the media, which is the smooth muscles, followed by the external, which is the collagen. Um, so arterio means artery and sclerosis means hardening, like a loss of elasticity. And there's really three different types. One, two, and three. Two is obviously the most important. Let's start with one. Arteriolo, <laughs> uh, yellow, uh, is for the small arterioles specifically, right? This is just a generic term. This is more specific for arterioles. Um, and there's uh, two types. Start with hyaline. And within hyaline, there's actually two causes. So hyaline is where the small arterial walls thicken. Um, and then there's the one cause is that just chronic long-term benign hypertension, right? Maybe someone's blood pressure is 140 over 100. Um, this slowly pushes out plasma proteins. They're going to leak into the endothelium and uh, cause it to thicken. Alternatively, diabetes mellitus uh, might cause glycosylation of the basement membrane. You'll see this in the renal section for the glomerulus, especially this hyaline arterial sclerosis is very common. Um, alternatively, just a, a, an acute episode of very intense hypertension might lead to smooth muscle proliferation in the uh, uh, in the media, and this causes an onion skinning appearance. So notice the difference here versus here. Um, and moving on to let's do Munkeberg. Munkeberg uh, is, is going to be the medium arteries. So we have the small arteries, the medium arteries, uh, and the large arteries. So the medium arteries we're going to have calcification between the intima and the media. Um, and so this is where the smooth muscle for the most part is intima, uh, media. Um, you know, I guess there's the internal elastic lamina, and here we get a, a large thing of obstruction. Uh, notice that this is actually the one type of arteriosclerosis that doesn't change the diameter, um, but it does change the stiffness. Um, so the diameter is the same, but all of this calcium we have here, all of this calcium we have here, calcium just makes things hard, right? Think of your bones, they have calcium, they're hard. So this is going to cause uh, intense hypertension because it's, it's not giving. Uh, the elasticity is, is um, abrogated to some extent. Atherosclerosis is the big one. Uh, these are large arteries. This generates plaque. Plaque has fat, calcium, fibrin, um, and, and dead macrophages called foam cells. Um, and this is all enclosed in a fibrous cap, uh, which is really just like a layer of smooth muscle. Um, so atherosclerosis, athero is the, this is the most common one, as we said, it's the largest arteries. The ones you should think of, the four big ones are the abdominal aorta, the coronary, uh, popliteal, 
and then the carotid uh, in that order. That, that's the um, pathogenesis, the, uh, the risks. Um, so gruel paste, why? Because you know what? It kind of looks like gruel. Uh, my friend looked at this and said it looks like uh, eggs and cheese. It's pretty gross. Um, and, and just notice how tiny this little lumen is for the blood uh, to get through. It used to be this, now it's this tiny thing. This one's even smaller, just so, you know, 10% of the blood flow is getting through. Um, smoking, again, I can't say enough, this is a tremendous risk factor for arthro atherosclerosis. Um, hypertension damages them. And then hyperlipidemia, which is the gruel, right? The fat gets in um, and then the foam cells, uh, macrophages eat the fat, which we'll talk about in a hot second. Um, so hyperlipidemia is just when you have too many fats in your blood, too much um, LDL, too much cholesterol, et cetera. Um, often, I mean, there's a genetic component for sure. Um, sometimes people just uh, have terrible diets and a lot of times it's just both. Um, so I would know that these fats can accumulate in uh, the skin, especially the tendons. Uh, these are called xanthomas, especially on the Achilles tendons. Um, and the eyes is going to be a common region as well. Um, woo, okay, let's go into uh, lots of details. Here's a nice little healthy blood vessel all as well. Then, you know what? A little bit of fat. Um, there, there's, a, there's a damage, with whether smoking or hypertension, a little bit of fat gets inside, moves past the, uh, um, the endothelial cells into the, the basement membrane and the uh, tunica intima. And then the macrophages are going to extravasate, move through, and then they're going to gobble up the, uh, the fat. They're thinking that they're doing a good thing by eating this LDL. But actually, they just they, they kind of eat so much that they explode, they die, um, and and when they become uh, these apoptotic macrophages, become foam cells. They're then going to secrete cytokines, which are going to recruit more um, uh, macrophages to come in. They're going to also eat. They're also going to die. Then they're going to recruit even more. So you have a little bit of a positive feedback thing going here. Um, all of these dead macrophages with the, these uh, filled with fats. These are the foam cells. Uh, we're going to get calcium in the mix. Um, uh, fibrin is going to, to, to come into the mix as well. Smooth muscle is going to migrate and start proliferating. So we get what's called a fatty streak first. That's like the first gross morphological sign. Then this is covered by the, um, the fibrous cap. Uh, the fibrous cap is, is really just going to be fibrin and collagen and, and smooth muscle that, that lies over it. Um, and eventually, and so this is bad on its own, right? This is jutting out into the lumen. It makes it more difficult for blood to flow through because it's taking up some of the area. What's even worse though, is that this might uh, then rupture. It's very prone to rupture. A lot of this material is particularly thrombogenic, which means it's just going to initiate a really large clot really quickly, right? I mean, you cut your finger, look how quickly like the clot forms and dries. Um, same thing happens, you know, if you're in a coronary artery. Um, so weakened vessels, um, whether it's from hypertension or arteriosclerosis, and again, there is a, uh, a, a reciprocal causation here. Um, this leads to stiffened uh, vessels, which exasperates this, like I just said. Um, it also puts extra strain on an overworked heart, um, and it causes aneurysms, and it can lead to dissections. Um, and aneurysm is just when uh, it juts out a little bit, um, uh, so the diameter increases. And then a dissection is where you have a tear, specifically a tear in the uh, media, and, and then blood can rush into this space. Um, so for an aneurysm, they're most common in the abdominal uh, region, but you can also have them in the thoracic, uh, the ascending or descending, also in the aortic root. Um, for the abdominal ones, uh, back pain is going to be a big symptom, largely associated with tobacco use. Um, for the thoracic, maybe think T for Turner's, Turner syndrome with the bicuspid valves. Um, I guess as long as we're throwing names out there, Marfan syndrome as well. Right? We have weakened uh, connective tissue because we have an issue with fibrillin, which is necessary to uh, scaffold for elastin. The aortic root uh, dilation aneurysm specifically can cause uh, regurgitation. Um, and we remember from continuity equation that if we have a small uh, cross-sectional area, the velocity increases. Um, we remember from Bernoulli's in, uh, equation that if the velocity increases, that means the pressure decreases. Um, and so here I'm going to have a small pressure, which means at an aneurysm here, I'm going to have a larger pressure. Um, this is a fusiform aneurysm, and then this is a saccular. So fusiform uh, goes on both sides, saccular just goes on one side. Uh, this is what it looks like. It's kind of nuts. Um, the aortic dissection... Um, 
so it's really just all the same risk factors. Um, and specifically what we have is, you know, initially you'll have a tear in the intima, and then you'll have uh, more significantly a dissection, a tearing of the media, and then blood can rush in. And if blood rushes in, it pools, and then it can rupture. And apparently these are just ridiculously painful. So someone's going to come in with absolutely like like 10 out of 10 sudden onset chest pain and pain that radiates the back and it's apparently just uh, very very outrageous it's very painful this leads to an unequal blood pressure in the left and right arms as we're blocking some of these vessels it's hard to know uh, how the blood is going to be distributed but it's unlikely to be equal um, type a is where the ascending aorta um, tears um, and uh, blood leaks out. So it could be just localized the aortic root, could be the entire aortic arch. Um, type B is really just after the aortic arch, uh, really just for the descending part. Um, right, let's talk about what happens when not enough blood gets to the heart. So first, uh, if you develop a clot upstream of a capillary bed, um, this fluid will build up, it will congest, and it will eventually push out and you will get edema. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a clot uh, in the arterial side before a capillary bed, um, this will uh, provoke an, an, an uh, ischemia upstream. You won't get enough oxygen delivered to the tissues. Um, so the area that really gets screwed over, <coughs> yeah, this is uh, ischemia, not getting enough um, blood, hypoxia, not getting enough oxygen, those go together. And if it's severe, then it's an infarction, a complete um, uh, stoppage of blood flow to an area. It results in necrosis. Um, nearby areas, kind of like the event horizon, is the uh, ischemic penumbra. Um, so this can be saved if it's reperfused. So oftentimes you'll have collateralization where other blood vessels will grow uh, to supply this area so that it can get just enough to keep living. Um, so we talked about this before. Here I have the left ventricle. Here I have the interventricular septum. Here I have the right ventricle. Out over here, we have the epicardium. The epicardium is pretty much the same thing as the visceral serous pericardium, tomato, tomato. This is where the coronary artery arises. It's going to extend into the myocardium shown here and then the endocardium. And yes, there's lots of blood here, but diffusion stinks and it really has a hard time getting in uh, to the, the myocardium. So long story short, if we become ischemic, uh, this tissue will be damaged first. And if it's a really bad infarction, then the entire issue will become uh, ischemic and potentially infarcted. Um, coronary artery disease, so what is it in Star Wars? They're like, uh, you know, uh, sadness leads to confusion. Confusion leads to anger. Anger leads to the dark side. Uh, similarly here, we have hypertension leads to... Um, atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis leads to uh, clots and coronary artery disease, and coronary artery disease uh, can lead to myocardial infarctions. Um, so coronary artery disease, anytime we have occluded coronary arteries, um, this is going to uh, cause ischemia damage, uh, endocardial remodeling, hypertrophy, um, and this can lead to heart failure, angina, myocardial infarctions, cardiac arrest, coronary steel, uh, arrhythmias, uh, and cardiac arrest again, apparently. Um, so uh, of all the heart issues, coronary artery heart disease or coronary artery disease is probably the, the main one. So again, the coronary arteries stem right off of the ascending aorta um, and fill during diastole to feed the heart, especially the myocardium. Um, just before we even get into this, maybe a good way to think about all of this is you know, here's a healthy person right here. And here's a person with a STEMI, um, which is the worst type of myocardial infarction. Then you might have an end STEMI, and then you might have an unstable angina, and then you might have a stable angina. So this is a spectrum in terms of how bad things could be. So this is the worst, then this, then this, then this, and then this is obviously good. Um, somewhere in there, we can have Prince Mental, the variant spastic. So um, stable angina, you can think of this as like a diet, 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 myocardial infarction caused by atherosclerosis. And um, basically, if you try to run around, your heart starts to hurt. Um, chest pain, uh, that is unstable angina. But when you sit down, you feel better. Uh, this, that's where you're stable. Unstable is the same thing, really, but it, at even at rest, if you're lying down, your chest still hurts. So obviously, it's a little bit more severe. Um, this is uh, typically going to be a thrombus. Um, 
So the uh, atherosclerotic plaque has broken and then uh, a clot has developed, but it's not completely occluding it. Um, this is honestly the exact same as an end STEMI. So you're gonna have T way inversion on the ECG, ST depression, but the main difference is that there's no cardiac markers. Um, Vasospastic, this is mostly people who smoke a lot of cigarettes or do a lot of cocaine. This induces um, smooth muscle contraction, which is going to constrict the blood vessels and not enough blood is getting through the coronary arteries into the myocardium, which causes pain. Um, and uh, yeah, um, coronary steel condition. Okay, imagine that you have a blockage of one of your coronary arteries. Um, that means this tissue here is not getting enough blood flow. So earlier we mentioned that, well, sometimes you will have collateral vessels form, um, like an anastomosis, which will uh, now help feed over to this uh, somewhat occluded area. And you might think, okay, well, that, that's the body's response. So let's give them medication. Let's dilate their coronary uh, vessels, maybe with like a, a nitroglycerin or something, and this will this will widen it so they'll get even more blood flow to that occluded area. It actually backfires. It has the opposite effect that you would think these are maximally dilated already. These were not maximally dilated. So actually, if you give a nitroglycerin or something, you cause these to dilate more. These aren't dilating anymore because they were already at the maximum level, which means less blood goes through here and more blood goes through here. So you're actually robbing the already starved tissue um, of, of blood, more starved than it already was. Sometimes this is used as a diagnosis for a coronary stress test just to see if somebody has like a coronary artery disease. And they give them nitroglycerin, you have them exercise, which is gonna increase the myocardial demand, and you see if they have chest pain um, upon exertion. Um, cardiac arrest, uh, also known as SCD, sudden cardiac death. I, I see a lot of contradicting uh, explanations exactly what this is. For the most part, Anybody who dies within one hour of onset of symptoms, this is cardiac arrest. Um, almost always, this is due to arrhythmias, whether the arrhythmias are downstream of an MI or hypertrophic uh, obstructive cardiomyopathies in, in uh, young athletes. Um, v, uh, but, but let's just say mostly it's V-fib, V-tac, and asystole. Um, so it's basically just electrical properties are screwed up in your heart. It causes you to die really quickly. Um, and so if someone has a heart attack and they die within the first hour, it was, you know, effectively sudden cardiac death. Um, and yeah. Uh, okay, MI is the big one. Um, so when you have atherosclerotic plaque in your coronary arteries, if it ruptures, it can cause a thrombosis. We said that this could be unstable angina, but it can also be an end STEMI. It could also be a STEMI, which is the most severe version. Um, it's going to cause uh, tightness and pain in the chest, arms, shoulders, neck, and back. People are going to get lightheaded. They're going to get fatigued. They're not going to have oxygen. Um, their heart's having trouble pumping. Um, the end STEMI, uh, we said is mild. STEMI is more severe. Um, and... Yeah, so this is going to be our end STEMI, and this is our STEMI. Again, it's in the name. This is ST segment elevation. So you know what happens? The ST segment gets elevated. It checks out. Um, again, this is uh, this is stable. Uh, this is unstable. It's a little bit worse. Main difference between this and this is that there are no cardiac markers. We have ST depression and inverted T waves. And then this one over here is the big bad boy with our ST segment elevation. Sometimes this looks like pericarditis. Um, I guess it could also look like um, hyperkalemia a bit too, but let's just say pericarditis. Pericarditis is going to be diffuse ST segment elevation, um, and this is going to be localized to the lower uh, anterior descending artery or the lateral circumflex artery or whatever. Um, two, three, and four together are under acute coronary syndrome, and then of course three and four, it's in the name, MI is the myocardial infarctions. Um, the, uh, the, the unstable angina and the STEMI, remember that this is our kind of like our epicardium and then the blood is, oh, actually, no, sorry, we should be looking here. Um, uh, so sometimes we say this is uh, infarcted, sometimes not, but um, so if this is my epicardium, the coronary vessels have a hard time getting into the, uh, the penetrating the deeper layers. So that is why this uh, occludes and infarcts first. You have transmural infarction if it's a more severe STEMI. Um, for localization, so most of our coronary artery issues come from the LCA, which is why this is called the Widowmaker. It affects elderly males. 
and disproportionately. Uh, this is going to feed the IV septum, the uh, left ventricle, um, and the anterolateral papillary muscle. I just think of antero because the LCA is on the anterior side. Uh, the next most common is the RCA. This uh, has the posterior descending artery um, for 84% of people who are right dominant. Um, and this feeds the AV node and the posterior and inferior side of the interventricular septum. The lateral circumflex is the, the least common, but still common. The coronary artery is the most common place of occlusion. Um, this is the posterior ventricular walls and the posterior medial papillary muscle. I just think of the posterior uh, co component. Remember, I think of one as an L for left, AVL is left. If you're on the left side, that's the circumflex. Um, the precordial leads kind of go from the anterior uh, medial all the way to the lateral. So you know what? Five and six are also going to be lateral. Um, uh, two and three in AVF are going to be um, for the, the floor. Uh, so these are going to be on the bottom side. And what is the bottom supplied by? It's supplied by the RCA. So this is going to be RCA. And then the, um, the one and two can kind of hit a couple of different areas. They can also hit maybe the uh, right marginal artery. Can they? I'm actually not sure on that. Fact check me on that. But um, th these are going to be a, a little bit of LAD, um, uh, a little bit more IV septum though. Um, so the uh, a bunch of cardiac markers. So again, we're going to get this for the end stemmies and stemmies, but unstable angina does not have these markers. Troponin is going to be the most specific. It has, um, you know, the, the abundance is much greater. The half-life is much longer. This is the best thing to measure if you want to indicate an MI. So why do we even look at creatine kinase MB? The reason we do is because of the short half-life, this is good at telling us if there is a reinfarction. In other words, if I have a, a heart attack on day one, maybe for the next two days, I have, you know, decent levels of CKMB. Um, and then on the third day, levels should be back pretty low, back to a normal baseline. But if I look at the troponin levels, they're still high. So, and that's because the troponin level lasts a long time. And sometimes maybe like day three and a half, I have another heart attack. Um, if you just measure troponin levels, it might be difficult to tell because the troponin levels are high regardless. But the CKMB levels will go back up again. So uh, this sometimes happens. 10% of uh, uh, people with MIs reinfarct uh, within a week. So MI progression on a gross level, within the first day, we have this dark modeling appearance uh, of the heart tissue. Um, uh, first two weeks after that, uh, we're going to have uh, a tan ischemic infarcted issue. And you can kind of see over here, I just covered it a little bit, but we have these little blue hyperemic. So extra blood is going to the surrounding uh, tissue. It, it's trying to um, this collateralization, uh, and we're, we're feeding the area because of the ischemia. And then eventually the tissue might just die off. We get this white scar tissue. And as a result, uh, to compensate the rest of the heart has to work a little bit harder. So we might have hypertrophy. Um, and again, this is usually going to be the left ventricle, not the right ventricle. Um, left ventricle is more stressed out. So this is our normal picture. We get these dark waves, very characteristic for the first 24 hours. Um, first like three days or so, we're going to have neutrophils come in. This is our SWAT team. This is associated with coag coagulative necrosis, which you can see here, um, also here. And the oh, those, is, I guess, more just the neutrophils that we're looking at in this picture over here. Um, then the macrophages come in. This is going to be a little bit more long-term stability uh, shown here. And fibroblasts come in, and this you know contributes to the our scar tissue. Fibroblasts come in and lay down collagen two weeks to a couple months after. Um, more important is the sequela and the complications. So um, I guess the big one is left-sided heart failure, which leads to pulmonary edema, and this can lead to right-sided heart failure, etc. So first 24 hours, arrhythmia. Remember that we said sudden cardiac death, the cardiac arrest is really common. If someone has a heart attack and they die like right away, um, this was probably uh, triggered by an arrhythmia, triggered by the myocardial infarction. Um, pericarditis, a friction rub, which is something you can hear, um, it's kind of as like grating sandpaper sound um, upon auscultation uh, of the lungs. Um, and um, three to seven days, we might have papillary muscle rupture. Um, again, anterolateral is going to be um, the LAD, posterior medial is going to be the uh, RCA, PDA. Um, and actually, is that right? Oh, excuse me. I'm glad I checked. No, that's the lateral circumflex artery. Excuse me. Um, so uh, interventricular septum also is going to be three to seven days. Um, about one to two weeks, this is going to be a big one. 
free wall rupture, which really just means the anterior side of the left ventricle is going to rupture and blood could spill out. You know what happens if blood spills out? It fills into the pericardial space. Um, blood in the pericardial space is uh, really just a, um, this, this can lead to cardiac tamponade. So this is a big cause of cardiac tamponade. Um, you might also have a pseudoaneurysm, um, which is which also contributes to cardiac tamponade. Uh, but this is uh, effectively so. This is a um, this is a free wall rupture here, right? The, this is the um, this is the free wall, the anterior side, and then it just ruptures and blood spills out. And this is what an IV septum rupture looks like. Um, and here I have a pseudoaneurysm. Notice the timeline is the same: seven to fourteen days for free wall rupture and pseudoaneurysm. Because here, this was my myocardium. It ruptured. Uh, so that's a free wall rupture, but the pericardium didn't break. So the pericardium now is going to house a bunch of this fluid um, shown here. That is my pseudoaneurysm. So it makes sense that these would happen uh, at about the same time. The only difference between them is whether or not the pericardium breaks as well. Um, and then we have our true ventricular aneurysm. So this is, you know, a couple weeks or months later, um, we have an actual deformation of the myocardium, whether it looks like that or whether it looks like that. We've deformed the myocardium. We've stretched it out. Um, this is what an aneurysm is. is we've, we've dilated it, uh, increased the diameter. And then it kind of makes sense. It takes a lot more time and effort to move the entire myocardium rather than just bust through it. Um, Dressler syndrome is a big one. So I know we can get pericarditis here, but here we have autoimmune-induced pericarditis. And this, again, takes a couple of weeks to a couple of months. Pericarditis, pericarditis is just the inflammation of the pericardium. Um, so if you have a myocardial infarction, um, you have, uh, you've killed a lot of your tissue. Um, and so our contractility is down. And if the contractility is down, we might have more stasis of blood, which leads to a thrombus. You could have a stroke, um, might go into cardiogenic shock. Um, uh, just our heart in an acute setting is just really bad at pumping fluid out. So we have massive hypoperfusion. And um, additionally, heart failure is a little bit more long-term and chronic, and heart failure is also a connotation goes with fluid buildup. Left-sided heart failure is going to build up fluid into the lungs, uh, which leads to right-sided heart failure, which is going to build fluid up into the venous system. And um, tissue necrosis, uh, is, um, you know, if we have papillary muscle rupture, <coughs> papillary muscles is going to close the mitral valve with a chordae tendineae. Um, and if it's broken, then uh, I'm going to spill a lot of fluid back in. So during a ventricular contraction, blood's supposed to go through the aorta. But if I have a leaky valve, it's also going to go back into the atrium. Um, so uh, I'm not getting uh, enough uh, blood out. This is going to cause hypertrophy, and this can lead to congestive heart failure as well. Um, the ventricular wall rupture, we said, can lead to cardiac tamponade. Electrical instability within the first 24 hours leads to an arrhythmia. Um, and this is, we have this scar tissue, which creates these islands of non-conduction and changes in refractory period. And, you know, hypoxia leads to depolarization, which inactivates the sodium channels and, 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 and impairs the cardiac myosic contractions and action potentials. And the same with the pacemaker cells. And it's a big old hot mess. It can lead to reentry circuits. Um, and then pericarditis, which we talked about, whether acute or whether long-term, we have the Dressler syndrome, uh, autoimmune disease. So treatments here, just uh, we're worried about, um, you know, clots. So give a lot of anticoagulants, heparin, aspirin, uh, clopidogrel, uh, nitroglycerin. This can vasodilate. So this allows more coronary blood flow. Our, our heart is starved of oxygen, starved of blood. So let's dilate those coronary arteries to, so we can get more blood past the um, plaque occlusion. Additionally, by dilating, uh, the dilation especially affects the venous system, which means we're going to uh, not have as much uh, blood being sort of milked through the venous system into the um, the right atrium. So the, that, that the, the, the decrease in preload decreases the, the stroke volume, which means that the heart doesn't have to work as hard, which is good. It's good for the heart. We want to give it a break. Um, beta blockers slow the heart rate. Um, they're also going to decrease the contractility. This is less stress, less oxygen demand on the heart, which is good because it's not getting a lot of oxygen. The longer diastole also allows it to fill. Remember that we fill the coronary arteries during diastole. And uh, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin uh, two receptor blockers, ARBs, gonna lower blood pressure um, by, uh, you know, angiotensin II causes vasoconstriction and, and um, uh, aldosterone is going to increase sodium and water reabsorption, so we're increasing our preload. So less afterload, less preload means we're gonna have less work for the heart, the lower myocardial oxygen demand. 
Statins, well, look, atherosclerosis is, is made. We have these little cracks in our blood vessels, and then fat gets in and macrophages start it, and the rest is history. But if we just get rid of the cholesterol and the LDL in the first place, you might have less atherosclerosis. It can also actively, rem so you're preventing plaque from forming, but you're also plaque that already exists. We can go ahead and scavenge a lot of the LDL from that as well. Um, and it also can stabilize uh, the plaques as well so that we have a greater calcium to cholesterol ratio, which uh, stabilizes them. Um, a percutaneous coronary intervention is just putting a stent or a balloon to uh, artificially, manually sort of uh, expand the arteries so that more blood can flow through. And then a uh, fibrinolysis uh, kind of goes with anti-clot. Instead of preventing clots, let's break down clots. So tissue plasminogen activator is going to help dissolve a clot. Cardiomyopathies, for uh, lack of a better way to put it, is just when your heart don't work no good. Um, heart stinks, uh, there's a couple, there's three main pathologies which really fall into two categories of, um, you know, you, you've got a bad stroke volume and that's either because you can't get enough blood into the heart uh, or you can't, you just, your heart stinks at contracting, can't really get blood out. Um, both of those mean that you're going to have a lower stroke volume. Um, and this leads to heart failure, which is kind of the same, heart failure is just the general idea that your heart is not getting enough blood out, and so the blood will build up and, and it'll congest. It'll sort of move backwards. So um, cardiomyopathies lead to heart failure, but technically other things lead to heart failure too. So uh, also keep in mind that left heart failure almost always comes first, and then that leads to right heart failure. Um, so we have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, sometimes HCM, sometimes HOCM, dilated cardiomyopathy, and restrictive cardiomyopathy. Uh, this is a this was a diastolic uh, heart failure. This is going to be a systolic heart failure, and this is a systolic heart failure. So for the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we'll start over here. Um, high afterloads, um, so hypertension or aortic stenosis, or often just a genetic condition, might lead to thickening of the interventricular septum and the left ventricle, left ventricular myocardium. And uh, we get concentric hypertrophy. So these, you know, think of concentric rings. Um, the sarcomeres start building on top of each other, layering on top of one another like this. So they're running in parallel. Um, and uh, this helps them contract more strongly, but it's a, it's a slower contraction, but it is stiff. So a big issue that we're going to see is going to be difficult. They don't really give, not very elastic, doesn't really fill well with fluid. So the end diastolic volume is going to be particularly low. On the other hand, we have a dilated cardiomyopathy. The issue here is a high, so rather this is a high systolic pressure, this is going to be dealing sort of with like a, a high uh, diastolic pressure. So preload too much fluid in there, just chronic stretching um, of the, you know, these diastolic pressures that it's not used to. This leads to eccentric hypertrophy where the uh, sarcomeres uh, start to add in series. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, this is just if we have too much fluid in the ventricle, mitral regurgitation, aortic regurgitation. If someone's an athlete, they're going to have chronically high levels of fluid in their, uh, in their heart. And so it might remodel in, in, uh, with eccentric hypertrophy to, to generate dilated cardiomyopathy. The issue here is that it, it eventually becomes too compliant, too stretchy, and it doesn't really has a hard time pushing the blood out, which is why it is a uh, systolic failure. Um, Restrictive cardiomyopathy, uh-oh, this is a test to see if you guys noticed. Uh, this is diastolic um, failure as well. We have a hard time filling the, uh, the heart. Um, we have these really stiff, uh, rigid uh, muscle wall that just doesn't give, very similar to uh, uh, HOCM, and so we have trouble filling the heart. Uh, this one's probably less common, but still uh, for posterity, we'll include it. Um, so dilated cardiomyopathy is a systolic issue. Um, and, uh, so uh, yeah, we just really said all of this. Um, we're going to have a low ejection, uh, fraction as a result. Um, uh, because we just, uh, so ejection fraction is going to be our stroke volume divided by end diastolic volume. And our stroke volume is just so weak. They're not pushing out a bunch, um, causes, uh, you could have a, uh, a titan, T-I-T-I-N, uh, mutation in the sarcomeres. Uh, it could be a troponin mutation. 
Some people argue that a phospholambin mutation can lead to this. TTN is probably the main one you need to know. Often it's just idiopathic, like we said, maybe athletes or regurgitation over time, too much preload. Coronary artery disease, cocaine and alcohol, doxorubicin, remember that was a chemotherapy drug that can uh, affect uh, the, the mediastinum. Wet berry berry, so a thymine deficiency. Remember that berry berry comes in two flavors, wet and dry, cardiovascular versus CNS involvement. Um, Coxsackie B virus uh, in the Chagas protozoa can also lead to dilated cardiomyopathy. And we have this ventricular gallop, um, which means as soon as the AV valves open, so right after S2, we have S3, um, the blood is going to slam. So right as we start to fill during diastole, uh, blood is going to slam into this, um, this overly compliant wall, and, and that makes the following sound. Bum, ba, bum. Uh, there you go. Fun stuff. Um, and look how stretched out that is. Uh, icky. All right. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, HCM, HCM. This is a diastolic. Why is it a diastolic? Because diastole is all about filling. It has trouble filling because it's so thick, so muscular and sexy. Um, so we have, we said concentric hypertrophy. This is high systolic pressures, high afterload. And uh, the... Um, let me just, let me do a little investigation. Um, the diastolic dysfunction, the ejection fraction should be normal. I'm just making sure, um, this is a typo. The, uh, ejection fraction should not be that low. Uh, the reason is, yeah, the stroke volume might not be a lot because we're not filling the heart that much, but if it's stroke volume divided by end diastolic volume, um, which is the maximum amount that we, the preload that we get into the heart, well, the stroke volume is down, but the end diastolic volume is also down. So the ejection fraction actually should be uh, more or less the same. Um, this one is big. So the other one, it's like, yeah, maybe TTN, maybe phospholamban. This one is definitely myosin mutations. This is like probably the major cause. So it's genetic. People often don't know they have it. You'll have a young athlete. This is super high yield in a vignette. Some guy just, some kid just passes out while playing soccer and he dies. And the idea is that he had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the, the extra stress somehow sent his heart into an arrhythmia and he, and he sudden cardiac arrest and he died. Um, uh, but also hypertension, also aortic stenosis. This makes sense. If there's a high afterload, these got to pump harder and harder and harder and harder and harder to get the blood out. And eventually they will hypertrophy uh, concentrically and become quite large. Notice here that this interventricular septum is really kind of, you know, pick a lane, pick a lane, but pick a different lane because it's blocking the blood from getting out through the aorta, which is bad. Um, this tiny little area, anytime blood goes through a tiny area, we know that the velocity increases. We transition from laminar flow to turbulent flow, and this is very loud. Um, so you're going to hear a loud uh, uh, murmur here. This murmur gets better. This is rare. This and mitral valve prolapse, the, the murmur gets better with increased preload. Increased preload is actually going to push this interventricular septum in, which opens up this this opening becomes larger so that blood can more easily pass through and so it doesn't make the sound as loudly so that that is i think pretty high yield uh let's take a listen to the atrial gallop so you know we have s2 and then s3 for the systolic uh dilated cardiomyopathy and now we have s4 this is uh late during diastole the last bits of blood during the atrial kick after the p wave are going to slam into these overly stiff walls let's hear I'll be quite honest, I cannot tell the difference, but there you go, that's S4, the other one's S3. Uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy is also going to be a diastolic, it also has trouble filling, so it also has an S4. I'm not gonna play it again, but it's also an S4. Post-radiation fibrosis, um, just generally people are just gonna build up scar tissue as they get, they get older, this is idiopathic, um, and so they can't re relax, it's not gonna stretch, which again is one of the reasons we have trouble filling it, it's a diastolic dysfunction. Endocarditis, specifically Loeffler, which is a less common type. Uh, this is hyper eosinophils, which are going to come out during allergies and maybe an autoimmune disease. And amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, uh, hemochromatosis, all of the osses are going to lead to this um, this uh, fibrosis, which uh, you know is effectively restrictive cardiomyopathy. So heart failure. So. <laughs> 
Cardiomyopathy is like kind of describing why is the heart bad at pumping. Heart failure is more the condition where yes, the heart is bad at pumping, and what is the what are the consequences? So I guess it's downstream. Uh, it's a little wishy washy, but um, not enough blood is blood is being pumped to the body. So stroke volume and and the cardiac output is low. Again, ejection fraction is normal in the diastolic, and it is smaller in the systolic. So systolic, we have a hard time pumping out. So this is mainly di- dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, uh, but also if I have chronic um, uh, hypertension aortic stenosis, this could cause to hypertrophy of my um, ventricular myocardium. This increases the oxygen demand because there's more muscle and it's trying to pump harder. But because it's swelling and so muscular, it actually compresses the coronary uh, arteries that are lying in the epicardium, um, the, the serous visceral uh, pericardium, the epicardium. And, and so it's having a hard time actually getting blood to these increased demand tissues. In addition to the fact that they have to pump really hard against the hypertension, this might just mean that there's a systolic dysfunction. The, 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 the myocardium is so thick and it's just not getting enough energy. So the squeeze sucks. Also, just ischemia and myocardial infarctions could damage the ventricles. That could also prevent uh, the, the pumping of blood out. So systolic dysfunction. Diastolic dysfunction is they can't fill. The main one we talked about is hypertrophic uh, obstructive cardiomyopathy. Um, this could also, this is usually genetic, the myosin uh, mutation, but it could also be due to hypertension and uh, aortic stenosis. So notice that that's something we just saw in both of these categories. Hypertension can lead to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which can technically be a, di- be a diastolic function because it can't fill, but can also be a systolic function because it's uh, too much oxygen demand, uh, coronary squeeze, uh, just a bad combination. So it, it um, Restrictive cardiomyopathy, we said, is just this fibrosis often post-radiation is less compliant. Also, is going to be a trouble filling. Notice how wimpy, 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 stretchy this is. Huge old lumen. Here I got a tiny old lumen because I got a big, fat amount of muscle. Um, and you can say the contractility is down here. And another way to put this is that the compliance down is too stiff. Um, fun picture. Enjoy. Um, left side of the heart typically fails first. Yeah, the left side is doing a lot more work. It's, it's this why it's thicker. It's got a, it's just got a harder, you know, taller order. So, um, whether it's a systolic or in other words, like a diet diet for the most part, dilated cardiomyopathy failure, uh, it's a contractility issue. It, it can't pump out enough. Um, or whether it's a, a diastolic issue, it just can't fill well enough. The whole point is you got a low cardiac output, a low stroke volume. Um, so the, the fluid is going to just back up. This is a common motif that we see in the cardiovascular system. Um, the fluid is going to build up. It builds up into the left atrium, and eventually it builds up from there into the pulmonary circuit. And there, if I have too much fluid in the, in the pulmonary circuit, um, the hydrostatic pressure is too large, so it means I'm going to push out way more fluid than I normally do, uh, which is uh, going to cause edema. And if we have edema in the capillary beds of the lungs, um, this uh, leads to uh, dyspnea, uh, trouble breathing. So the issue is that if they, we have fluid that's filling the inside of my alveoli, diffusion doesn't work as well through fluid. So the CO2 that needs to get out and the O2 that needs to get in, this is a harder time diffusing. So I'm getting less CO2 out, less oxygen in. Uh, that's where the trouble breathing comes in. Uh, the fluid is going to accumulate more in the lungs when we're laying down, effectively the preload is larger, leads to increased pulmonary fluid. So orthopnea is difficulty breathing while laying down. Um, and then sometimes you have trouble breathing at night. Um, and again, we're seeing left ventricle builds up into the left atrium, and then that uh, builds up and causes congestion in the lungs. Um, and occasionally, uh, the hypertension here, the high hydrostatic pressures will cause cracks. Some of this blood will leak out. Uh, we have natural macrophages that hang out in the alveoli. They will eat uh, the the um, the heme uh, that comes out, and, and they uh, the you know the hemocytorin from the red blood cells uh, will now be um, swelling the macrophages, and we might see this on an image. Um, okay, on a, on a micrograph, I should say. Uh, so, um, if I have a lot of fluid, uh, in the pulmonary circuit, that means there's a lot of pressure in the pulmonary circuit, which means that the right ventricle now has a a large, like pulmonary afterload that it's got to deal with. So we've seen this before. Um, we kind of saw this with, uh, I think Eisenmenger syndrome for the, 
uh, embryology defects. Um, the right ventricle now is just pumping harder and harder and harder, and it's going to become stronger and stronger and stronger. Um, and and it, it eventually becomes so strong that it hypertrophies, and then we have the same issues that we previously had. If, a, if we have concentric hypertrophy, um, this leads to both systolic uh, dysfunction, um, there's too much oxygen demand, and the coronary squeeze because it's such a large myocardium that it presses into the epicardium and squeezes the coronary so blood can't get through. Probably the bigger one, though, again, for, for uh, concentric hypertrophy is that we just it's so thick with muscle that we just can't fill it very well. And this means that the right ventricle over time is just going to start to fail. And same thing happens. It's going to build up from the right ventricle to the right atrium, and then it builds up into the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava, and um, the venous system is going to get plugged up. So if we go to the superior vena cava, we get this jugular venous distension, JVT. Um, it's going to build up into the liver and the spleen. We're going to get hepatosplenomegaly, um, and then it's going to build up more, and we're going to get ascites. Um, in the abdomen, um, and you get something called a nutmeg liver. Uh, I don't know why, it just looks like that. Um, and it's gonna build up uh, into the legs, the lower extremities as well. Um, and this is gonna cause pitting edema, where you press your finger and then remove it, and then it hangs out for a second. Um, now the the left, um, you know, keep in mind that we still, if we have right heart failure, you, you probably, it's usually left leads to right, but if you have right, you also have left. And if I have left heart failure, I'm not pumping out enough blood. That means that I have uh, probably a low hydrostatic pressure on the arterial side. Um, uh, and so as a result, renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system will kick in and they're going to exacerbate this fluid buildup um, by... Uh, you know, the aldosterone is going to cause sodium reabsorption, which uh, osmosis water reabsorption will follow. So I have more fluid even than I previously had. So heart failure is effectively cardiac output is low. Um, compensation is mechanisms to temporarily improve cardiac output. So um, if cardiac output is uh, stroke volume times uh, heart rate, well, if we increase either of these, we should increase the cardiac output. So Sympathetic nervous system, the heart rate up, the contractility up, this makes the cardiac output up. Uh, if we increase the preload via ROS, right, the aldosterone makes more water reabsorption through the uh, distal collecting or the distal tubule, um, the end diastolic volume is up, which due to Frank Starling mechanisms, that fun in you know, a little graph that we saw, remember the x axis was effectively preload, um, the stroke volume should be up, and that means the cardiac output is up. And uh, a concentric hypertrophy, if we just get more muscle in our myocardium, it's going to have a stronger contraction, more contractility means that the stroke volume is up. Um, but this is, this is like saying, oh yeah, we have like a bunch of trash, like let's burn it. That way we get rid of our like environmental problem, right? But this is going to cause a larger uh, climate issue if we're burning trash. So it's a myopic solution, most of these compensation mechanisms. They are short term. So in the long term, they're actually going to be bad for your heart. Um, so uh, the decompensation, decompensated heart failure is when after a long time, the compensation is actually having an adverse effect. So same mechanisms. If we look at the sympathetic nervous system, just if receptors get stimulated too much in the body, eventually they just go on strike, they quit. Um, best example of this is type 2 diabetes. Insulin receptor, receptors are stimulated from a lifetime of brownies, and eventually they kind of just like retire. They're blunted. They don't work as well. We talked earlier about um, if you have COPD, you have too much CO2, and the peripheral chemoreceptors are going to be less responsive to CO2. So O2 sort of picks up the slack and becomes the dominant receptor for uh, controlling ventilation rate. So the, uh, the, the B type 2, which is, I guess, B type 1 also potentially. So B type 2 is for the uh, beta receptors. It's for the, uh, the vasodilation. B type 1 is for um, the, the heart. So I guess... Uh, uh, I guess maybe a little bit of both. I guess maybe more of the heart is actually what we're thinking of. So B type 1, I'm going to say, is probably going to be the, the dominant one that becomes blunted. Um, heart rate gets too large. This means a shorter diastole, um, which means we, we can't fill uh, during the, with the coronaries. Um, and increased oxygen demand if I'm just pumping too much. Go away. Um, if I have increased oxygen demand. Um, and so, you know, less filling plus increased demand because the heart rate's so high leads to ischemia, leads to death. And this, if I have death of my heart tissue, this means I have even more heart failure, which means I'm going to do even more compensation, which is going to make things even worse. So this is positive feedback going on. Um, 
Okay, what about the second one? What if we increase the preload? More stretch means that they're going to contract more. This increases the oxygen demand. Same thing. Uh, this is going to lead to ischemia, death, more heart failure. Concentric hypertrophy, what could go wrong? If you have more muscle, you have more oxygen demand. Same thing that we just saw. This is going to be a systolic heart failure. Um, oxygen demand plus coronary squeeze means systolic heart failure. Um, additionally, the concentric crowding is going to uh, the thickening is going to crowd the ventricles and we're going to have less room. Uh, this is just diastolic failure. It's everything we've been talking about. So heart failure, is, as I understand it, is like a chronic term for the most part. Um, MI is a short, uh, you know, acute uh, scenario, but cardiogenic shock also seems to be relatively acute as far as I'm aware. So you can think of it as like severe, severe, ultra decompensated heart failure. It's just more on the extreme. Um, and uh, we talked about uh, your heart rate's going to go up. This is a compensation mechanism. You're going to be cold because your blood is trying to divert um, blood flow away from the uh, sort of less important skin extremities and towards the more important uh, visceral organs. Um, the sympathetic nervous system comes in, so you're going to become all clammy and sweaty. Um, and uh, if you have left-sided heart failure, you're going to have an increase in the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and, you know, term there to emphasize is pulmonary, right? The pulmonary circuit gets congested and builds up. Now, if it eventually travels and, and, and progresses to right-sided heart failure as well, well, now I'm not even able to really get it into the, um, to the, the pulmonary circuit. So now I might actually see a decrease here. Cardiac output is down because we got systolic failure. We got diastolic failure. We got a million things that are going wrong. We got a large oxygen demand, coronary squeeze. Um, we're not able to fill properly. Oh, it's a mess. Um, and then the resistance is typically going to go up because I am not pushing out enough blood on the left side of the heart. So the uh, RAAS, Ross system, is going to cause vasoconstriction uh, to try to increase the blood pressure so that I can have an ad adequate perfusion in the tissue capillary beds. Um, and yeah, I guess uh, inotropes, this would be bad, I guess. If it's cardiogenic shock where it's like so extreme and severe, Inotropes are probably bad for your heart, right? The whole point of heart failure is that your heart's stressed out. Let's treat some of the pain off of your heart. Um, this is this is a positive contractility mechanism. So this is going to be bad for the heart in the long term. But I guess if it's an immediate acute cardiogenic shock, I might want my heart to have increased contractility. Um, it's a little bit of a trade-off. Diuresis is maybe I have too much fluid building up in the interstitial fluid. So uh, maybe we can get some of that out. Um, and so the, the therapy for this, so... Um, is, is, yeah, long-term stress off the heart, less preload, because um, let more preload means more contraction. Well, I don't want big contractions if it's long-term chronic heart failure as opposed to cardiogenic shock. Um, I want less afterload because, again, I want it to be easier for it to contract and more coronary blood flow. So the diuretics are going to get rid of fluid so there's less preload, um, less diastolic stress. Um, these ROS inhibitors are going to lower the blood pressure um, and they're going to lower the preload too because aldosterone increases water reabsorption. Uh, so we have less afterload, less demand. Um, and yeah, we just said this. Nitroglycerin, this is a vasodilator. So my coronary circuit is going to become dilated so I can feed the myocardium better. Additionally, it vasodilates the venous system uh, especially. And this means that I'm going to, you, you need the venous system to constrict, to push the blood up into the right atrium, um, into the heart. And so it's also going to decrease the preload nitroglycerin. Beta blockers slow the heart rate. Um, they lower contractility. This is less stress, less oxygen demand, uh, longer diastole so I can get more coronary filling. Sometimes, and this is deb debated, I think this has been over term, but I'm just including it so you guys are aware of the debate. Um, sometimes it's contraindicated in extreme decompensated heart failure, which I'm really just going to call cardiogenic shock. And again, the idea here is of trade-offs. Um, uh, the con of a slower heart rate and lower contractility uh, might offset the benefits. Um, actually, you know, I'm not sure if this one is as debated. I might be thinking of the cocaine one. So this one is still debated. I'm not sure. Um, uh, I'm not sure what the real answer is, but be aware of the controversy. So, um, uh, if I'm an extreme cardiogenic shock, I don't really care about, Hey, like, let's take care of the heart long term. I'm more like this patient is about to die. I do not want to slow their heart rate and lower their contractility because they've got, you know, they've got an hour left unless we do something. So again, there's there's kind of a little bit of a, a, a opposition of interests for heart failure considerations versus cardiogenic considerations. This last section we'll be looking at inflammations and different 
pathogens and, and, and malignancies of the heart. So starting with pericarditis, so uh, the pericardial layer is the sac that, that protects the heart. Um, remember that we have the fibrous pericardium, and then we have the two serous layers of the pericardium, um, the parietal layer and the visceral layer. The visceral pericardium is sometimes just known as the epicardium, and that's where the coronary arteries uh, will uh, uh, spring from. So you can see a little bit of the inflammation there. The itis, of course, means inflammation. And here you can see uh, room in the pericardial sac where we hold fluid. So if fluid builds up slowly in the pericardial sac, often from pericarditis, um, this is a benign effusion and somehow the, the pericardial sac can accommodate, can adjust, and this isn't uh, this is not good, but it, it's not the worst thing in the world. Um, this can progress to cardiac tamponade if fluid builds up too quickly in the pericardial sac in a way that the pericardium can't uh, sort of dilate and adjust over time. Um, High yield in a vignette, it's going to be worse with inspiration. It's relieved by sitting up and leaning forward, uh, and patients will have a friction rub. I think previously, in, in a previous section, I said friction rub, you can hear an auscultation of the lungs. I looked it up a little bit more. Sometimes you can hear it in the lungs, but apparently the best place is between the apex and the sternum is where you'll hear the friction rub. It's this sort of grating sound like sandpaper rubbed on wood, and it's really just a heart. Uh, friction uh, as it moves against the inflamed pericardium. Um, there is widespread ST elevation versus MI, which will be localized to the LAD or the LCX, or the RCA, um, or the PDA, which usually in a right dominant 84% comes from the RCA. Uh, we also have PR depression, which is another way to distinguish this from an MI. Um, often it's idiopathic, but you know what? I'd say the biggest one is viral. So in a vignette, look for somebody who was sick last week, six, two weeks, two weeks ago, has a runny nose, et cetera. Uh, Coxsackie virus B is a major cause. Um, a couple days after an MI, you might have pericarditis, or kind of on the other side, uh, several weeks or months later, you also get it, but it's a different pathophysiology a couple of weeks or months later, it's called Dressler syndrome. It's an autoimmune condition in this case that induces the pericarditis. And here, PR depression, ST segment elevation. And again, it is very important to know that it is widespread. It is diffuse. It is all the leads, not just a couple leads. Um, very fun. Um, so cardiac tamponade uh, often develops from pericarditis uh, and it's where blood compresses the heart um, and, and it just can't fill properly. So here, if we get too much fluid in here too quickly, it'll press on the heart and it can prevent the filling. And it also screws with the contractions. Uh, you know, it's just bad to have uh, fluid uh, filled in the sac compressing the heart. Um, so pericarditis is a big cause. Cancer, again, we're looking for a lot of effusions really quickly. Type 1 aortic dissections, which sort of makes sense. Type 1 versus type 2. Type 1 is ascending. Type 2 is the descending abdominal version. And in the ascending, it, it might sort of trickle back downwards into the pericardial sac. Um, remember that the pericardial sac, you can think of as a, uh, the heart is like a uh, fist going into a balloon. Um, and so that's where we're going to have the visceral uh, uh, pericardium, the epicardium, which is uh, the, the where your hand is in contact with. The space in between the balloons is the pericardial um, space where the fluid is, and then the outside of the balloon is the um, visceral pericardium um, in contact with the fibrous pericardium, not in the balloon analogy. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you think about my fist in the balloon, my my wrist and my forearm, um, those are kind of representative of the aorta. So the aorta needs a way, and you can kind of see it here, right? Here's my pericardium, but boom, this would be where the aorta, where, where my wrist and my forearm are, are leaving. So if I leak blood right on the type 1 aortic dissection, it might leak out and then it might come back down here and fill in this space over here. So type 1 specifically, um, rupture of the ventricular wall. Um, this is 7 to 14 days after an MI. Remember, we also have the pseudoaneurysm, which is also basically a ventricular wall rupture 7 to 14 days. Someone just stabs you in the heart. You know what? That can definitely cause uh, cardiac tamponade. Uh, and post-surgery complication, you get heart surgery. And for whatever reason, uh, you get a, a rupture a couple days or, or a week after or something like that. Um, signs of this, Bex triad. So these, these first two definitely make sense. Hypotension, yeah, you're compressing your heart. It's not going to be contracting effectively for various reasons. Um, jugular venous distension, we have a hard time filling the right ventricle. And so it might build up into the um, uh, superior vena cava, which builds up into the uh, uh, the uh, 
jugular, which is a, a major vein in your neck. Um, and the distension is just the fact that it's swollen because of all of the extra blood that it's trying to accommodate. Um, those, those make sense. Those are go together. This one also makes sense, but it's still a little bit different. Um, you hear these, these muffles, uh, muffled heart sound during auscultation. And that's because all of the fluid is going to affect how the sound is uh, pen, penetrating your, your tissues and getting to your ear. So the, the, the fluid muffles the, the, the sound. So it sounds a little bit distant. Um, Pulses paradoxus. Okay, this is a little bit complicated to explain, but um, during inspiration, the intrathoracic pressure decreases. Um, this means that the right atrium and the right ventricle will, uh, will in, in addition to the fact that we have more oxygen in the pulmonary circuit, which causes the vasodilation to lower pressure. So during inspiration, for two different reasons, we have lots of blood rushing to the right atrium, which means we rush into the right ventricle. This swelling of the right ventricle during inspiration is going to bulge against two things, the interventricular septum and also the pericardial sac. So imagine 50% bulges into the IV septum, 50% of the pericardial sac. Well, bulging to the IV septum means that it's going to then compress into the left ventricle. The left ventricle is going to get smaller because something's budging into it. And this is going to decrease your stroke volume, which decreases your systolic pressure. So normally, forget cardiac tamponade, just normally systolic pressure goes down a little bit during inspiration. Now this effect is exacerbated during cardiac tamponade. Why? Because um, the same, same pathophysiology, um, you're inspire, which means more fluid in your right ventricle, which means it's swelling and it needs to accommodate and it needs to bulge in some direction. This pressure from the, the fluid in the pericardial space is is just so not willing to budge. It, it's just so, so much pressure that you're not, it's not going to accommodate at all, which means earlier I said 50-50. Now it's going to budge way more than it previously did. 100% of the budging goes into the interventricular septum, which means uh, however much smaller the left ventricle uh, in, in the systolic pressure became in the previous example, it's just going to be exacerbated now. So specifically, we'll see a drop greater than 10 millimeters of mercury. Um, we have a low voltage QRS amplitude. Uh, the pericardial fluid is, is hindering normal ventricular contraction. And so we're going to have a, um, and, 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 and the uh, conduction of the signals. So this is just going to have a lower amplitude for that reason. Um, electrical alternons, not only is the amplitude, the, the actual height of it going to be lower, right? So uh, we can see that this is maybe a little bit short, but also the heights are going to be different. Um, that's because the heart's sort of swinging. I imagine it's like being suffocated by the fluid. Um, it's sort of swinging back and forth, back and forth. Like you should be able to tell that this is a normal heart and this one is frantically swinging back and forth because we have all of this fluid which is compressing it. I imagine it like someone being strangled and then just, you know, fighting up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. That's what's going on with the heart. So that is that is the electrical alternons. Um, so uh, a, a little similar to the, um, the uh, pulses paradoxus um, is the Kuzmal sign. Um, so during inspiration, we said that uh, uh, blood wants to flow into the right atrium and the right ventricle and therefore into the pulmonary circuit because of the de decrease in pressure. Um, that still holds true. If you do an inspiration, all of those two, those two same factors, the pulmonary vasodilation and the decrease in intrathoracic pressure, the swelling of the right atrium to the right ventricle and the, um, and the, and the mediastinum all sucks in fluid or tries to suck in fluid from the venous system. But if cardiac tamponade uh, or, or other conditions, constricted pericarditis, restrictive cardiomyopathies, um, uh, right heart failure, uh, pulmonary embolism, et cetera, lots of things can cause this. Um, if, if we have a blockage, so blood is trying to be sucked in, but it just actually has a hard time getting into the right ventricle, the right atrium, it kind of rebounds. And where does it rebound? It rebounds up into the... Um, superior vena cava uh, and into the, uh, the jugular uh, venous, uh, jugular vein. Um, and, and during inspiration now, you actually see a little twitching. And that's just it getting filled with fluid. As the fluid tries to go into the right atrium, it sort of rebounds and goes up to the, um, the, the jugular. Um, so the, the pressure might actually increase, but it might stay the same as well. It's just usually it decreases, and we don't see that here. Uh, so that's Kuzmal's sign. Myocarditis, inflammation of the myocardium. Myocardium is the thickest layer, right? Epicardium, endocardium, and then we have the myocardium, which is most of this. Um, this is going to enlarge the heart. Uh, usually this is viral in origin. 
Coxsackie B is just a common virus we see affect with various heart conditions. Uh, it could also be different types of parasites or bacteria could cause it. Doxorubicin, the chemotherapy drug, uh, uh, does lots of things to the heart. Uh, cocaine does lots of things to the heart, right? It can change the slope for di di diastolic depolarization of Purkinje fibers. It can cause um, vasospasms, which, uh, you know, uh, contribute to uh, angina. Um, uh, myocarditis can also be autoimmune in nature. Um, and it's apparently I read somewhere it's the leading cause of death for people under 40 years for sudden cardiac death where within one hour of symptoms, usually like an arrhythmia that the myocarditis might trigger causes death. Uh, th this, this might be neck and neck with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathies, which is for athletes, young athletes is a, is a common cause of arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death. Um, people are going to present with chest pain and dyspnea. Um, uh, endocarditis, uh, three major types. There's really a fourth major type. So acute is going to be more severe, uh, rapid onset, a couple of days. And this is going to be caused by staph, subacute, less severe, uh, slower onset, and viridens, streptococci. Uh, Libman sacs, I think I have this one actually. This is SLE, systemic uh, lupus uh, erythematosus. Um, so lupus is going to cause Lipman sacs. I believe it's Loeffler's, L O E F F L E R, uh, Loeffler's uh, endocarditis, which is due to autoimmune allergies, anything uh, causing eosinophils to aggregate in, in a tissue. Um, risk factors will be mitral valve prolapse, a bicuspid valve, which we know comes from Turner syndrome, prosthetic or damaged valve, or any other um, congenital uh, defect. Dental procedures, um, you have a lot of bacteria in your mouth, and, and this bacteria during a dental procedure can enter into a uh, systemic circuit and, and go to your heart where it can, uh, you know, um, cause endocarditis, uh, IV drug use as well. We're going to get drugs into our heart. So specifically what happens is we might have damage in the endothelium from uh, hypertension or a bad valve or, or something, something like this. Um, and then we get a clot. So this is platelets and fibrin, which are going to form a clot. And then bacteria shown here go ahead and they grab onto the platelets uh, with adhesins. And then they recruit more bacteria. They form a big old biofilm. So we get, we get vegetation. We just get a growth, a colony of bacteria. That's why things like dental procedures or IV drug use uh, is going to be a risk factor. And then the bad valves are just going to make it more likely that there's damage and there's a place to bind onto in the first place. So where are they specifically going to bind onto? Um, Typically, when we're going through a valve, or you know, I've said it a million times, continuity equation, the velocity speeds up, which means the pressure decreases. So ironically, we actually have a low pressure uh, in this area where we have a high velocity. The pressure is especially going to be lower on this side um, if the, most of the stuff's going through there. Um, so they're going to be here. This is going to be the lowest pressure area that they could find. Um, uh, and so as an example, if I was talking about aortic regurgitation, blood's going through right there. So we might see vegetation on either side of the valve there. Um, and it just looks like this. We get these gross vegetations. Um, so <sighs> IV drug use, a lot of people go IV drug use right-handed side. And that's probably mostly true, especially for a vignette. But just know that IV drug use bacteria still usually causes left-sided endocarditis. Most endocarditis is on the, the mitral valve, maybe the aortic valve over the tricuspid valve. But the difference is that you, you know, someone's going to shoot up into a vein and it's going to go to the uh, right side of the heart first. So, um, most IV-related endocarditis will be left side of the heart. But if you do see a right-sided tricuspid endocarditis, boom, 100%, it was from drugs. So uh, keep that in mind for the vignettes. Um, so from Jane, uh, common symptoms of endocarditis, fever, roth spots, ulcer nodes, murmurs, Janeway lesions, anemia, nail bed hemorrhage, and emboli, uh, septic emboli from bacteria. So what happens is we have these bacteria, uh, you know, have all of this stuff going through, um, and, uh, you know, I have these bacterial uh, colonies, this biofilm forming, and then some of them might break off and then just go with the flow through our systemic circuit. And these emboli are actually responsible for causing all of or most of the other symptoms that we see. Um, so uh, the septic emboli can get caught under the nail beds, cause splinter hemorrhage, hemorrhages. They can get uh, into your, your palms and cause Janeway lesions. So importantly, these are small and painless. This is distinct from Osler nodes. Osler nodes are a lot grosser to look at. They're raised and they're very painful. So I would just say that no, that, that's a common thing. They know this is confusing for students, so uh, this might commonly come up in questions. Um, 
Note that this is just septic emboli on their own, but this is the emboli, uh, you know, which is as an antigen, some protein with an antibody complex. So it's a type 3 hypersensitivity. We also might get Roth spots, which is the type 3 hypersensitivity getting trapped in the eye. Uh, it could also go into the kidneys, contribute to glomerular nephritis. Um, rheumatic fever. So think about immigrants coming in from developing countries. This is going to be a sequela, you know, 10 to 20 years after someone develops rheumatic fever from a streptococci infection. Um, and this is a, a type 2 immune mediated um, autoimmune disorder. So antibodies against the M protein of a streptococci uh, are going to basically mistake innocent myosin as the antigen. So this is a classic molecular mimicry. Um, the mitral valves uh, and the aortic valves are the most common. Early lesions are going to lead to regurgitation and later lesions are going to lead to stenosis. Ashkoff bodies uh, is this large perimeter here. It's a granuloma just filled with giant cells. And any cow, I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, cells or macrophages with wavy rod-like nuclei. You can kind of see here if you zoom in a little bit. Um, so these enlarged macrophages, uh, wavy rod-like nuclei. And uh, we have the Jones criteria for any sort of rheumatic fever. So J, joints, someone's going to have uh, polyarthritis. Um, uh, heart, the O, stupid, is supposed to represent the heart. So this is obviously what we're concerned about. And notice that this is actually most of the symptoms. So most people have rheumatic fever. Uh, the, the, the heart and the arthritis is going to be the main symptoms that we're concerned with. So it's entirely possible someone has rheumatic fever and they don't have the erythema uh, marginatum. So you might have nodules in the skin, you might have erythema, uh, you might have chorea, but for the most part, we're, you can definitely account, account on the uh, arthritis and, and the heart. So because this is a heart NBME, uh, everything's going to be a heart. But if someone has arthritis, um, not a lot of other, if any, uh, diseases that we've, pathologies we've gone over that have included arthritis as a symptom. So this should be a big tell. Um, syphilis, another uh, sort of ticking time bomb, right? So rheumatic fever 10 to 20 years. This is 10 to 30 years after the infection. This would be tertiary end-stage syphilis. It's going to affect lots of different parts of the body, but uh, for right now, we're focusing on the heart. Um, the vasovasorum, remember that the, the the arteries are so large and thick. There's so many layers that it's kind of like with the myocardium, right? The myocardium, it, it can't just get blood from the heart because blood's really bad at diffusing. It can only diffuse to like one or two cells, not hundreds or thousands of cells. So we act, the, the, the blood vessels, the large arteries actually have their own blood supply, the vasovasorum, and this gets disrupted by tertiary syphilis, which causes vessel atrophy because it's not getting enough oxygen, just like if I had an infarction like a... Um, like an end STEMI or maybe even a STEMI. So now that the vessel atrophies, um, uh, and it's usually the aorta, this is going to cause dilation. And calcification is going to be a big one of the aortic root, uh, which we've said it can lead to uh, aortic insufficiency, which really just means aortic regurgitation um, and the aortic arch. You get this kind of tree bark appearance is how it might be described. Um, all this calcification over here kind of looks like tree bark. Um, and then cancers, uh, myxoma is going to be the adult tumor uh, often found in atria. This is sometimes said to have a ball valve appearance. And I'm not a cool enough manly man to know what a ball valve is exactly, but I Googled it. That's a ball valve and that's our cancer. And they kind of look similar by it. Um, this is associated with syncope, IL-6 production. Uh, and you're going to hear what's, what's described as a tumor plop sound. And if you think about it, it's it's in the atria. So this should be a diastolic um uh, uh, murmur, uh, right? Because the atria fills the ventricles during diastole, so uh, diastolic. Um, and then for kids, they're just going to have rhabdomyoma. Uh, this is associated with tuberous sclerosis, which we'll talk more about in the neuro unit, but not a lot to talk about right here. And here we got this big old thing in the left atrium. That is our myxoma. Antihypertensives. Let's go. Um, a lot of drugs here. So what causes hypertension in the first place? Um, increased vascular resistance, obviously, uh, increased venous return, uh, arguably. So this is going to mean, I guess, two things. One, that we're going to increase the preload, which increases the cardiac output, which also is going to increase the, the uh, pressure uh, in your, your systemic circuit. On top of that, I mean, think about it. We have the arterial side and the venous side. What's higher pressure? The arterial side. So if I have increased venous return, that means it's moving through the venous system more quickly, which means that the, you know, proportionally I'm going to have more blood in the arterial system than normal if they increased venous return. So double reasons why this might also increase hypertension. Increased blood volume also increases the cardiac output, also increases hypertension. Um, so solutions to this, vasodilators and renin-angiotensin aldosterone system inhibitors. Vasodilators, especially nitrates. Why? Because nitrates disproportionately affect the venous system. So it's going to cause venous dilation, which inhibits venous return. Diuretics and RAS are also going to be good for blood volume. 
verap mill and diltiazem are specific uh, L calcium channel blockers that, that disproportionately affect the heart. And then beta blockers, um, which are going to affect the heart rate and the stroke volume, heart rate maybe a little bit more. Um, so we can really just bundle these into four categories. And let's go through these one by one. So within vasodilators, there's just already so many mechanisms of action. Uh, I'm specifically talking about the non-renin-angiotensin dilations, because technically those are also vasodilators, but let's, let's table those for now. We'll get to those. So L-type calcium channel blockers, uh, I know I just said that, but I was talking about Vratmil and Diltiazem. Uh, those are non-dihydropyridines. These are dihydropyridines, which are more going to be for the smooth muscle as opposed to the cardiac muscle. Um, alpha-1 blockers, which sort of are going to block the effects of uh, norepinephrine, beta-2, and uh, dopamine agonists, which are going to mimic the effects of epinephrine. CMGP elevators, hydralazine, nitrates, nitroprusside, sildenafil, and lastly, uh, sacupitril. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing all this, but who cares? Um, this is going to lead to more angiotensin II and also significantly more of our uh, natriuretic peptides. Um, so we're going to pair these with an angioretension receptor blocker, which we will get to. Um, uh, all right, don't freak out. We're going we're gonna to dissect this, uh, take these things out one by one. All right, let's start here. So GQ pathway. These are G-protein coupled receptors. Um, this is going to get our G-alpha, which is going to activate phospholipase C, which uh, cleaves a um, uh, diacyl glycerol into a, uh, um, or a PIP2 into diacyl glycerol and IP3. IP3 is going to go to the sarcoplasmic reticulum and open up a ligand gated calcium channel so calcium can go out. Um, who does this? Let's just say it's norepinephrine. Norepinephrine, this is an alpha 1 receptor. So this is alpha 1. Alpha is strong. I'll come back to this. Endothelin is probably the biggest contributor to this. Angiotensin II binds here, vasopressin binds here as well. Um, remember that this is norepinephrine over epinephrine. The fact that alpha does not have any E's and norepinephrine has no E's. Um, so uh, calcium, just look. Whether Also, please note that this is vascular smooth muscle. Pretty much everything I've talked about in this lecture has been cardiac muscle, a little bit about skeletal muscle. Maybe we briefly talked about cardiac or the, the vascular smooth muscle, but this is a smooth muscle cell. Below it, we have an endothelial cell and below this, we have the vascular lumen, which means the blood is over here. Blood, blood is flowing all around here on the bottom. Um, okay, so this is talking about a smooth muscle contraction for constriction or dilation of a blood vessel. Um, let's continue. More calcium, I said, no matter what type of the three muscle cells we're dealing with, almost always means more contraction. How in this case? It pairs with calmodulin, which activates MLC kinase. And this is kind of a, you know, different than what you're used to on the MCAT. Um, here, myosin being phosphorylated teams up with actin uh, to cause a contraction. We don't have to worry about calcium binding to troponin or any of that stuff. Not as, not as far as I'm aware. Maybe it's true, but I just, I don't know. And it's not something we're responsible to know. So, um, alt another way we can, so this is one way you can get a contraction through these GQ alpha one receptors. Um, alternatively, just a L voltage, uh, gated calcium channel, uh, a dihydropyridine channel, um, will allow calcium. And again, more calcium just means more contraction. Um, the, uh, going over to the other side, to the relaxation dilation side, uh, we have our GS agonist. So here, G protein coupled receptor activates G alpha, the heterotrimeric uh, proteins. G alpha is going to move over to denylate cyclase. Denylate cyclase generates CAMP, uh, and CAMP is going to do a bunch of different things. Here, CAMP is inhibiting MLC kinase, which we needed to phosphorylate myosin to get a contraction, which means we're going to have the unphosphorylated myosin, which is not contracting, so we are relaxing. Um, and uh, notice that phosphodiesters can undo this effect. Um, we also have the endothelial cells, which can, uh, with arginine's help, they can generate nitric oxide, which can diffuse over, and this can help uh, convert uh, GTP into cyclic GMP, cyclic GMP, which uh, now stimulates, so positive versus negative, this now stimulates a phosphatase. So inhibiting the kinase and stimulating the phosphatase are going to have the same general effect. I'm going to be in the relaxation, non-phosphorylated myosin phase. Um, 
All right, too long, didn't read. Uh, the left side is associated with uh, more calcium. More calcium means more phosphorylated myosin, which means more contraction. More contraction is going to mean we have constriction, we have narrowing of the blood vessel, and this causes the blood pressure to go up. Uh, this other side is against uh, myosin being phosphorylated, which causes a relaxation, which is a dilation, which means that the uh, blood pressure will go down. Um, so uh, important to know who is an alpha-1 receptor binder, um, who is a uh, GS. Uh, notice that this is a beta-2 binder. Um, and let's actually focus on, on the epi for a second. So like, okay, let's say I release some catecholamines. Catecholamines are supposed to cause like net vasoconstriction. Yeah, they cause some vas vasodilation in certain parts of your body and vasoconstriction in other parts of your body, but it's a net vasoconstriction. And how do we get that if we have epinephrine and norepinephrine in equal amounts? Um, First of all, they might not be in equal amounts, but let's table that. Uh, let's pretend they're in equal amounts. Um, the idea is that, so I said, we'll come back to this. Alpha is strong, beta is weak. The alpha-1 receptor constriction is more dominant over the beta-2 receptor vasodilation. So that that is important. Um, okay, well, let's, let's go to the next thing. What if I have a beta blocker? Beta blockers are supposed to um, reduce... Let's say it's a, it's a non-selective beta blocker. So it's B1 and B2, um, and forget about A. It's just interacting with B1 and B2. B1, it's gonna, B1 is stimulating the heart. B2 is causing vasodilation. So if I inhibit both of those, uh, causing the heart to work less hard, and I'm also gonna inhibit vasodilation, which causes actually a beta constriction. I'm gonna say that again. Non-selective beta receptor blockers are going to cause a mild vasoconstriction. But the emphasis on mild, that is overshadowed, the B2 effect, by the B1 effect. So B1 is the name of the game for beta blockers. What they do with beta 2 is not as important at all. On top of that, a third thing, uh, two beta blockers that we'll get into are going to have uh, are going to be non-selective, like even more non-selective. So non-selective in the sense that they actually have no preference for alpha or beta binding. So they will inhibit alpha receptors and beta receptors. And um, again, beta two is the it's weaker than beta one and it's weaker than alpha one. So forget about it. Uh, if you look at the super non-selective beta receptors, I'm inhibiting alpha one, which means I'm inhibiting vasoconstriction, causing a vasodilation, reduces pressure. That's what we want. Of uh, reducing the afterload, we're trying to take pressure off the heart. Additionally, this is also going to inhibit the beta one receptors of the heart, so its contractility uh, and its rate are going to go down, which allows it more time to refill during diastole, all that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Woo. Okay, glad I got that out of the way. Elephant in the room. Um, all right, let's look at, uh, so alpha-1 blockers specifically. So specific alpha-1, forget about beta, doxazosin and prazosin. Um, sildenafil is going to inhibit PDE5. This phosphodiesterase is trying to convert CGMP into GTP, which would uh, inhibit this, which would cause a contraction. Um, and, or sorry, so uh, yeah, that's what PDE5 does. But this is inhibiting the inhibitor. So long story short, Sildenafil increases the amount of CGMP we have, which increases relaxation. What is the effect of more blood flow for Viagra? Somehow it disproportionately affects like the penis. Blood flowing into the penis is going to cause an erection. And um, so that's the whole point of Viagra. And uh, bu -bu -bu, uh, yeah, the dipenes are going to be calcium channel blockers. So we're going to go through these uh, a little bit more. Um, also notice that uh, just another mnemonic, uh, beta 2. So if we're just thinking about vasodilation, the alpha 1 versus beta 2, alpha has no E, so we know it's no epinephrine. Um, and for the, the beta 2, we see that there is an E, so this is for epinephrine. And again, this is specifically for the uh, alpha 1, beta 2 uh, exchange, which is has to do with vasodilation, vasoconstriction. Now, what about beta 1 versus beta 2? I always think of 1 comes before 2, and the heart becomes before the vessels, like the arteries. Um, uh, whoo, yeah, okay. Calcium channel blockers, we already went over this. The dihydropyridines, the dipenes are amlodipine and nephidipine. So the idines, idines, dipenes, dipenes, kind of checks out. Verapamil and diltiazem are for the heart. So those are non-dihydropyridines. They're in a different category. So forget about them. Um, at the end of the day, remember, calcium in the heart means contraction. So no calcium, no contraction. We're preventing contraction, which means we have a dilation. We want to reduce the blood pressure. This whole section is antihypertensive medications. Um, all right, you should probably know this, but uh, right now, let's just keep it a little bit simpler. Even more simpler. Forget about alpha-2, not important. So for alpha-1, 
This is going to be for constriction. This is pro-vessel constriction, increasing blood pressure. This is norepinephrine over norepinephrine. And remember that alpha has no E, this has no E. All right, what about beta-2? Beta-2 is for vessel dilation. Uh, this has an E, which means we're dealing with epinephrine, uh, not so much norepinephrine. Uh, this is going to uh, 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 lower, the blood lower the blood pressure. So raise the blood pressure, lower the blood, well, blood pressure. <laughs> and this is, you know, of course, the opposite effect if we're talking about blockers. Beta 1, 1 comes before 2, the heart becomes before the vessels. Um, equally epinephrine and norepinephrine effects. It's, I think that's really important to know, not just for this test, you're just going to keep coming up again and again and again in, in future sections. Um, we talked about this. These two are alpha blockers. Fun. Um, all right. This, uh, so a lot of these are, are causing, um, you're stimulating GS. Uh, we might recognize a lot of these as vasodilators, maybe not epinephrine, but it's good to know that epinephrine is actually a vasodilator. Um, uh, adenosine is a, an important vasodilator, but now there's a random one, phenaldopam. It's actually a dopamine receptor, but uh, somehow it can vasodilate very similar to the beta 2. So I'm just going to treat it as interchangeable. Um, so these four things are going to elevate CGMP levels. So hydralazine, I don't really know the mechanism, somehow elevates this, uh, which activates this, which causes relaxation, vasodilation, lower blood pressure. Um, nitrates, nitrates can uh, sort of, I don't know if they generate NO or they mimic NO, because I think it's just usually just NO3 minus, but not important. Um, they're going to cause NO to increase, which causes more CGMP, which causes this to be activated, which again causes relaxation. So really the same effect. Nitroprusside, um, uh, the, the press side here is also just increasing NO, which does the same thing. And then sildenafil, we said, is inhibiting PDE5, which is trying to degrade CGMP. Uh, so we have more CGMP, which means we have more MLC phosphatase, which means we have more relaxation, more dil uh, dilation. Now, you're not supposed to uh, pair nitrates with sildenafil um, because uh, this is going to be like a synergistic increase in CGMP, which means we have massive vasodilation, which means you're going to have massive hypotension. So you cannot pair these together. Um, additionally, keep in mind that the nitrate vasodilation uh, has a larger effect on the veins, which is going to decrease the preload um, and less stress at the heart, lower the blood pressure. So sacubitril uh, is a neprilysin inhibitor. What the heck's a neprilysin? Neprilysin is a uh, proteolytic degradative enzyme that breaks down many different things, specifically what we're concerned with angiotensin II and the natriuretic peptides. So that's gonna. Um, so I'm inhibiting the thing that breaks both of these down, which means I'm gonna get more angiotensin II, and I'm also gonna get more AMP and more BNP. Well, let's think about what the effects of these are. Angiotensin II constricts blood vessels and it calls for uh, um, aldosterone, which raises sodium levels, which, which causes osmosis, which raises the blood volume and preload. Um, AMP and BMP completely counteract those uh, two effects. They're going to cause vasodilation. They're also going to inhibit the effects of aldosterone. Um, and if you think about the name, uh, nat means sodium and uretic means peeing out. We're going to pee out sodium, which means we pee out more water. That's how you can remember it's the exact opposite effect. But if this is causing increased blood pressure, and these are causing decreased blood pressure, if I have a uh, neprilysin inhibitor, which is sacubitril, uh, shouldn't that, isn't that kind of a wash? Doesn't that break even? Yeah, I suppose it would. So which is important why we have to pair this with an angiotensin Two receptor blocker. So now I'm actually blocking this. So we just have these. So we are actually decreasing the blood pressure, which is our overall goal. Um, all right. The <coughs> liver makes angiotensinogen. Enogen is a zymogen. It's not active. The kidney makes renin. Renin activates angiotensinogen and angiotensin 1. Lungs make ACE. ACE is angiotensin converting enzyme, converts one to two. Angiotensin two goes ahead and causes vasoconstriction, which increases blood pressure. It also goes to the adrenal gland and it recruits aldosterone, which causes sodium reabsorption in the kidneys, which importantly raises the amount of water in the blood. The water in the blood is going to raise the blood pressure. Um, that is the RAAS, renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So this drug kills renin, stops the whole thing, lowers the blood pressure. So we're talking about the RAAS inhibitors now. Um, an ACE inhibitor uh, is, uh, you know, I just substitute the CE for PR and add an L. So uh, anything that is in pril, 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 inhibits ACE, no angiotensin II, lowers the blood pressure. Boom. Angiotensin II receptor blockers, also known as ARBs. Um, this is 
uh, Losartan, Candesartan, Valsartan. I just think of Sartan as in like Spartan. And I, I always thought of Angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2, in my opinion, is really doing, it actually does a lot of stuff. It interacts with the heart. It goes this. I always thought of this as like the beast. It's the most dominant of the RAAS uh, system. And so I imagine that if you want to take down angiotensin uh, 2, you're going to need a really, really tough drug. And that's where these Spartan drugs come in to take away the angiotensin 2. Uh, usually this is people who are refractory, who are not responding to ACE inhibitors. So it's usually going to be secondary. Um, diuretic. So um, we had the vasodilators that were non-ROS. Now we have, then we had the ROS and now we're going to have diuretics. Um, we have loop diuretics, thiazide diuretics, and you have potassium sparing diuretics. Uh, we will come back to this, uh, um, actually, no, th th this, yeah, we'll come back to this. <laughs> um, yeah, so thiazide is going to be, uh, probably our main go-to because of a lot of side effects the other ones have. Um, the loop diuretics is furosemide and the potassium sparing is spironolactone. Um, so specifically sp spironolactone is, um, it's an aldosterone an antagonist. Um, and it is, um, so you can, one, you can think of it as a diuretic Two, You could technically think of it as a renin angiotensin aldosterone system inhibitor because aldosterone is, you know, this is going to be playing a role in diuresis, but also a role in the, in the Ross system. So it, it, who cares about categorization? Just, it could theoretically fall under either of those umbrellas. So, um, this drug works by mimicking aldosterone. Notice it ends in own. It is one of those nonpolar, um, hydrophobic, you know, things like testosterone, progesterone, um, cortisone, aldosterone. These are cholesterol, steroid derived. Um, it's going to, which one is which? Can you tell? Neither can the cell, right? So technically, this one is aldosterone, this one is baronolactone, and this one is testosterone. The idea is it is an antagonist to. Um, aldosterone, which is uh, how we get the antihypertensive effects, but it's also going to uh, screw with the testosterone and estrone effects, which is going to cause uh, some side effects that we'll get to. Heart inhibitors for, I'm sure there's a better way to put it. Um, you could just say negative anotropes or, or negative chronotropes, who cares? Um, calcium channel blockers. Now again, L-gated, these are non-dihydropyridines. We're talking about rapamil, we're talking about diltaism. Uh, and the beta-1 blockers, um, again, beta-1 blockers might be interacting with beta-2, might be interacting with alpha. We'll get to that. Anything ending in allo or allol is going to be a beta blocker. Um, so uh, these two, non-hydro L-type, um, these are also known, we're going to see these, these are type 4 antiarrhythmics. So type 4 antiarrhythmics are also calcium channel blockers. They're technically antihypertensive. They're also antiarrhythmics. So uh, it's going to slow down phase two, um, which is relying on calcium influx. Uh, and so we're going to have a weaker contraction, and that's it's taking a little bit of stress off the heart, and it's going to reduce the blood pressure as well. Um, now, this calcium influx, remember the L-type calcium channels are both in pacemaker and in the cardiac myocytes, unlike the T, which are just in the pacemaker. So this is also going to block the pacemaker L channels, uh, and it's going to slow their conduction. It's going to you know maybe elongate their repolarization. And um, this might lead to an AV block uh, of the, um, uh, just might cause an AV block uh, for, for that reason. So beta-1, uh, again, is heart stimulation, 1 before 2, heart before vessels. Um, and and beta-1, usually when we say beta blockers, we're, again, we're mostly just talking about the effects on the heart. Yeah, other effects might be there, but we're mostly concerned with the heart effects. So um, it's going to be, a, uh, uh, so a beta receptor is going to increase the contractile force, positive inotropy. It is going to increase the uh, rate of contraction, so positive chronotrope. Um, and uh, so, so technically, um, when I say slower conduction, really what I'm talking about is the beta blockers are going to undo this and undo this through slower conduction. So um, beta increases all this crap and the beta blockers undo all of this crap. And um, too much beta receptor activation or, or inhibition could also lead to arrhythmias. Um, so uh, remember that we have uh, phase four, the funny current sodium comes in. Uh, then we have the T, timely calcium channels. Uh, they then quickly close in the L, which is, I think, of late because they're later, but they're also longer lasting L calcium channels open, specifically pacemaker cell. This is going to be an influx. Calcium comes in, they close, then the uh, potassium channels open. So after we depolarize, now we're going to repolarize, and this is effectively going to uh, designate what the heart beat heart rate should be. Uh, most important, the diastolic depolarization that we have here in phase um, four. 
So um, the way that the um, uh, catecholamines work is by altering um, phase four slope or phase uh, or phase four slope. It's going to increase it with sympathetic, and it's going to decrease it with the um, uh, with the vagus or or parasympathetic. Um, so that's the effects on, so the beta blockers are, are inhibiting those effects. So the vagal is going to be really, you know, if we inhibit the sympathetic, this is going to be the same thing as the beta blocker. So we're going to have a slower uh, phase four slope for our beta blockers. So that's the pacemaker. What about the cardiac myocytes? Um, we are going to have, uh, <laughs> I should say weaker. So beta one is going to cause stronger contractions. Um, we're going to have more CAMP, which stimulates ryanodine receptor, dihydropyridine receptor. So this is L-gated calcium. Calcium gets into the cell. More calcium in the cell means more contraction. Specifically here, calcium-induced calcium release is going to interact with the ryanodine receptor, which un unleashes calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. To the circa protein is trying to pump calcium after contraction back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's going to, it's lucitropy, it's relaxation so that we can have more calcium in for a subsequent following contraction. Phospholamban inhibits that. Well, you know what? Beta one inhibits that which inhibits which means more circ which means more relaxation which means better contractility um and we talked about the the pace just now and again beta one blockers are just undoing all this crap um so for beta blockers uh this i think is really helpful a to m is going to be a beta one selective so in other words beta one effect is more than beta two again that should always be kind of a default assumption that beta one's a little bit more than beta two even when we're equally affecting beta two beta two is just not that strong compared to beta one but beta one is is you know just think of it as the beta one so for the first half of the alphabet notice a b b e m um Esmolol here is bolded because this is very fast acting so this is giving it an intravenously in an emergency setting um m to z um, this is going to be for the second half of the alphabet, nitalol, pindalol, propanolol, timolol. This is beta one and beta two. So if I'm inhibiting beta two, remember that beta two is a vasodilator means it's going to be causing a little bit of vasoconstriction. So that is going to increase the blood pressure. But again, remember that is offset by the decrease in blood pressure that is achieved by inhibiting the contractility and, and heart rate, um, that the beta one will induce. So non-selective so you know this is non-selective but this is really non-selective like i'm open-minded but you're really open-minded so this is alpha and beta um there is no olol this is i think really helpful right everything else was olol 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 etc this is now ilol alol they just gotta be different so um remember that this is inhibiting beta 2 and inhibiting alpha 1 right we have a vasodilation uh, for beta 2 and a, and a vasoconstriction for alpha 1. So if I'm hitting both of those, is it a watch? No, remember alpha means strong, beta means weak. So the alpha 1 effects are going to be over, are going to overshadow and dominate the beta 2 effect. So that I'm inhibiting alpha 1 that has a really large effect um, compared to inhibiting uh, uh, beta 2. Alpha 1 wants to vasoconstrict. So if I inhibit it, it's going to cause a vasodilation. Whew! All right, so just to kind of tie this up a little bit, beta blockers. If I have a selective, um, uh, you know, again, this is the first half of the alphabet. Um, this atenolol and metoprolol are going to uh, decrease the contractility and heart rate, which decreases the cardiac output, which lowers the blood pressure. Yet, non-selective might even work better. Uh, remember, these are the ones that don't end in olol, alol and illol. Um, and yes, same effects on the heart because these are non-selective. They're going to affect beta, but they're also going to affect the alpha. And remember that the, we don't really care about the beta 2 compared to the alpha 1. So by inhibiting the vasoconstriction, we're causing a vasodilation. This is going to decrease systemic vascular resistance, also known as TPR, total peripheral resistance, and it's going to lower the, the blood pressure. Additionally, I would know that beta 1 also stimulates um, the, the kidneys to secrete renin, which activates the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So with our beta blockers, we're inhibiting beta one, and this is going to lower the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. I don't actually know why that's not shown over here, but who cares? But that is just maybe another effect of beta one as well. Um, antihypertensives. So, uh, let's just go through a little summary. Um, L type calcium channel blockers, dihydropyridines known as Dipenes. Alpha-1 blockers with azosin. Beta-2, which is really just a dopamine agonist, is phenaldepam. CGMP, we had four. Hydralazine, nitrates, nitroprusside, and sildenafil. 
as if you're an EMT, you give this to people a lot. Um, but remember not to pair it with people at Viagra. Remember that Jack Nicholson bit from like, it's complicated or whatever the movie is. Um, uh, something's got to give, I don't remember. They're all the same. They're all delightful, but they're all the same. Um, this inhibits the breakdown of AMP and BMP and also inhibits the breakdown of angiotensin two. Um, those would offset one another if we did not pair it with an angiotensin receptor blocker. So we just have the A and B, AMP and BMP left over. Um, the blocking the renin system, uh, let's just kill renin. Let's kill the angiotensin converting enzyme with the prills. Let's block the uh, angiotensin res- two, which is the, the the really tough one. So we need a Spartan of a drug, the artins, the sartins to to uh, counteract this. And then aldosterone uh, is counteracted by spironolactone. Loop diuretics. Um, it's really just it should say diuretics. Diuretics. We have one loop furosemide. We have the thiazide, which has chlor or thiaz in the name, and then the potassium sparing diuretics. Um, spironolactone. Remember that there's kind of a link here. Who cares where we categorize it? Just know what it does. Um, <laughs> heart slowers. I love it. Uh, calcium channel blockers. Uh, these are type four antiarrhythmics, um, specifically of rapamil and diltaism. These are non-dihydropyridines. Uh, beta two blockers are type two antiarrhythmics. Olol means that we're dealing with the first half. Uh, or, so they all end in olol, but now more specifically, if I'm the first half of the alphabet in terms of the name for the beta blocker, it's beta one selective over beta two. Remember that even if it does affect beta two, beta two effect is counteracted by the beta one. Um, so the non-selective is going to be the second half of the alphabet, like propanolol, and this is going to be beta one and beta two equally. And then if it's fancy pantsy suffix ilol or alol, then it's going to be a and b. And remember that for the, what we're really concerned with is that, uh, or interested in, is the fact that this is going to inhibit the alpha one receptor. Alpha one causes vasoconstriction, so this causes a vasodilation in addition to slowing down the heart. So it's sort of like doubly useful. Um, side effects: <laughs> if you have all these vasodilators and anti ROS things, this could cause hypotension, right? Maybe it goes too far, right? You want to lower the blood pressure, maybe it lowers it too far. In addition, if you lower the blood pressure, you might have a uh, like a bare reflex response where a, a compensatory tachycardia develops. Um, and again, do not pair nitrates with sildenafil, as shown in this fun Jack Nicholson movie, uh, causes massive vasodilation and, and hypotension. Um, the, uh, the, the Spartans, the kill renins, and the prills, aprils, um, uh, these can cause hyperkalemia. Why? Because aldosterone, yes, it reabsorbs sodium, yes, it reabsorbs water, it also secretes potassium. And so if I don't have aldosterone working, I'm gonna have more potassium, it's not being secreted, which means I'm gonna have hyperkalemia. Um, and again, hyperkalemia can affect the heart rate in various ways. It's going to slow the phase um, uh, zero upstroke, and it's going to uh, increase the, the phase three downstroke, and it's going to shorten the refractory period. Um, and it can be counteracted by insulin and uh, calcium. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, fun. Uh, ACE inhibitors, angioedema. Why? Because ACE also breaks down bradykinin. Bradykinin causes dilation, especially dilation of the face, which we can see here. This thiazide diuretics uh, cause, ooh, excuse me, causes the opposite. Hypokalemia, uh, potassium sparing diuretics. It's in the name. Uh, this is going to cause uh, an increase in calcium. Why? Well, remember, these are just the same thing. This is really just this, right? This effect, we was, because um, aldosterone's effect is not being heard, uh, this is more direct. This is just literally directing the aldosterone. So it's going to cause the exact same thing. In addition, remember that um, spironolactone also kind of mimics testosterone and estrone. So we might get gynecomastia and amenorrhea. So, um, um, you know, men might de- develop breasts and, and uh, women's periods might stop. Um, calcium channel blockers, gingival hyperplasia, I think is pretty specific. Um, and then the nine di- dihydropyridines, the AV block, because the calcium is necessary for a conduction velocity and refractory period for a pacemaker cell. Um, nitro press side, uh, randomly has cyanide that gets released beta blockers, uh, type two, uh, or yeah. And calcium channel is type four, uh, AV block, um, uh, Sometimes, so this is a debate um, that I think has been overturned, but we'll just talk about it. Um, so sometimes people say if somebody shows up to the ER uh, and they've been doing a lot of cocaine and they also have a heart issue, you don't want to give them beta blockers. Why? Because cocaine causes uh, alpha vasoconstriction. And if I give somebody a beta blocker, assuming it's not one of those super duper open minded non selective ones where it's just affecting the beta system, um, if I am inhibiting a beta 2, 
So let's say that this is the second half of the alphabet, like propanol. So uh, beta 1 and beta 2 equally. Um, let's just forget about beta 1, focus on beta 2. If it inhibits beta 2, it's inhibiting the vasodilation, which means we're inhibiting vasodilation in, in addition to the fact that cocaine is massively uh, constricting via an alpha-1 mechanism. So this could cause uh, a, a hypertensive crisis, massive vasoconstriction. Um, so sometimes the people say that this is a contraindicated. I think this is debated. Maybe it's been overturned. I don't really know. But just uh, maybe just be aware of it. Um, hypoglycemic masking. Um, people often develop hypoglycemia for whatever reason on beta blockers. And this... Um, I guess it makes sense if you think about the fact that beta blockers, uh, um, the catecholamines are going to be responsible for breaking down glycogen. And if you don't break down glycogen and put it into the, um, uh, the, the, the blood, then you might become hypoglycemic. Somehow the beta blockers mask this though, so it's hard to tell. In any case, you might want to supplement with things like glucagon to increase the blood sugar just to be on the safe side. Let's talk antiarrhythmics. So there are four classes of antiarrhythmics. Um, first one has to do with sodium influx. Uh, the second one is beta blockers. The third one is potassium efflux phase three. And then the last one is our calcium channel blockers, specifically the non-dihydropyridines. So just a, a refresher on, on how the action potentials work. Uh, these are our pacemaker cells and these are our cardiac myocytes. Um, phase four is our diastolic depolarization. Um, in, in here, we will have a funny sodium current that slowly leaks in. Now, the rate at which the funny current, um, the slope here is really going to be what determines the heart rate, typically uh, originating from, hopefully originating from the SA node. At that point, L-gated calcium channels were open. Um, notice, note that L calcium channels are also the ones that we might see in uh, cardiac myocytes. Um, so calcium floods in, that's our phase zero, and then those close and the potassium channels open and that's our phase three. For the cardiac myocytes, we do not have a diastolic depolarization unless we're a Purkinje fiber, in which case it's a slight uptick and it's particularly sensitive to things like electrolytes and cocaine and, and stress and whatnot. So phase zero is much sharper, much faster. This is the voltage-gated sodium channels. These are fast. Note as well that the uptick, how much positive ions are flooding into the cell, these are going to move through the gap junctions from one cardiac myocyte to another. This is what stimulates the next domino to fall, the next cardiac myocyte to fire. So this is particularly important for conduction velocity between cells and from, you know, one side of the heart to the other. Um, quickly, we, we have a, a little bit of, uh, yeah, let's just kind of put these together. So a little bit of potassium comes in and then quickly it's balanced out, or potassium leaves, and then it's balanced out by uh, calcium coming in at the same rate that potassium is coming out. That is our phase two. And then we have these delayed rectifier potassium channels where potassium is leaving as the calcium channels are shut off, and then this is going to fall back down. Um, so the beta blockers are specifically affecting the funny current of the pacemaker cells and then the calcium coming in for the cardiac myocytes. Uh, class one is really just affecting the cardiac, cardiac myocytes sodium coming in. Um, class three is affecting the potassium efflux for the cardiac myocytes. And um, uh, ba -ba -ba. phase four is affecting um, the calcium coming in for the cardiac myocytes. Also the calcium a little bit for the, um, uh, for the pacemaker cells. Note as well that on an EKG, I've said this before, but this is not showing um, pacemaker cells. It's really only showing cardiac myocytes. Um, so we're less concerned with bradyarrhythmias and more concerned with tachyarrhythmias. Just in general, there's more causes, and that's why our antiarrhythmics are mostly trying to slow down our heart. So a couple different ways you can get it. Abnormal automaticity. So maybe automaticity increases because you're running, or maybe, maybe you're stressed, and so you have too much sympathetic stimulation, too much catecholamines. This is going to increase our phase four slope for the pacemaker cells. Alternatively, triggered activity, uh, sometimes called um, like early after depolarization, um, is where... Uh, either early or, or towards the end of a depolarization, um, somehow that that action potential triggers another action potential, which of course we shouldn't have. Um, so a delayed phase three is going to elongate this. This is going to be a, so a delayed phase three and phase two is associated with a long QT, and this can lead to a torsade de point. And then the reentry circuit. We have two different types. Um, we have a global reentry circuit, 
also known as the atrioventricular reentry uh, tachycardia. An example is Wolf Parkinson White, where there's a uh, accessory pathway uh, called the bundle of Kent, and we can just get this nice little loop here. Um, and and if anybody's confused about this, I went ad nauseum into detail in the arrhythmia and actual potential section uh, about all of this. So. Uh, feel free to have another look. Um, and then a local reentry circuit, a uh, classic example is the AVNRT, the nodal reentry tachycardia, specifically at the AV node. Um, this is the most common supraventricular tachycardia. This is the second most common. Um, and any, so the reentry circuits in general are going to be the main cause of tachyarrhythmias. And they're, they're resulting from inequities in conduction velocity, refractory period, um, phase zero, phase two, blah, 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 you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, I, you know, this is debatable, but I like to think of like what happens. So the first thing to happen in a pacemaker cell is the funny current. Even though I know it's called phase zero, I think it was the first thing to happen. Um, the second thing to happen is that the calcium runs in, depolarizes it. That's the action potential. Third thing to happen is it repolarizes with the potassium. For the cardiac myocytes, the first thing to happen is the fast action potential. Unlike the pacemaker, which is a slow action potential, this is a very fast one. And then the calcium going, um, this should say the calcium going in with the potassium going out are going to balance uh, one another. So that, that's where we have this phase two plateau. And then eventually calcium channels shut off and more delayed rectifier potassium channels turn on and we have a potassium channel uh, flux, uh, and then that is our repolarization. So when I'm thinking about the drugs, class one, um, sodium is the first thing to happen. So I think that that makes sense that that's class one. Class two, I just think of the beta blockers, B is two. Class three, I think of the fact that the th potassium channels are the third thing to happen in both scenarios. In class four, this one's a little bit of a stretch. C is three, A is one, three plus one is four. Cool. Um, so the, as I mentioned, the sodium channels are associated with the cardiac myocytes. Um, the, the beta blockers are associated with both cardiac myocytes and the pacemaker cells, a little bit more of the pacemaker cells than the cardiac myocytes. Um, the class three is the cardiac myocytes, and then the class four is, again, both of them, but with a little bit more of an emphasis on the pacemaker cells. So um, uh, if we're looking at now sodium channel blockers, uh, what they're going to do is slow the phase zero, uh, the conduction velocity. And again, this might not look like a huge proportion of the overall action potential, um, but again, phase zero is mostly going to, into, going to dictate how quickly the action potential spreads from one neuron or one cardiac myocyte to the next. So um, how quickly the dominoes are falling. So uh, this is going to have an effect on, on how quickly the current goes from, you know, uh, the atria to the ventricles. Um, and uh, we have three different subtypes within this. Uh, you know, it's A, B, C, but I like to say C, A, B. Um, and why is that? It's because this is depolarizing the most. So this is going to be um, uh, a better way of putting this is that the slope of phase zero is going to be the uh, the smallest. Uh, this is going to be a medium slope, and then this is going to be the largest slope. Of course, compared to the wild type non-drug, which is the highest. Um, you cannot use uh, C post MI, and then the one uh, A is going to in induce lupus uh, SLE. Um, now, note this. Uh, I don't actually like this. I got this online. Um, yes, it is the case that the emphasis is on the um, sodium influx during phase zero. Um, but we also need to show for the 1A that there is a delayed, it's, it's a longer repolarization phase two, phase three. And remember what I said just a second ago is that a longer phase two, phase three, a longer QT interval might lead to torsade de point. So know that. Uh, class two, uh, dealing with the nodal cells a little bit, the cardiac myocytes, most of the nodal cells acting on the beta-1 rece receptors preventing the action of catecholamines on the heart. Uh, the major effect is that it is going to uh, decrease this slope. Uh, so vagal and beta blockers are going to be over here. Uh, it could cause an AV block as a side effect. And esmolol is a very fast-acting one, so it might be provided uh, in an IV in an, uh, an emergency room situation if someone comes into the hospital with a severe arrhythmia that needs to get treated right away. Um, potassium blockers, uh, this is the third thing to happen. So this is class three, dealing with cardiac myocytes, and it is elongating our... Um, our, our, our repolarization. And you can already guess what that's going to cause. It's going to cause a torsade de point. Randomly, I only see this for ibutilide and sodalol. I don't know why it doesn't happen for all of them, but I don't know. That's just what I read. Um, 
know mostly about uh, amiodarone. So this is the most effective one, but sadly, there's a lot of side effects. So pulmonary fibrosis, hepatotoxicity, thyroid issues. You can remember this because it's in the name, ioda. Um, and you'll later deal in the endocrine section how this can actually cause hyper and hypothyroid issues. Uh, great. Calcium channel blockers, um, uh, it's class four. Again, we, we also see this with, uh, you know, blood pressure lowering as we do with the beta receptors. Um, so this is going to interact in the cardiomyocytes and the nodal cells. Uh, these are non-dihydropyridines. They target L channels, but specifically L channels in the heart, not the L channels in the vascular smooth muscle, which will respond to the, uh, uh, the pydines basically. Um, so, uh, for the, the, AV node, uh, calcium is going to be largely relevant for phase, uh, zero. Um, and so if we block this, uh, we're going to have a slower conduction. Uh, this means our heart rate's going to go down and, and it could lead to a, uh, AV block. So we see this here. This is the calcium coming in. Um, but it also somehow, and I don't really understand the, the mechanism here, it, it affects the phase three repolarization. So notice that the repolarization is a little bit slower over here. Um, so we have a longer refractory period. This longer refractory period, I mean, yes, this leads to a lower heart rate, but it also can lead to an AV block because of this long refractory. We already have a long refractory period of the AV node. It's playing defense. It's trying to prevent fast currents in the atria from making their way to the ventricles. Um, but, uh, you know, we want, we want it to be slow. We want it to be defense, not too defensive, not too slow. And this can lead to an AV block, you know, type 1, type 2, type 3. Um, and it also has an effect, these calcium channel blockers on cardiac myocytes. Um, it's going to bring the contractility down. Um, so these L voltage-gated calcium channels are necessary for calcium-induced calcium released by binding to the riandine receptor. Um, more calcium in the cell always means more contraction. Um, honorable mentions. So digoxin, also known as a cardiac glycoside, also known as digitalis. Uh, this inhibits the sodium potassium pump. Um, the way that this works is, remember, it brings three sodiums out for every two potassiums in. Um, that is a normal state of affairs. So I should have, normally, I would want to have more sodium on the outside and more uh, and more calcium on the inside. So more, th this is going to cause sodium to... Um, uh, Sodium is going to um, want to come in and it's going to bring calcium out of the cell. Um, and, ooh, sorry, yeah. So uh, that, that's the normal state of affairs is I want uh, the, the sodium potassium pump brings sodium out of the cell. This is now going to exchange with calcium and this is going to be necessary to cause the muscle to relax. Because if I have more calcium in the cell, there's more contraction. If less calcium in the cell, it's going to be more lucidotropy, more, more um, relaxation. Now, if I inhibit this, I now I'm going to have a buildup of sodium inside of the cell. More sodium inside of the cell, this can go both ways. Now it's going to exchange outwards and it's going to bring calcium in. More calcium in is going to lead to more contraction. This is a positive anotrope, and there's going to be less relaxation. Now, there's going to be a reflex bradycardia that results. I'm contracting too much. My stroke volume, my blood pressure goes up too much, so the heart is going to slow down. So this is typically what our actual goal is. We're trying to slow down the heart, and this is one way to achieve that. Um, randomly, digoxin also directly stimulates the vagus nerve to induce bradycardia. Um, Hyperkalemia can result. Remember that initially what digoxin is interacting with is supposed to bring sodium out of potassium in. Well, if it doesn't work, that means I just get a buildup of potassium over here. And so this can lead to hyperkalemia. Uh, adenosine pushes the potassium outside of the cells. This is different from just a hyperkalemia. Basically, you can think of it as it empowers the um, voltage and or, I don't really know the specifics of voltage and or just the leaky potassium channels. More potassium is allowed to leave. Um, this is going to hyperpolarize the cell. Um, so much, and I know previously we saw hyperpolarization results in activation of the sodium channels, but I guess it must hyperpolarize it so much that you know the, that that benefit is is offset by the large threshold potential, or excuse me, that the large resting potential. So the jump from resting to threshold is now so large that it's just difficult to fire. Um, this is fast acting. We apply this in an IV setting, um, and the effects are going to be blunted by caffeine, which is a, a known adenosine antagonist. Adenosine binds to neurotransmitters in the brain and induces a tired feeling, and caffeine blocks that, which is how it keeps you awake. So it also blocks here as well. Um, we can see that the molecules are similar. Uh, Evabradine is going to inhibit the phase four funny channels. Remember that the sodium coming in is going to slow the heart rate. Um, uh, that is set by the SA node. Uh, and then magnesium sulfate is a cure, I don't know the mechanism, by Torsade de Poin and digoxin toxicity. Woo!
we made it. Uh, very exciting. Yeah, it's just so much friggin' stuff. I uh, hope this was helpful. Uh, I wish you guys all the luck.